Introduction to Famous Stories Every Child Should Know. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Lynn Thompson. Famous Stories Every Child Should Know. Edited by Hamilton Wright Maybe. Introduction. The group of stories brought together in this volume differ from legends because they have, with one exception, no core of fact at the centre, from myths because they make no attempt to personify or explain the forces or processes of nature, from fairy stories because they do not often bring onto the stage actors of a different nature from ours. They give full play to the fancy, as in A Child's Dream of a Star, The King of the Golden River, undine and the snow image but they are not poetic records of the facts of life attempts to shape those facts to meet the needs of the imagination and the cravings of the heart in the introduction to the book of fairy tales in this series those familiar and much loved stories which have been repeated to children for unnumbered generations and will be repeated to the end of time are described as records of the free and joyful play of the imagination opening doors through hard conditions to the spirit which craves power freedom happiness righting wrongs and redressing injuries defeating base designs rewarding patience and virtue crowning true love with happiness placing the powers of darkness under the control of man and making their ministers his servants the stories which make up this volume are closer to experience and come for the most part nearer to the everyday happenings of life a generation ago when the noble activities of science and its inspiring discoveries were taking possession of the minds of men and revealing possibilities of power of which they had not dreamed the prediction was freely made that poetry and fiction had had their day and that henceforth men would be educated upon facts and get their inspirations from what are called real things so engrossing and so marvellous were the results of investigation the achievements of experiment that it seemed to many as if the older literature of imagination and fancy had served its purpose as completely as alchemy astrology or chain armour the prophecies of those fruitful years of research did not tell half the story of the wonderful things that were to be the uses of electricity which are within easy reach for the most homely and practical purposes are as mysterious and magical as the dreams of the magicians we are served by invisible ministers who are more powerful than the genii and more nimble than puck there has been a girdle around the world for many years but there is good reason to believe that the time will come when news will go round the globe on waves of air if we were not accustomed to ordering breakfast miles away from the grocer and the poulterer, we would be overcome with amazement every time we took up the telephone transmitter. Absolutely pure tones are now being made by the use of dynamos, and will soon be sent into homes lying miles distant from the powerhouse, so to speak, so that very sweet music is being played by arc lights. The anticipations of scientific men so far as the uses of force are concerned have been surpassed by the wonderful discoveries and applications of the past few years but poetry and romance are not dead on the contrary they are more alive in the sense of awakening a wider interest than ever before in the history of writing during the years that have been more fruitful in works of mechanical genius or dynamic energy novels have been more widely distributed and more eagerly read than at any previous period the poetry of the time in the degree in which it has been fresh and vital has been treated by newspapers as matter of universal interest men are born story readers if their interest subsides for the moment or is absorbed by other forms of expression it reasserts itself in due time and demands the old enchantment that has woven its spell over every generation since men and women reached an early stage of development barbarians and even savages share with the most highly civilized peoples this passion for fiction 
Men cannot live on the bare literal fact any more than they can live on bread alone. There is something in every man to feed besides the body. He has been told many times by men of great disinterestedness and ability that he must believe only that which he clearly knows and understands, and that he must concern himself with those matters only which he can thoroughly comprehend. He must live, in other words, by the rule of common sense, meaning by that oft-used phrase, clear sight and practical dealing with actual things and conditions. It would greatly simplify life if this course should be followed, but it would simplify it by rejecting those things which the finest spirits among men and women have loved most and believed in with joyful and fruitful devotion. If we could all become literal, matter-of-fact and entirely practical, we should take the best possible care of our bodies and let our souls starve. This, however, the soul absolutely refuses to do. When it is ignored, it rebels and shivers the apparently solid order of common-sense living into fragments. It must have air to breathe, room to move in, a language to speak, work to do, and an open window through which it can look on the landscape and the sky. It is as idle to tell a man to live entirely in and by facts that can be known by the senses as to tell him to work in a field and not see the landscape of which the field is a part. The love of the story is one of the expressions of the passion of the soul for a glimpse of an order of life amid the chaos of happenings, for a setting of life which symbolizes the dignity of the actors in the play, for room in which to let men work out their instincts and risk their hearts in the great adventures of affection or action or exploration. Men and women find in stories the opportunities and experiences which circumstances have denied them. They insist on the dramatization of life because they know that certain results inevitably follow certain actions, and certain deeply interesting conflicts and tragedies are bound up with certain temperaments and types of character. The fact that many stories are unwholesome, untrue, vulgar, or immoral impeaches the value and dignity of fiction as little as the abuse of power impeaches the necessity and nobility of government, or the excess of the glutton, the healthfulness and necessity of food. The imagination must not only be counted as an entirely normal faculty, but the higher intelligence of the future will recognize its primacy among the faculties with which men are endowed. Fiction is not only here to stay, as the phrase runs, but it is one of the great and enduring forms of literature. The question is not, therefore, whether or not children shall read stories. The question was answered when they were sent into the world in the human form and with a human constitution. The only open question is, what stories shall they read? That many children read too many stories is beyond question. Their excessive devotion to fiction wastes time and seriously impairs vigour of mind. In these respects they follow the current which carries the multitude of their elders to mental inefficiency and waste of power. That they read too many weak, untruthful, characterless stories is also beyond question, and in this respect also they are like their elders. They need food, but in no intelligent household do they select and provide it. They are given what they like if it is wholesome, if not they are given something different and better. No sane mother allows her child to live on the food it likes, if that food is unwholesome. But this is precisely what many mothers and fathers do in the matter of feeding the imagination. The body is scrupulously cared for, and the mind is left to care for itself. Children ought to have stories at hand, precisely as they ought to have food, toys, games, playgrounds, because stories meet one of the normal needs of their natures. But these stories, like the food given to the body, ought to be intelligently selected, not only for their quality, but for their adaptation. There are many good books which ought not to be in the hands of children, because children have not had the experience which interprets them. They will either fail to understand, or, if they understand, they will suffer a sudden forcing of growth in the knowledge of life, which is always unwholesome. Only stories which are sound in the views of life they present ought to be within the reach of children. These stories ought to be well constructed and well written. They ought to be largely objective stories. They ought not to be introspective, 
morbid or abnormal in any way. Goody good and professionally pious stories, sentimental or unreal stories, ought to be rigorously excluded. A great deal of fiction, specially written for children, ought to be left severely alone. It is cheap, shallow, and stamped with unreality from cover to cover. It is as unwise to feed the minds of children exclusively on books specially prepared for their particular age as to shape the talk at breakfast or dinner, especially for their stage of development. Few opportunities for education are more valuable for a child than hearing the talk of its elders about the topics of the time. There are many wholesome and entertaining stories in the vast mass of fiction addressed to younger readers, but this literature of a period ought never to exclude the literature of all periods. The stories collected in this volume have been selected from many sources because in the judgment of the editor they are sound pieces of writing, wholesome in tone, varied in interest and style, and interesting. It is his hope that they will not only furnish good reading, but that they will suggest the kind of reading in this field that should be within the reach of children. Hamilton Wright Maybe End of Introduction Chapter One of Famous Stories Every Child Should Know. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Sherry Gardner. Famous Stories Every Child Should Know. Edited by Hamilton Wright Maybe. Chapter One A Child's Dream of a Star by charles dickens there was once a child and he strolled about a good deal and thought of a number of things he had a sister who was a child too and his constant companion these two used to wonder all day long they wondered at the beauty of the flowers they wondered at the height and the blueness of the sky they wondered at the depth of the bright water they wondered at the goodness and the power of god who made the lovely world they used to say to one another sometimes supposing all the children upon earth were to die would the flowers and the water and the sky be sorry they believed they would be sorry for said they the buds are the children of the flowers and the little playful streams that gamble down the hillsides are the children of the water and the smallest bright specks playing at hide-and-seek in the sky all night must surely be the children of the stars and they would all be grieved to see their playmates the children of men no more there was one clear shining star that used to come out in the sky before the rest near the church spire above the graves it was larger and more beautiful they thought than all the others and every night they watched for it standing hand in hand at a window whoever saw it first cried out i see the star and often they cried out both together knowing so well when it would rise and where so they grew to be such friends with it that before lying down in their beds they always looked out once again to bid it good night and when they were turning round to sleep they used to say god bless the star but while she was still very young oh very very young the sister drooped and came to be so weak that she could no longer stand in the window at night and then the child looked sadly out by himself and when he saw the star turned round and said to the patient pale face on the bed i see the star and then a smile would come upon the face and a little weak voice used to say god bless my brother and the star and so the time came all too soon when the child looked out alone and when there was no face on the bed and when there was a little grave among the graves not there before 
and when the star made long rays down toward him, as he saw it through his tears. Now these rays were so bright, and they seemed to make such a shining way from earth to heaven, that when the child went to his solitary bed, he dreamed about the star, and dreamed that, lying where he was, he saw a train of people taken up that sparkling road by angels, and the star opening showed him a great world of light, where many more such angels waited to receive them. All these angels who were waiting turned their beaming eyes upon the people who were carried up into the star, and some came out from the long rows in which they stood, and fell upon the people's necks and kissed them tenderly, and went away with them down avenues of light, and were so happy in their company that lying in his bed he wept for joy. But there were many angels who did not go with them, and among them one he knew. The patient face that once had lain upon the bed was glorified and radiant, but his heart found out his sister among all the host. His sister's angel lingered near the entrance of the star, and said to the leader among those who had brought the people thither, Is my brother come? And he said, No. She was turning hopefully away, when the child stretched out his arms and cried, O oh, sister, I am here, take me. And then she turned her beaming eyes upon him, and it was night, and the star was shining into the room, making long rays down towards him, as he saw it through his tears. From that hour forth, the child looked out upon the star as on the home he was to go to when his time should come, and he thought that he did not belong to the earth alone, but to the star, too, because of his sister's angel gone before. There was a baby born to be a brother to the child, and while he was so little that he never yet had spoken word, he stretched his tiny form out on his bed and died. Again the child dreamed of the open star and of the company of angels, and the train of people, and the rows of angels with their beaming eyes all turned upon those people's faces, said his sister's angel to the leader, Is my brother come? And he said, Not that one, but another. As the child beheld his brother's angel in her arms, he cried, O oh, sister, I am here, take me and she turned and smiled upon him, and the star was shining. He grew to be a young man, and was busy at his books, when an old servant came to him and said, Thy mother is no more. I bring her blessing on her darling son. Again at night he saw the star, and all that former company, said his sister's angel to the leader, is my brother come? And he said, Thy mother. A mighty cry of joy went forth through all the star, because the mother was reunited to her two children. And he stretched out his arms and cried, O oh, mother, sister and brother, I am here, take me. And they answered him, Not yet. And the star was shining. He grew to be a man, whose hair was turning gray, and he was sitting in his chair by the fireside, heavy with grief, and with his face bedewed with tears, when the star opened once again. Said his sister's angel to the leader, Is my brother come? And he said, Nay, but his maiden daughter, and the man who had been the child saw his daughter, newly lost to him, a celestial creature among those three. And he said, My daughter's head is on my sister's bosom, and her arm is around my mother's neck, and at her feet there is the baby of old time, and I can bear the parting from her. God be praised. 
and the star was shining. Thus the child came to be an old man, and his once smooth face was wrinkled, and his steps were slow and feeble, and his back was bent. And one night, as he lay upon his bed, his children standing round, he cried as he had cried so long ago, I see the star. They whispered one to another, He is dying. And he said, I am. My age is falling from me like a garment, and I move towards the star as a child. And, O oh, my father, now I thank thee that it has so often opened to receive those dear ones who await me. And the star was shining, and it shines upon his grave. End of chapter 1 Recording by Sherry Gardner Chapter 2 of Famous Stories Every Child Should Know. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Chessie Joy. Famous Stories Every Child Should Know. Edited by Hamilton Wright Maybe. Chapter 2, Part 1 The King of the Golden River, or The Black Brothers. By John Ruskin. Part 1. How the Agricultural System of the Black Brothers was Interfered With by Southwest Wind, Esquire. In a secluded and mountainous part of Sturia, there was, in old time, a valley of the most surprising and luxuriant fertility. It was surrounded on all sides by steep and rocky mountains, rising into peaks, which were always covered with snow and from which a number of torrents descended into constant cataracts. One of these fell westward, over the face of a crag, so high that when the sun had set to everything else, and all below was darkness, his beam still shone full upon this waterfall, so that it looked like a shower of gold. It was, therefore, called by the people of the neighborhood, the Golden River. It was strange that none of these streams fell into the valley itself. They all descended on the other side of the mountains, and wound away through broad plains and by populous cities. But the clouds were drawn so constantly to the snowy hills, and rested so softly in the circular hollow, that in time of drought and heat, when all the country round was burnt up, there was still rain in the little valley, and its crops were so heavy, and its hay so high, and its apples so red, and its grapes so blue, and its wine so rich and its honey so sweet that it was a marvel to every one who beheld it, and was commonly called the Treasure Valley. The whole of this little valley belonged to three brothers, called Schwartz, Hans, and Gluck. Schwartz and Hans, the two elder brothers, were very ugly men, with overhanging eyebrows and small, dull eyes, which were always half shut, so that you couldn't see into them, and always fancied they saw very far into you. They lived by farming the Treasure Valley, and very good farmers they were. They killed everything they did not pay for its eating. They shot the blackbirds because they pecked the fruit, and killed the hedgehogs lest they should suck the cows. They poisoned the crickets for eating the crumbs in the kitchen, and smothered the cicadas, which used to sing all summer in the lime trees. They worked their servants without any wages, till they would not work any more and then quarreled with them and turned them out of doors without paying them. It would have been very odd if, with such a farm and such a system of farming, they hadn't got very rich, and very rich they did get. They generally contrived to keep their corn by them till it was very dear, and then sell it for twice its value. They had heaps of gold lying about on their floors, yet it was never known that they had given so much as a penny or a crust in charity. They never went to Mass, grumbled perpetually at paving tithe, and were, in a word, of so cruel and grinding a temper as to receive from all those with whom they had any dealings the nickname of the Black Brothers. The youngest brother, Gluck, was as completely opposed, in both appearance and character, to his seniors as could possibly be imagined or desired. 
He was not above twelve years old, fair, blue-eyed, and kind in temper to every living thing. He did not, of course, agree particularly well with his brothers, or rather, they did not agree with him. He was usually appointed to the honorable office of turnspit, when there was anything to roast, which was not often, for, to do the brothers justice, they were hardly less sparing upon themselves than upon other people. At other times he used to clean the shoes, floors, and sometimes the plates, occasionally getting what was left on them, by way of encouragement, and a wholesome quantity of dry blows, by way of education. Things went on in this manner for a long time. At last came a very wet summer, and everything went wrong in the country around. The hay had hardly been got in, when the haystacks were floated bodily down to the sea by an inundation. The vines were cut to pieces with the hail. The corn was all killed by a black blight. Only in the Treasure Valley, as usual, all was safe. As it had rain when there was rain nowhere else, so it had sun when there was sun nowhere else. Everybody came to buy corn at the farm, and went away pouring maledictions on the Black Brothers. They asked what they liked, and got it, except from the poor, who could only beg, and several of whom were starved at their very door without the slightest regard or notice. It was drawing towards winter, and very cold weather, when one day the two elder brothers had gone out, with their usual warning to little Gluck, who was left to mind the roast, that he was to let nobody in and give nothing out. Gluck sat down quite close to the fire, for it was raining very hard, and the kitchen walls were by no means dry or comfortable looking. He turned and turned, and the roast got nice and brown. What a pity, thought Gluck. My brothers never ask anybody to dinner. I'm sure when they had got such a nice piece of mutton as this, and nobody else has got so much as a piece of dry bread, it would do their hearts good to have somebody to eat it with them. Just as he spoke, there came a double knock at the house door, yet heavy and dull as though the knocker had been tied up, more like a puff than a knock. It must be the wind, said Gluck. Nobody else would venture to knock double knocks at our door. No, it wasn't the wind. There it came again very hard, and what was particularly astounding, the knocker seemed to be in a hurry and to not be in the least afraid of the consequences. Gluck went to the window, opened it, and put his head out to see who it was. It was the most extraordinary-looking little gentleman he had ever seen in his life. He had a very large nose, slightly brass-colored. His cheeks were very round and very red, and might have warranted a supposition that he had been blowing a refractory fire for the last eight and forty hours. His eyes twinkled merrily through long, silken eyelashes. His mustaches curled twice round like a corkscrew on each side of his mouth, and his hair, of a curious mixed pepper and salt color, descended far over his shoulders. He was about four feet six in height, and wore a conical pointed cap of nearly the same altitude, decorated with a black feather some three feet long. His doublet was prolonged behind in something resembling a violent exaggeration of what is now termed a swallow-tail, but was much obscured by the swelling folds of an enormous black, glossy-looking cloak, which must have been very much too long in calm weather, as the wind, whistling round the old house, carried it clear out from the wearer's shoulders to about four times his own length. Gluck was so perfectly paralyzed by the singular appearance of his visitor that he remained fixed without uttering a word, until the old gentleman, having performed another and a more energetic concerto on the knocker, turned round to look after his flyaway cloak. In doing so, he caught sight of Gluck's little yellow head jammed in the window, with its mouth and eyes very wide open indeed. Hello, said the little gentleman. That's not the way to answer the door. I'm wet. Let me in. To do the little gentleman justice, he was wet. His feather hung down between his legs like a beaten puppy's tail, dripping like an umbrella, and from the ends of his mustaches the water was running into his waistcoat pocket and out again like a mill stream. "'I beg pardon, sir,' said Gluck. "'I'm very sorry, but I really can't.' "'Can't what?' said the old gentleman. "'I can't let you in, sir. I can't indeed. My brothers would beat me to death, sir, if I thought of such a thing. What do you want, sir?' 
Want, said the old gentleman petulantly, I want fire and shelter, and there's your great fire there, blazing, crackling, and dancing on the walls, with nobody to feel it. Let me in, I say, I only want to warm myself. Gluck had had his head, by this time, so long out of the window, that he began to feel it was really unpleasantly cold, and when he turned and saw the beautiful fire rustling and roaring and throwing long, bright tongues up the chimney, as if it was licking its chops at the savory smell of the leg of mutton, his heart melted within him that it should be burning away for nothing. "'He does look very wet,' said little Gluck. "'I'll just let him in for a quarter of an hour.' Round he went to the door, and opened it, and as the little gentleman walked in, there came a gust of wind through the door that made the old chimneys totter. "'There's a good boy,' said the little gentleman. "'Never mind your brothers. I'll talk to them.' "'Pray, sir, don't do any such thing,' said Gluck. "'I can't let you stay till they come. They'd be the death of me.' "'Dear me,' said the old gentleman. "'I'm very sorry to hear that. How long may I stay?' "'Only till the mutton's done, sir,' replied Gluck, "'and it's very brown.' Then the old gentleman walked into the kitchen, and sat himself down on the hob, with the top of his cap accommodated up the chimney, for it was a great deal too high for the roof. "'You'll soon dry there, sir,' said Gluck, and sat down again to turn the mutton. But the old gentleman did not dry there, but went on drip, drip, dripping among the cinders, and the fire fizzed and sputtered and began to look very black and uncomfortable, never with such a cloak. Every fold in it ran like a gutter. "'I beg pardon, sir,' said Gluck at length, after watching the water spreading in long quicksilver-like streams over the floor for a quarter of an hour. "'Mayn't I take your cloak?' "'No, thank you,' said the old gentleman. "'Your cap, sir?' "'I am all right, thank you,' said the old gentleman, rather gruffly. "'But, but, sir,' "'I'm very sorry,' said Gluck, hesitatingly. "'But really, sir, you're putting the fire out.' "'It'll take longer to do the mutton, then,' replied his visitor, dryly. Gluck was very much puzzled by the behavior of his guest. It was such a strange mixture of coolness and humility. He turned away at the string meditatively for another five minutes. "'That mutton looks very nice,' said the old gentleman at length. "'Can't you give me a little bit?' "'Impossible, sir,' said Gluck. "'I'm very hungry,' continued the old gentleman. "'I've had nothing to eat yesterday, nor today. "'They surely couldn't miss a bit from the knuckle.' "'He spoke in so very melancholy a tone "'that it quite melted Gluck's heart. "'They promised me one slice today, sir,' said he. "'I can give you that, but not a bit more.' "'That's a good boy,' said the old gentleman again. Then Gluck warmed a plate and sharpened a knife. "'I don't care if I do get beaten for it,' thought he. Just as he had cut a large slice out of the mutton, there came a tremendous rap at the door. The old gentleman jumped off the hob as if it had suddenly become inconveniently warm. Gluck fitted the slice into the mutton again with desperate efforts at exactitude and ran to open the door. "'What did you keep us waiting in the rain for?' said Schwartz as he walked in, "'throwing his umbrella in Gluck's face. "'Aye, what for indeed, you little vagabond?' said Hans, "'administering an educational box on the ear "'as he followed his brother into the kitchen. "'Bless my soul!' said Schwartz when he opened the door. "'Amen!' said the little gentleman, who had taken his cap off, "'and was standing in the middle of the kitchen, "'bowing with the utmost possible velocity. "'Who's that?' said Schwartz catching up a rolling pin and turning to Gluck with a fierce frown. I, "'I don't know. Indeed, brother,' said Gluck in great terror. "'How did he get in?' roared Schwartz. "'My dear brother,' said Gluck deprecatingly, "'he was so very wet.' The rolling pin was descending on Gluck's head, but at the instant the old gentleman interposed his conical cap, on which it crashed with a shock that shook the water out of it all over the room. What was very odd the rolling pin no sooner touched the cap than it flew out of Schwartz's hand, spinning like a straw in a high wind, and fell into the corner at the further end of the room. "'Who are you, sir?' demanded Schwartz, turning upon him. "'What's your business?' snarled Hans. "'I'm a poor old man, sir,' the little gentleman began, very modestly. 
and I saw your fire through the window, and begged shelter for a quarter of an hour. Have the goodness to walk out again, then, said Schwartz. We've quite enough water in our kitchen without making it a drying house. It is a cold day to turn an old man out, sir. Look at my gray hairs. They hung down to his shoulders, as I told you before. Aye, said Hans, there is enough of them to keep you warm. Walk. I'm very, very hungry, sir. Couldn't you spare me a bit of bread before I go? Bread, indeed, said Schwartz. Do you suppose we've nothing to do with our bread but to give it to such red-nosed fellows as you? Why don't you sell your feather, said Hans, sneeringly. Out with you. A little bit, said the old gentleman. Be off, said Schwartz. Pray, gentlemen. Off and be hanged, cried Hans, seizing him by the collar. But he had no sooner touched the old gentleman's collar than away he went after the rolling pin, spinning round and round till he fell into the corner on the top of it. Then Schwartz was very angry and ran at the old gentleman to turn him out. But he also had hardly touched him when away he went after Hans and the rolling pin and hit his head against the wall as he tumbled into the corner. And so there they lay all three. Then the old gentleman spun himself round with velocity in the opposite direction, continued to spin until his long cloak was all wound neatly about him, clapped his cap on his head very much on one side, for it could not stand upright without going through the ceiling, gave an additional twist to his corkscrew moustaches, and replied with perfect coolness, "'Gentlemen, I wish you a very good morning. At twelve o'clock tonight I'll call again.' After such a refusal of hospitality as I have just experienced, you will not be surprised if that visit is the last I ever pay you. If I ever catch you here again, muttered Schwartz, coming half frightened out of his corner. But before he could finish his sentence, the old gentleman had shut the house door behind him with a great bang, and there drove past the window, at the same instant, a wreath of ragged cloud that whirled and rolled away down the valley in all manner of shapes, turning over and over in the air and melting away at last in a gush of rain. A very pretty business indeed, Mr. Gluck, said Schwartz. Dish the mutton, sir, if I ever catch you at such a trick again. Bless me, why, the mutton's been cut. You promised me one slice, brother, you know, said Gluck. Oh, and you were cutting it hot, I suppose, and going to catch all the gravy. It'll be long before I promise you such a thing again. I'll leave the room, sir, and have the kindness to wait in the coal cellar till I call you. Gluck left the room melancholy enough. The brothers ate as much mutton as they could, locked the rest in the cupboard, and proceeded to get very drunk after dinner. Such a night it was, howling wind and rushing rain without intermission. The brothers had just sense enough left to put up all the shutters and double-bar the door before they went to bed. They usually slept in the same room. As the clock struck twelve, they were both awakened by a tremendous crash. Their door burst open with a violence that shook the house from top to bottom. "'What's that?' cried Schwartz, starting up in his bed. "'Only I,' said the little gentleman. The two brothers sat up on their bolster and stared into the darkness. The room was full of water, and by a misty moonbeam, which found its way through a hole in the shutter, they could see in the midst of it an enormous foam globe, spinning round and bobbing up and down like a cork, on which, as on a most luxurious cushion, reclined the little old gentleman, cap and all. There was plenty of room for it now, for the roof was off. "'Sorry to incommode you,' said their visitor, ironically. I'm afraid your beds are dampish. Perhaps you had better go to your brother's room. I've left the ceiling on there. They required no second admonition, but rushed into Gluck's room, wet through, and in an agony of terror. You'll find my card on the kitchen table, the old gentleman called after them. Remember the last visit. Pray heaven it may, said Schwartz, shuddering, and the foam globe disappeared. Dawn came at last and the two brothers looked out of Gluck's little window in the morning. The Treasure Valley was one mass of ruin and desolation. The inundation had swept away trees, crops, and cattle, and left in their stead a waste of red sand and gray mud. The two brothers crept shivering and horror-struck into the kitchen. 
the water had gutted the whole first floor corn money almost every movable thing had been swept away and there was only left a small white card on the kitchen table on it in large breezy long-legged letters were engraved the words southwest wind esq end of chapter two part one Chapter 2, Part 2 of Famous Stories Every Child Should Know. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Chessie Joy. Famous Stories Every Child Should Know. Edited by Hamilton Wright Maybe. Chapter 2, Part 2 The King of the Golden River, or The Black Brothers. By John Ruskin Part 2 Of the proceedings of the three brothers after the visit of Southwest Wind, Esquire, and how little Gluck had an interview with the King of the Golden River. Southwest Wind, Esquire, was as good as his word. After the momentous visit above related, he entered the Treasure Valley no more, and, what was worse, he had so much influence with his relations, the West Winds in general, and used it so effectively that they all adopted a similar line of conduct. So no rain fell in the valley from one year's end to another. Though everything remained green and flourishing in the plains below, the inheritance of the three brothers was a desert. What had been the richest soil in the kingdom became a shifting heap of red sand, and the brothers, unable longer to contend with the adverse skies, abandoned their valueless patrimony in despair, to seek some means of gaining a livelihood among the cities and people of the plains. All their money was gone, and they had nothing left but some curious old-fashioned pieces of gold plate, the last remnants of their ill-gotten wealth. "'Suppose we turn goldsmiths,' said Schwartz to Hans, as they entered the large city. "'It is a good knave's trade. We could put a good deal of copper into the gold without anyone finding it out.' The thought was agreed to be a very good one, they hired a furnace and turned goldsmiths. But two slight circumstances affected their trade. The first, that people did not approve of the coppered gold. The second, that the two elder brothers, whenever they had sold anything, used to leave little Gluck to mind the furnace, and go and drink out the money in the alehouse next door. So they melted all their gold, without making money enough to buy more, and were, at last, reduced to one large drinking mug, which an uncle of his had given to little Gluck, and which he was very fond of, and would not have parted with for the world, though he never drank anything out of it but milk and water. The mug was a very odd mug to look at. The handle was formed of two wreaths of flowing golden hair, so finely spun that it looked more like silk than metal, and these wreaths descended into, and mixed with, a beard and whiskers of the same exquisite workmanship which surrounded and decorated a very fierce little face, of the reddest gold imaginable, right in the front of the mug, with a pair of eyes in it which seemed to command the whole circumference. It was impossible to drink out of the mug without being subjected to an intense gaze out of the side of these eyes, and Schwartz positively averred that, once, after emptying it full of Rhenish seventeen times, he had seen them wink. When it came to the mug's turn to be made into spoons, it half broke poor little Gluck's heart, but the brothers only laughed at him, tossed the mug into the melting pot, and staggered out to the alehouse, leaving him, as usual, to pour the gold into bars when it was all ready. When they were gone, Gluck took a farewell look at his old friend in the melting pot. The flowing hair was all gone. Nothing remained but the red nose and the sparkling eyes, which looked more malicious than ever. And no wonder thought Gluck, after being treated in that way. He sauntered disconsolately to the window, and sat himself down to catch the fresh evening air, and escape the hot breath of the furnace. Now, this window commanded a direct view of the range of mountains, which, as I told before, overhung the treasure valley, and more especially of the peak from which fell the Golden River. It was just at the close of the day, and when Gluck sat down at the window, he saw the rocks of the mountain tops, 
all crimson and purple with the sunset, and there were bright tongues of fiery cloud burning and quivering about them, and the river, brighter than all, fell in a waving column of pure gold from precipice to precipice, with the double arc of a broad purple rainbow stretched across it, flushing and fading alternately in the wreaths of spray. Ah, said Gluck aloud, after he had looked at it for a while, if that river were really all gold, what a nice thing it would be. No, it wouldn't, Gluck, said a clear metallic voice close at his ear. Bless me, what's that? exclaimed Gluck, jumping up. There was nobody there. He looked round the room, and under the table, and a great many times behind him, but there was certainly nobody there, and he sat down again at the window. This time he didn't speak, but he couldn't help thinking again that it would be very convenient if the river really were all gold. "'Not at all, my boy,' said the same voice, louder than before. "'Bless me,' said Gluck again. "'What is that?' He looked again into all the corners and cupboards, and then began turning round and round as fast as he could in the middle of the room, thinking there was somebody behind him, when the same voice struck again on his ear. It was singing now very merrily. La, la, li, ra, la. No words, only a soft running, effervescent melody, something like that of a kettle on the boil. Luck looked out of the window. No, it was certainly in the house. Upstairs and downstairs? No, it was certainly in that very room, coming in quicker time, and clearer notes every moment. La, la, li, ra, la. All at once it struck Gluck that it sounded louder near the furnace. He ran to the opening and looked in. Yes, he saw right. It seemed to be coming not only out of the furnace, but out of the pot. He uncovered it and ran back in a great fright, for the pot was certainly singing. He stood in the farthest corner of the room with his hands up and his mouth open for a minute or two, when the singing stopped and the voice became clear and pronunciative. Hello! said the voice. Gluck made no answer. Hello, Gluck, my boy, said the pot again. Gluck summoned all his energies, walked straight up to the crucible, drew it out of the furnace, and looked in. The gold was all melted, and its surface as smooth and polished as a river. But instead of reflecting little Gluck's head, as he looked in, he saw meeting his glance from beneath the gold, the red nose and sharp eyes of his old friend the mug, a thousand times redder and sharper than ever he had seen them in his life. Come, Gluck, my boy, said the voice out of the pot again. I'm all right. Pour me out. But Gluck was much too astonished to do anything of the kind. Pour me out, I say, said the voice rather gruffly. Still Gluck couldn't move. Will you pour me out, said the voice passionately. I'm too hot. By a violent effort, Gluck recovered the use of his limbs, took hold of the crucible, and sloped it so as to pour out the gold. But instead of a liquid stream, there came out first a pair of pretty little yellow legs, then some coat tails, then a pair of arms stuck akimbo, and finally the well-known head of his friend the mug. All which articles, uniting as they rolled out, stood up energetically on the floor, in the shape of a little golden dwarf, about a foot and a half high. "'That's right,' said the dwarf, stretching out first his legs, and then his arms, and then shaking his head up and down, and as far around as it would go, for five minutes without stopping, apparently with the view of ascertaining if he were quite correctly put together, while Gluck stood contemplating him in speechless amazement. He was dressed in a stashed doublet of spun gold, so fine in its texture that the prismatic colors gleamed over it as if on a surface of mother-of-pearl, and over this brilliant doublet his hair and beard fell full halfway to the ground in waving curls, so exquisitely delicate that Gluck could hardly tell where they ended, they seemed to melt into the air. The features of the face, however, were by no means finished with the same delicacy. They were rather coarse slightly inclining to coppery in complexion, and indicative in expression of a very pertinacious and intractable disposition in their small proprietor. When the dwarf had finished his self-examination, he turned his small eyes full on Gluck, 
and stared at him deliberately for a minute or two. "'No, it wouldn't, Gluck, my boy,' said the little man. This was certainly rather an abrupt and unconnected mode of commencing conversation. It might indeed be supposed to refer to the course of Gluck's thoughts, which had first produced the dwarf's observations out of the pot. But whatever it referred to, Gluck had no inclination to dispute the dictum. "'Wouldn't it, sir?' said Gluck, very mildly and submissively indeed. "'No,' said the dwarf, conclusively. "'No, it wouldn't.' And with that the dwarf pulled his cap hard over his brows, took two turns of three feet long up and down the room, lifting his legs up very high, and setting them down very hard. This pause gave time for Gluck to collect his thoughts a little, and seeing no great reason to view his diminutive visitor with dread, and feeling his curiosity overcome his amazement, he ventured on a question of peculiar delicacy. "'Pray, sir,' said Gluck, rather hesitantly, "'were you my mug?' on which the little man turned sharp round, walked straight up to Gluck, and drew himself up to his full height. "'I,' said the little man, "'am the king of the Golden River.' Whereupon he turned about again, and took two more turns, some six feet long, in order to allow time for the consternation which this announcement produced on his auditor to evaporate. After which he again walked up to Gluck and stood still, as if expecting some comment on his communication." Gluck determined to say something, at all events. "'I hope your majesty is very well,' said Gluck. "'Listen,' said the little man, deigning no reply to this polite inquiry. "'I am the king of what you mortals call the Golden River. "'The shape you saw me in was owing to the malice of a stronger king, "'from whose enchantments you have this instant freed me. "'What I have seen of you, and your conduct to your wicked brothers, "'renders me willing to serve you.' Therefore, attend to what I tell you. Whoever shall climb to the top of that mountain from which you see the Golden River issue, and shall cast into the stream of its source three drops of holy water for him, and for him only, the river shall turn to gold. But no one failing in his first can succeed in a second attempt, and if any one shall cast unholy water into the river, it will overwhelm him, and he will become a black stone. So saying, the king of the Golden River turned away, and deliberately walked into the center of the hottest flame of the furnace. His figure became red, white, transparent, dazzling, a blaze of intense light. Rose trembled and disappeared. The king of the Golden River had evaporated. Oh! cried poor Gluck, running to look up the chimney after him. Oh! dear, dear, dear me! My mug! My mug! My mug! End of chapter 2, part 2. Chapter 2, part 3 of Famous Stories Every Child Should Know. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Chessie Joy. Famous Stories Every Child Should Know. Edited by Hamilton Wright Maybe. Chapter 2, Part 3 The King of the Golden River, or The Black Brothers, by John Ruskin. Part 3 How Mr. Han set off on an expedition to the Golden River, and how he prospered therein. The King of the Golden River had hardly made the extraordinary exit related in the last chapter before Hans and Schwartz came roaring into the house, very savagely drunk. The discovery of the total loss of their last piece of plate had the effect of sobering them just enough to enable them to stand over Gluck, beating him very steadily for a quarter of an hour, at the expiration of which period they dropped into a couple of chairs, and requested to know what he had to say for himself. Gluck told them his story, of which, of course, they did not believe a word. They beat him again till their arms were tired, and staggered to bed. In the morning, however, the steadiness with which he adhered to his story obtained him some degree of credence, the immediate consequence of which was that the two brothers, after wrangling a long time on the knotty question which of them should try his fortune first, drew their swords and began fighting. The noise of the fray alarmed the neighbors, who, finding they could not pacify the combatants, sent for the constable. 
Hans, on hearing this, contrived to escape and hid himself, but Schwartz was taken before the magistrate, fined for breaking the peace, and having drunk out his last penny the evening before, was thrown into prison until he should pay. When Hans heard this, he was much delighted, and determined to set out immediately for the Golden River. How to get the holy water was the question. He went to the priest, but the priest could not give any holy water to so abandoned a character. So Hans went to Vespers in the evening for the first time in his life, and under the pretense of crossing himself, stole a cupful and returned home in triumph. Next morning he got up before the sun rose, put the holy water into a strong flask and two bottles of wine and some meat in a basket, slung them over his back, took his alpine staff in his hand, and set off for the mountains. On his way out of the town he had to pass the prison, and as he looked in at the windows, whom should he see but Schwartz himself, peeping out of the bars and looking very disconsolate. "'Good morning, brother,' said Hans. "'Have you any message for the king of the Golden River?' Schwartz gnashed his teeth with rage and shook the bars with all his strength, but Hans only laughed at him and advising him to make himself comfortable till he came back again, shouldered his basket, shook the bottle of holy water in Schwartz's face till it frothed again, and marched off in the highest spirits in the world. It was indeed a morning that might have made anyone happy, even with no golden river to seek for. Level lines of dewy mist lay stretched along the valley, out of which rose the massy mountains, their lower cliffs in pale gray shadow, hardly distinguishable from the floating vapor, but gradually ascending till they caught the sunlight, which ran in sharp touches of ruddy color along the angular crags, and pierced in long level rays through their fringes of spear-like pine. Far above shot up red splintered masses of castellated rock, jagged and shivered into myriads of fantastic forms, with here and there a streak of sunlit snow, traced down their chasms like a line of forked lightning. And far beyond and far above all these, fainter than the morning cloud, but purer and changeless, slept in the blue sky the utmost peaks of the eternal snow. The Golden River, which sprang from one of the lower and snowless elevations, was now nearly in shadow, all but the uppermost jets of spray, which rose like slow smoke above the undulating line of the cataract, and floated away in feeble wreaths upon the morning wind. On this object, and on this alone, Hans's eyes and thoughts were fixed. Forgetting the distance he had to traverse, he set off at an impudent rate of walking, which greatly exhausted him before he had scaled the first range of the green and low hills. He was, moreover, surprised, on surmounting them, to find that a large glacier, of whose existence, notwithstanding his previous knowledge of the mountains, he had been absolutely ignorant, lay between him and the source of the Golden River. He entered on it with the boldness of a practiced mountaineer. Yet he thought he had never traversed so strange or so dangerous a glacier in his life. The ice was excessively slippery, and out of all its chasms came wild sounds of gushing water, not monotonous or low, but changeful and loud, rising occasionally into drifting passages of wild melody, then breaking off into short melancholy tones, or sudden shrieks, resembling those of human voices in distress or pain. The ice was broken into thousands of confused shapes, but none, Hans thought, like the ordinary forms of splintered ice. There seemed a curious expression about all their outlines, a perpetual resemblance to living features, distorted and scornful. Myriads of deceitful shadows and lurid light played and floated about and through the pale blue pinnacles, dazzling and confusing the sight of the traveler while his ears grew dull and his head giddy with the constant gush and roar of the concealed waters. These painful circumstances increased upon him as he advanced. The ice crashed and yawned into fresh chasms at his feet. Tottering spires nodded about him and fell thundering across his path, and though he had repeatedly faced these dangers on the most terrific glaciers and in the wildest weather, it was with a new and oppressive feeling of panic, terror, that he leaped the last chasm and flung himself, exhausted and shuddering, on the firm turf of the mountain. 
he had been compelled to abandon his basket of food, which became a perilous encumbrance on the glacier, and had now no means of refreshing himself but by breaking off and eating some of the pieces of ice. This, however, relieved his thirst. An hour's repose recruited his hardy frame, and with the indomitable spirit of avarice he resumed his laborious journey. His way now lay straight up a ridge of bare red rocks, without a blade of grass to ease the foot, or projecting angle to afford an inch of shade from the south sun. It was past noon, and the rays beat intensely upon the steep path, while the whole atmosphere was motionless and penetrated with heat. Intense thirst was soon added to the bodily fatigue with which Hans was now afflicted. Glance after glance he cast on the flask of water which hung at his belt. Three drops are enough, at last thought he. I may, at least, cool my lips with it. He opened the flask and was raising it to his lips when his eye fell on an object lying on the rock beside him. He thought it moved. It was a small dog, apparently in the last agony of death from thirst. Its tongue was out, its jaws dry, its limbs extended lifelessly, and a swarm of black ants were crawling about its lips and throat. Its eye moved to the bottle which Hans held in his hand. He raised it, drank, spurned the animal with his foot, and passed on. And he did not know how it was, but he thought that a strange shadow had suddenly come across the blue sky. The path became steeper and more rugged every moment, and the high hill air, instead of refreshing him, seemed to throw his blood into a fever. The noise of the hill cataracts sounded like mockery in his ears. They were all distant, and his thirst increased every moment. Another hour passed, and he looked down again to the flask at his side. It was half empty, but there was much more than three drops in it. He stopped to open it, and again, as he did so, something moved in the path above him. It was a fair child, stretched nearly lifeless on the rock, its breast heaving with thirst, its eyes closed, and its lips parched and burning. Hans eyed it deliberately, drank, and passed on, and a dark gray cloud came over the sun, and long snake-like shadows crept up along the mountain sides. Hans struggled on. The sun was sinking, but its descent seemed to bring no coolness. The leaden weight of the dead air pressed upon his brow and heart, but the goal was near. He saw the cataract of the Golden River springing from the hillside, scarcely five hundred feet above him. He paused for a moment to breathe and sprang on to complete his task. At this instant a faint cry fell on his ear. He turned and saw a gray-haired old man extended on the rocks. His eyes were sunk, his features deadly pale, and he gathered into an expression of despair. Water! He stretched his arms to Hans and cried feebly. Water! I am dying! I have none replied Hans. Thou hast had thy share of life. He strode over the prostrate body and darted on, and a flash of blue lightning rose out of the east, shaped like a sword. It shook thrice over the whole heaven and left it dark with one heavy, impenetrable shade. The sun was setting. It plunged toward the horizon like a red-hot ball. The roar of the golden river rose on Hans's ear. He stood at the brink of the chasm through which it ran. Its waves were filled with the red glory of the sunset. They shook their crests like tongues of fire, and flashes of bloody light gleamed along their foam. Their sound came mightier and mightier on his senses. His brain grew giddy with the prolonged thunder. Shuddering, he drew the flask from his girdle and hurled it into the center of the torrent. As he did so, an icy chill shot through his limbs. He staggered, shrieked, and fell. The waters closed over his cry, and the moaning of the river rose wildly into the night as it gushed over the black stone. End of chapter 2, part 3
Famous Stories Every Child Should Know Edited by Hamilton Wright Mabey Chapter 2, Part 4 The King of the Golden River, or The Black Brothers, by John Ruskin How Mr. Schwartz set off on an expedition to the Golden River, and how he prospered therein. Poor little Gluck waited very anxiously alone in the house for Hans's return. Finding he did not come back, he was terribly frightened, and went and told Schwartz in the prison all that had happened. Then Schwartz was very much pleased, and said that Hans must certainly have been turned into a black stone, and he should have all the gold to himself. But Gluck was very sorry, and cried all night. When he got up in the morning, there was no bread in the house, nor any money, so Gluck went and hired himself to another goldsmith, and he worked so hard and so neatly, and so long every day, that he soon got enough money together to pay his brother's fine, and he went and gave it all to Schwartz, and Schwartz got out of prison. Then Schwartz was quite pleased, and said he should have some of the gold of the river, but Gluck only begged he would go and see what had become of Hans. Now, when Schwartz had heard that Hans had stolen the holy water, he thought to himself that such a proceeding might not be considered altogether correct by the king of the Golden River, and determined to manage matters better. So he took some more of Gluck's money, and went to a bad priest, who gave him some holy water very readily for it. Then Schwartz was sure that it was all quite right. So Schwartz got up early in the morning before the sun rose, and took some bread and wine in a basket, and put his holy water in a flask, and set off for the mountains. Like his brother, he was much surprised at the sight of the glacier, and had great difficulty in crossing it, even after leaving his basket behind him. The day was cloudless, but not bright. There was a heavy, purple haze hanging over the sky, and the hills looked lowering and gloomy. And as Schwartz climbed the steep rock path, the thirst came upon him, as it had upon his brother, until he lifted his flask to his lips to drink. Then he saw the fair child lying near him on the rocks, and it cried to him and moaned for water. Water indeed, said Schwartz, I haven't half enough for myself, and passed on. And as he went, he thought the sunbeams grew more dim, and he saw a low bank of black cloud rising out of the west. And when he had climbed for another hour, the thirst overcame him again, and he would have drunk. Then he saw the old man lying before him on the path, and heard him cry out for water. Water indeed, said Schwartz, I haven't half enough for myself, and on he went. Then again the light seemed to fade from before his eyes, and he looked up, and behold, a mist of the color of blood had come over the sun, and the bank of black cloud had risen very high, and its edges were tossing and tumbling like the waves of an angry sea and they cast long shadows which flickered over Schwartz's path. Then Schwartz climbed for another hour, and again his thirst returned, and as he lifted his flask to his lips, he thought he saw his brother Hans lying exhausted on the path before him, and as he gazed, the figure stretched its arms to him and cried for water. Ha ha, laughed Schwartz, are you there? Remember the prison bars, my boy. Water indeed. Do you suppose I carried it all the way up here for you? and he strode over the figure. Yet as he passed, he thought he saw a strange expression of mockery about its lips. And when he had gone a few yards farther, he looked back, but the figure was not there. And a sudden horror came over Schwartz. He knew not why, but the thirst for gold prevailed over his fear, and he rushed on. And the bank of black cloud rose to the zenith, and out of it came bursts of spiry lightning, and the waves of darkness seemed to heave and float between their flashes over the whole heavens. And the sky, where the sun was setting, was all level, and like a lake of blood. And a strong wind came out of that sky, tearing its crimson clouds into fragments, and scattering them far into the darkness. And when Schwartz stood by the brink of the Golden River, its waves were black like thunderclouds, but their foam was like fire, and the roar of the waters below and the thunder above met as he cast the flask into the stream. And as he did so, 
The lightning glared into his eyes, and the earth gave way beneath him, and the waters closed over his cry. And the moaning of the river rose wildly into the night as it gushed over the two black stones. End of chapter 2, part 4「Chapter Two, Part Five of Famous Stories Every Child Should Know. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Chessie Joy. Famous Stories Every Child Should Know. Edited by Hamilton Wright Maybe. Chapter Two, Part Five The King of the Golden River, or the Black Brothers, by John Ruskin. How little Gluck set off on an expedition to the Golden River, and how he prospered therein, with other matters of interest. When Gluck found that Schwartz did not come back, he was very sorry, and did not know what to do. He had no money, and was obliged to go and hire himself again to the goldsmith, who worked him very hard, and gave him very little money. So, after a month or two, Gluck grew tired, and made up his mind to go and try his fortune with the Golden River. The little king looked very kind, thought he. I don't think he will turn me into a black stone. So he went to the priest, and the priest gave him some holy water as soon as he asked for it. Then Gluck took some bread in his basket, and the bottle of water, and set off very early for the mountains. If the glacier had occasioned a great deal of fatigue to his brothers, it was twenty times worse for him who was neither so strong nor so practised on the mountains. He had several very bad falls, lost his basket and bread, and was very much frightened at the strange noises under the ice. He lay a long time to rest on the grass after he had got over, and began to climb the hill in just the hottest part of the day. When he had climbed for an hour he got dreadfully thirsty, and was going to drink like his brothers, when he saw an old man coming down the path above him, looking very feeble, and leaning on a staff. "'My son,' said the old man, "'I am faint with thirst. Give me some of that water.' Then Gluck looked at him, and when he saw that he was pale and weary, he gave him the water. "'Only pray, don't drink at all,' said Gluck. But the old man drank a great deal, and gave him back the bottle two-thirds empty. Then he bade him good speed, and Gluck went on again, merrily, and the path became easier to his feet, and two or three blades of grass appeared upon it, and some grasshoppers began singing on the bank beside it, and Gluck thought he had never heard such merry singing. Then he went on for another hour, and the thirst increased on him so that he thought he should be forced to drink, but as he raised the flask he saw a little child laying panting by the roadside and it cried out piteously for water. Then Gluck struggled with himself, and determined to bear the thirst a little longer, and he put the bottle to the child's lips, and it drank it all but a few drops. Then it smiled on him, and got up, and ran down the hill, and Gluck looked after it till it had become as small as a little star, and then turned and began climbing again, and then there were all kinds of sweet flowers growing on the rocks, bright green moss, with pale pink starry flowers, and soft bell gentians, more blue than the sky at its deepest, and pure white transparent lilies, and crimson and purple butterflies darted hither and thither, and the sky sent down such pure light that Gluck had never felt so happy in his life. Yet, when he had climbed for another hour, his thirst became intolerable again. When he looked at his bottle, he saw there were only five or six drops left in it, and he could not venture to drink. And as he was hanging the flask to his belt again, he saw a little dog lying on the rocks, gasping for breath, just as Hans had seen it on the day of his ascent. And Gluck stopped and looked at it, and then at the Golden River, not five hundred yards above him, and he thought of the dwarf's words, that no one could succeed except in his first attempt and he tried to pass the dog, but it whined piteously, and Gluck stopped again. "'Poor beastie,' said Gluck. "'It'll be dead when I come down again, if I don't help it.' 
Then he looked closer and closer at it, and its eye turned on him so mournfully that he could not stand it. "'Confound the king, and his gold, too,' said Gluck, and he opened the flask and poured all the water into the dog's mouth. The dog sprang up and stood on its hind legs. Its tail disappeared. Its ears became long, longer, silky, golden. Its nose became very red. Its eyes became very twinkling. In three seconds the dog was gone, and before Gluck stood his old acquaintance, the king of the Golden River. "'Thank you,' said the monarch. "'But don't be frightened. It's all right.' for Gluck showed manifest symptoms of consternation at this unlooked-for reply to his last observation. "'Why didn't you come before?' continued the dwarf. "'Instead of sending me those rascally brothers of yours, for me to have the trouble of turning into stones. Very hard stones they make, too.' "'Oh, dear me,' said Gluck. "'Have you really been so cruel?' "'Cruel?' said the dwarf. "'They poured unholy water into my stream. Do you think I'm going to allow that?' "'Why?' said Gluck. I am sure, sir, your majesty, I, I mean, they got the water out of the church font. Very probably, replied the dwarf, but, and his countenance grew stern as he spoke, the water which has been refused to the cry of the weary and dying is unholy, though it has been blessed by every saint in heaven, and the water which is found in the vessel of mercy is holy, though it had been defiled with corpses. So saying, the dwarf stooped and picked a lily that grew at his feet. On its white leaves there hung three drops of clear dew, and the dwarf shook them into the flask which Gluck held in his hand. "'Cast these into the river,' he said, "'and descend on the other side of the mountains into the treasure valley. And so, good speed!' As he spoke, the figure of the dwarf became indistinct. The playing colors of his robe formed themselves into a prismatic mist of dewy light. He stood for an instant veiled with them as with the belt of a broad rainbow. The colors grew faint, the mist rose into the air, the monarch had evaporated. And Gluck climbed to the brink of the Golden River, and its waves were as clear as crystal and as brilliant as the sun. And when he cast the three drops of dew into the stream, there opened, where they fell, a small circular whirlpool, into which the waters descended with a musical noise. Gluck stood watching it for some time, very much disappointed, because not only the river was not turned into gold, but its waters seemed very much diminished in quantity. Yet he obeyed his friend the dwarf, and descended the other side of the mountains toward the treasure valley. And as he went, he thought he heard the noise of water working its way under the ground and when he came in sight of the treasure valley, behold, a river, like the Golden River, was springing from a new cleft of the rocks above it, and was flowing in innumerable streams among the dry heaps of red sand. And as Gluck gazed, fresh grass sprang up beside the new streams, and creeping plants grew, and climbed among this moistening soil. Young flowers open suddenly along the river sides, as stars leap out when twilight is deepening, and thickets of myrtle and tendrils of vine cast lengthening shadows over the valley as they grew, and thus the treasure valley became a garden again, and the inheritance which had been lost by cruelty was regained by love. And Gluck went and dwelt in the valley, and the poor were never driven from his door so that his barns became full of corn, and his house of treasure. And for him, the river had, according to the dwarf's promise, become a river of gold. And to this day, the inhabitants of the valley point out the place where the three drops of holy dew were cast into the stream, and trace the course of the golden river under the ground, until it emerges in the treasure valley and at the top of the cataract of the Golden River are still to be seen two black stones, round which the waters howl mournfully every day at sunset, and these stones are still called by the people of the valley the Black Brothers. End of chapter 2, part 5《Famous Stories Every Child Should Know》This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. 
For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Nikki504. Famous Stories Every Child Should Know. Edited by Hamilton Wright Maybe. Chapter 3 The Snow Image. A Childish Miracle. By Nathaniel Hawthorne. One afternoon of a cold winter's day, when the sun shone forth with chilly brightness after a long storm, two children asked leave of their mother to run out and play in the new fallen snow. The elder child was a girl whom, because she was of a tender and modest disposition and was thought to be very beautiful, her parents and other people who were familiar with her used to call Violet, but her brother was known by the style and title of Peony, on account of the ruddiness of his broad and round little fizz, which made everybody think of sunshine and great scarlet flowers. The father of these two children, a certain Mr. Lindsay, it is important to say, was an excellent but exceedingly matter-of-fact sort of man, a dealer in hardware, and was sturdily accustomed to take what is called the common-sense view of all matters that came under his consideration. With a heart about as tender as other people's, he had a head as hard and impenetrable, and therefore perhaps as empty, as one of the iron pots which it was a part of his business to sell. The mother's character, on the other hand, had a strain of poetry in it, a trait of unworldly beauty, a delicate and dewy flower, as it were, that had survived out of her imaginative youth, and still kept itself alive amid the dusty realities of matrimony and motherhood. So Violet and Peony, as I began with saying, besought their mother to let them run out and play in the new snow, for, though it had looked so dreary and dismal, drifting downward out of the gray sky, it had a very cheerful aspect. Now that the sun was shining on it, the children dwelt in a city and had no wider play place than a little garden before the house, divided by a white fence from the street, and with a pear tree and two or three plum trees overshadowing it and some rose bushes just in front of the parlor windows the trees and shrubs however were now leafless and their twigs were enveloped in the light snow which thus made a kind of wintry foliage with here and there a pendant icicle for the fruit yes violet yes my little peony said their kind mother you may go out and play in the new snow Accordingly, the good lady bundled up her darlings in woolen jackets and wadded sacks and put comforters round their necks and a pair of striped gaiters on each little pair of legs and worsted mittens on their hands and gave them a kiss apiece by way of a spell to keep away Jack Frost. Fort sallied the two children with hop, skip, and jump that carried them at once into the very heart of a huge snowdrift, whence Violet emerged like a snow bunting, with little Peony floundered out with his round face in full bloom. Then what a merry time had they! To look at them frolicking in the wintry garden, you would have thought that the dark and pitiless storm had been sent for no other purpose but to provide a new plaything for Violet and Peony and that they themselves have been created. As the snowbirds were, to take their light only in the tempest, and in the white mantle which it spread over the earth, at last, when they had frosted one another all over with handfuls of snow, Violet, after laughing heartily at little Peony's figure, was struck with a new idea. You look exactly like a snow image, Peony said she if your cheeks were not so red and that puts me in mind let us make an image out of snow 
an image of a little girl and it shall be our sister and shall run about and play with us all winter long won't it be nice oh yes cried peony as plainly as he could speak for he was but a little boy that will be nice and mamma shall see it yes answered violet mamma shall see the new little girl but she must not make her come in to the warm parlor for you know our little snow sister would not love the warmth and forthwith the children began this great business of making snow image that should run about while their mother who was sitting at the window and overheard some of their talk could not help smiling at the gravity with which they said about it they really seemed to imagine that there would be no difficulty whatever in creating a live little girl out of the snow and to say the truth if miracles are ever to be wrought it will be putting our hands to the work in precisely such a simple and undoubting frame of mind as that in which violet and peony now undertook to perform one without so much as knowing that it was a miracle so thought the mother and thought likewise that the new snow just fallen from heaven would be excellent material to make new beings of if it were not so very cold she gazed at the children a moment longer delighting to watch their little figures the girl tall for her age graceful and agile and so delicately colored that she looked like a cheerful thought more than a physical reality while peony expanded in breadth rather than height and rolled along on his short and sturdy legs as substantial as an elephant though not quite so big then the mother resumed her work what it was i forget but she was either trimming a silken bonnet for violet or darning a pair of stockings for little peony's short legs again however and again and yet other again she could not help turning her head to the window to see how the children got on with their snow image indeed it was an exceedingly pleasant sight those bright little souls at their task moreover it was really wonderful to observe how knowingly and skilfully they managed the matter violet assumed the chief direction and told peony what to do while with her own delicate fingers she shaped out all the nicer parts of the snow figure it seemed in fact not so much to be made by the children as to grow up under their hands while they were playing and prattling about it the mother was quite surprised at this and the longer she looked the more and more surprised she grew what remarkable children mine are thought she smiling with a mother's pride and smiling at herself too for being so proud of them what other children could have made anything so like a little girl's figure out of snow at the first trial well but now i must finish peony's new frock for his grandfather is coming to-morrow and i want the little fellow to look handsome so she took up the frock and was soon as busily at work again with her needle as the two children with their snow image but still as the needle travelled hither and thither through the seams of the dress the mother made her toil light and happy by listening to the airy voices of violet and peony they kept talking to one another all the time their tongues being quite as active as their feet and hands except at intervals she could not distinctly hear what was said but had merely a sweet impression that they were in a most loving mood and were enjoying themselves highly and that the business of making the snow image went prosperously on now and then however when violet and peony happened to raise their voices the words were as audible as if they had been spoken in the very parlor where the mother sat oh how delightfully those were echoed in her heart even though they were meant nothing so very wise or wonderful after all but you must know that a mother listens with her heart much more than with her ears and thus she is often delighted with the trills of celestial music when other people can hear nothing of the kind 
Peony, Peony, cried Violet to her brother, who had gone to another part of the garden. Bring me some of that fresh snow, Peony. From the very farthest corner, where we have not been trampling, I wanted to shape our little snow sister's bosom with. You know that part must be quite pure, just as it came out of the sky. Here it is, Violet, answered Peony, in his bluff tone, but a very sweet one, too. As he came flowering through the half-trodden drifts, here is the snow for her little bosom. Oh, Violet, how beautiful she begins to look. Yes, said Violet, thoughtfully and quietly. Our snow sister does look very lovely. I did not quite know, Peony, that we would make such a sweet little girl as this. The mother, as she listens, thought how fit and delightful an incident it would be. If fairies, or, still better, if angel children were to come from paradise, and play invisibly with her own darlings, and help them to make their soul image giving it the features of celestial babyhood. Violet and Peony would not be aware of their immortal playmates. Only they could see that the image grew very beautiful while they worked at it, and would think that they themselves had done it all. My little girl and boy deserve such playmates, if mortal children ever did, said the mother to herself and then she smiled again at her own motherly pride. Nevertheless, the idea seized upon her imagination, and ever and anon she took a glimpse out of the window, half dreaming that she might see the golden-haired children of paradise sporting with her own golden-haired violet and bright-cheeked peony. Now, for a few moments, they were busy in earnest, but distinct hum of the two children voices as violet and peony wrought together with one happy consent violet still seemed to be the guiding spirit while peony acted rather as a laborer and brought her the snow from far and near and yet the little urchin evidently had a proper understanding of the matter too peony peony cried violet for the brother was again at the other side of the garden Bring me those light wreaths of snow that have rested on the lower branches of the pear tree. You can clamber on the snowdrop, Peony, and reach them easily. I must have them to make some ringlets for our snow sister's head. Here they are, Violet, answered the little boy. Take care you do not break them. Well done, well done, how pretty! Does she not look sweet, said Violet? with a very satisfied tone and now we must have some little shining bits of ice to make the brightness of her eyes she is not finished yet mamma will see how very beautiful she is but papa will say tush nonsense come in out of the cold let us call mamma to look out said peony and then he shouted lustily mamma 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 Look out, and see what a nice little girl we are making. The mother put down her work for an instant and looked out of the window. But it so happened that the sun, for this was one of the shortest days of the whole year, had sunken so nearly to the edge of the world that his setting shine came obliquely into the lady's eyes. So she was dazzled, you must understand and could not very distinctly observe what was in the garden still however through all that bright blinding dazzle of the sun and the new snow she beheld a small white figure in the garden that seemed to have a wonderful deal of human likeness about it and she saw violet and peony indeed she looked more at them than at the image she saw the two children still at work peony bringing fresh snow and violet applying it to the figure as scientifically as a sculptor adds clay to his model indistinctly as she discerned the snow child the mother thought to herself that never before there is a snow figure so cunningly made 
nor ever such a dear little girl and boy to make it they do everything better than other children she said she very complacently no wonder they make better snow images she sat down again to her work and made as much haste with it as possible because twilight would soon come and peony's frock was not yet finished and grandfather was suspected by railroad pretty early in the morning faster and faster therefore went her flying fingers the children likewise kept busily at work in the garden and still the mother listened whenever she could catch a word she was amused to observe how the little imaginations had got mixed up with what they were doing and were carried away by it they seemed positively to think that the snow child would run about and play with them what a nice playmate she will be for us all winter long said violet i hope papa will not be afraid of her giving us a cold shouldn't you love her dearly peony oh yes cried peony and i will hug her and she shall sit down close by me and drink some of my warm milk oh no peony answered violet with grave wisdom that would not do at all warm milk would not be wholesome for our little snow sister little snow people like her eat nothing but icicles no no peony we must not give her anything warm to drink there was a minute or two of silence for peony whose short legs were never weary had gone on a pilgrimage again to the other side of the garden all of a sudden violet cried out loudly and joyfully look here peony come quickly a light has been shining on her cheek out of that rose-colored cloud and the color does not go away is not that beautiful yes it is beautiful answered peony pronouncing the three syllables with deliberate accuracy oh violet only look at her hair it is all like gold oh certainly said violet with tranquillity as if it were very much matter of course that color you know comes from the golden clouds that we see up there in the sky she is almost finished now but her lips must be made very red redder than her cheeks perhaps peony you will make them red if you both kiss them accordingly the mother heard two smart little smacks as if both her children were kissing the snow image on its frozen mouth but as this did not seem to make the lips quite red enough violet next proposed that the snow child should be invited to kiss peony's scarlet cheek come little snow sister kiss me cried peony there she has kissed you added violet and her lips are very red and she blushed a little too oh what a cold kiss cried peony just then there came a breeze of the pure west wind sweeping through the garden and rattling the parlor windows it sounded so wintry cold that the mother was about to tap on the window pane with her thimble finger to summon the two children in when they were both cried out to her with one voice the tone was not a tone of surprise although they were evidently a good deal excited it appeared rather as if they were very much rejoiced at some event that had now happened but which they had been looking for and had reckoned upon all along mamma mamma we have finished our little snow sister and she is running about the garden with us what imaginative little beings my children are thought the mother putting the last few stitches into peony's frock and it is strange too that they make me almost as much a child as they themselves are i can hardly help believing now that the snow image has really come to life dear mamma cried violet pray look out and see what a sweet playmate we have the mother being thus entreated could no longer delay to look forth from the window the sun was now going out of the sky leaving 
however a rich inheritance of his brightness among those purple and golden clouds which make the sunsets of winter so magnificent but there was not the slightest gleam or dazzle either on the window or on the snow so that the, the good lady could look all over the garden and see everything and everybody in it and what do you think she saw there violet and peony of course her own two darling children ah but whom or what did she see besides why if you will believe me there was a small figure of a girl dressed all in white with rose-tinged cheeks and ringlets of golden hue played about the garden with the two children a stranger though she was the child seemed to be on as familiar terms with violet and peony and they with her as if all the three had been playmates during the whole of their little lives the mother thought to herself that it must certainly be the daughter of one of the neighbors and that seeing violet and peony in the garden the child had run across the street to play with them so this kind lady went to the door intending to invite the little runaway into her comfortable parlor for now that the sunshine was withdrawn the atmosphere out of doors were already growing very cold but after opening the house door she stood an instant on the threshold hesitating whether she ought to ask the child to come in or whether she should even speak to her indeed she almost doubted whether it were a real child after all or only a light wreath of the new fallen snow blown hither and thither about the garden by the intensely cold west wind there was certainly something very singular in the aspect of the little stranger among all the children of the neighborhood the lady could remember no such face with its pure white and delicate rose color and the golden ringlets tossing about the foreheads and cheeks and as for her dress which was entirely of white and fluttering in the breeze it was such as no reasonable woman would put upon a little girl when sending her out to play in the depth of winter made this kind and careful mother shiver only to look at those small feet with nothing in the world on them except a very thin pair of white slippers nevertheless airily as she was clad the child seemed to feel not the slightest inconvenience from the cold but danced so lightly over the snow that the tips of her toes left hardly a print in its surface while violet could but just keep pace with her and peony's short legs compelled him to lag behind once in the course of their play the strange child placed herself between violet and peony and taking a hand of each skipped merrily forward and they along with her almost immediately however peony pulled away his little fist and began to rub it as if the fingers were tingling with cold while violet also released herself though with less abruptness gravely remarking that it was better not to take hold of hands the white robe danced said not a word but danced about just as merrily as before if violet and peony did not choose to play with her she could make just as good a playmate of the brisk and cold west wind which kept blowing her all about the garden and took such liberties with her that they seemed to have been friends for a long time all this while the mother stood on the threshold wondering how a little girl could look so much like a flying snowdrift or how a snowdrift could look so very like a little girl she called violet and whispered to her violet my darling what is this child's name asked she does she live near us why dearest mamma answered violet laughing to think that her mother did not comprehend so very plain an affair this is our little snow sister whom we have just been making 
yes dear mamma cried peony running to his mother and looking up simply into her face this is our snow image is it not a nice little child at this instant a flock of snowbirds came flitting through the air it was very natural they avoided violet and peony but and this looked strange they flew at once to the white-robed child fluttered eagerly about her head a line on her shoulders and seemed to claim her as an old acquaintance she on her part was evidently as glad to see these little birds old winter's grandchildren as they were to see her and welcomed them by holding out both her hands hereupon they each and all tried to alight on her two palms and ten small fingers and thumbs crowding one another off with immense fluttering of their tiny wings one dear little bird nestled tenderly in her bosom another puts his bill to her lips they were as joyous all the while and seem as much in their element as you may have seen them when sporting with a snowstorm violet and peony stood laughing at this pretty sight for they enjoyed the merry time which their new playmate was having with their small winged visitants almost as much as if they themselves took part in it violet said her mother greatly perplexed tell me the truth without any jest who is this little girl my darling mamma answered violet looking seriously into her mother's face and apparently surprised that she should need any further explanation i have told you truly who she is it is our little snow image while peony and i have been making peony will tell you so as well as i yes mamma asseverated peony with much gravity in his crimson little fizz this is little snow child is not she a nice one but mamma her hand is oh so very cold while mamma still hesitated what to think and what to do the street gate was thrown open and the father of violet and peony appeared wrapped in a pilot clout sack with a fur cap drawn down over his ears and the thickest of gloves upon his hands mr lindsay was a middle-aged man with a weary and yet a happy look in his wind flush and frost pinched face as if he had been busy all the day long and was glad to get back to his quiet home his eyes brightened at the sight of his wife and children and although he could not help uttering a word or two of surprise at finding the whole family in the open air on so bleak a day and after sunset too he soon perceived the little white stranger sporting to and fro in the garden like a dancing snow wreath and a flock of snow birds fluttering about her head pray what little girl may that be inquired this very sensible man surely her mother must be crazy to let her go out in such bitter weather as it has been to-day with only that flimsy white gown and those thin slippers my dear husband said his wife i know no more about that little thing than you do some neighbor's child i suppose our violet and peony she added laughing at herself for repeating so absurd a sorry and says that she is nothing but a snow image which they have been busy about in the garden almost all the afternoon as she said this the mother glanced her eyes toward the spot where the children's snow image had been made what was her surprise on perceiving that there was not the slightest trace of so much labor no image at all no piled up heap of snow nothing whatever save the prints of little footsteps around a vacant space this is very strange said she what is strange dear mother asked violet dear father do not you see how it is this is our snow image which peony and i have made because we wanted another playmate 
did not we peony yes papa said crimson peony this be our little snow sister she's not beautiful but she gave me such a cold kiss pooh nonsense children cried their good honest father who as we have already intimated had an exceedingly common sensible way of looking at matters do not tell me of making live figures out of snow come wife this little stranger must not stay out in the bleak air a moment longer we will bring her into the parlor and you shall give her a supper of warm bread and milk and make her as comfortable as you can meanwhile i will inquire among the neighbors or if necessary send the city crier about the streets to give notice of a lost child so saying this honest and very kind-hearted man was going toward the little white damsel with the best intentions in the world but violet and peony each seizing their father by the hand earnestly besought him not to make her come in dear father cried violet putting herself before him it is true what i have been telling you this is our little snow girl and she cannot live any longer than while she breathes the cold west wind do not make her come into the hot room yes father shouted peony stamping his little foot so mightily was he in earnest this be nothing but our little snow child she would not love the hot fire nonsense children nonsense nonsense cried the father half vexed half laughing at what he considered their foolish obstinacy run into the house this moment it is too late to play any longer now i must take care of this little girl immediately or she will catch her that a cold husband dear husband said his wife in a low voice for she had been looking narrowly at the snow child and was more perplexed than ever there is something very singular in all this you would think me foolish but but may it not be that some invisible angel has been attracted by the simplicity and good faith with which our children set about their undertaking may he not have spent an hour of his immortality in playing with those dear little souls and so the results is what we call a miracle no no do not laugh at me i see what a foolish thought it is my dear wife replied the husband laughing heartily you are as much a child as violet and peony and in one sense so she was for all through life she kept her heart full of childlike simplicity and faith which was as pure and clear as crystal and looking at all matters through this transparent medium she sometimes saw truths so profound that people laughed at them as nonsense and absurdity but now kind mr lindsay had entered the garden breaking away from his two children who still sent their shrill voices after him beseeching him to let the snow child stay and enjoy herself in the cold west wind as he approached the snow birds took to flight the little white damsel also fled backward shaking her head as if to say pray do not touch me and roguishly as it appeared leading him through the deepest of the snow once the good man stumbled and floundered down upon his face so that gathering himself up again with the snow sticking to his rough pilot cloth sack he looked as white and wintry as the snow image of the largest size some of the neighbors meanwhile seeing him from their windows wonder what could possess poor mr lindsay to be running about his garden in pursuit of a snowdrift which the west wind was driving hither and thither at length after a vast deal of trouble he chased the little stranger into a corner where she could not possibly escape him his wife had been looking on and it being nearly twilight was wonderstruck to observe how the snow-child gleamed and sparkled 
and how she seemed to shed a glow all round about her and when driven into the corner she positively glistened like a star it was a frosty kind of brightness too like that of an icicle in the moonlight the wife thought it strange that good mr lindsay should see nothing remarkable in the snow child's appearance come you odd little thing cried the honest man seizing her by the hand i have caught you at last it will make you comfortable in spite of yourself we will put a nice warm pair of worsted stockings on your frozen little feet and you shall have a good thick shawl to wrap yourself in your poor white nose i'm afraid is actually frostbitten but we will make it all right come along in and so with a most benevolent smile on his anxious visage all purple as it was with the cold this very well-meaning gentleman took the snow child by the hand and led her towards the house she followed him droopingly and reluctant for all the glow and sparkle was gone out of her figure and whereas just before she had resembled a bright frosty star gem evening with a crimson gleam on the cold horizon she now looked as dull and languid as a doll as kind mr lindsay led her up the steps of the door violet and peony looked into his face their eyes full of tears which froze before they could run down their cheeks and again entreated him not to bring their snow image into the house not bring her in exclaimed the kind-hearted man why you are crazy my little violet quite crazy my small peony she is so cold already that her hand has almost frozen mine in spite of my thick gloves would you have her freeze to death his wife as he came up the steps had been taking another long earnest almost awe-stricken gaze at the little white stranger she hardly knew whether it was a dream or not but she could not help fancying that she saw the delicate print of violet fingers on the child's neck it looked just as if while violet was shaping out the image she had given it a gentle pat with her hand and had neglected to smooth the impression quite away after all husband said the mother recurring to her idea that the angels would be as much delighted to play with violet and peony as she herself was after all she does look strangely like a snow image i do believe she is made of snow a puff of the west wind blew against the snow child and again she sparkled like a star snow repeated good mr Nancy, drawing the reluctant guests over the this hospitable threshold no wonder she looks like snow she is half frozen poor little thing but a good fire will put everything to rights without further talk and always with the same best intentions this highly benevolent and common sensible individual led the little white damsel drooping 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 more and more out the frosty air and into his comfortable parlor a heidenberg stove filled to the brim with intensely burning sight was sending a bright gleam through the ensign glass of its iron door and caused the vase of water on its top to fume and bubble with excitement a warm sultry smell was diffused throughout the room a thermometer on the wall farthest from the stove stood at eighty degrees the parlor was hung with red curtains and covered with a red carpet and looked just as warm as it felt difference betwixt the atmosphere here and the cold tree twilight out of doors was like stepping at once from nova zembla to the hottest port of india or from the north pole into an oven oh this was a fine place for the little white stranger the common sensible man placed the snow child on the hurt rug right in front of the hissing and fuming stove now she will be comfortable cried mr lindsay rubbing his hands and looking about him 
with the pleasantest smile you ever saw yourself at home my child sad sad and drooping looked the little white maiden as she stood on the hurt work with the hot blast of the stove striking through her like a pestilence once she threw a glance wistfully toward the windows and caught a glimpse through its red curtains of the snow-covered roofs and the stores glimmering frostily in all the delicious intensity of the cold night the bleak wind rattled the window panes as if it were summoning her to come forth but there stood the snow child drooping before the hot stove but the common sensible man saw nothing amiss come wife said he let her have a pair of thick stockings and a wooden shawl or blanket directly and tell dora to give her some warm supper as soon as the milk boils you violet and peony amuse your little friend she is out of spirits you see at finding herself in a strange place for my part i will go around among the neighbors and find out where she belongs the mother meanwhile had gone in search of the shawl and stockings for her own view of the matter however subtle and delicate had given way as it always did to the stubborn materialism of her husband without heeding the remonstrances of his two children who still kept murmuring that their little snow sister did not love the warmth good mr lindsay took his departure shutting the parlor door carefully behind him turning up the collar of his sack over his ears he emerged from the house and had barely reached the street gate when he recalled by the screams of violet and peony and the rappling of a dimpled finger against the parlor window husband husband cried his wife showing her horror-stricken face through the window panes there is no need of going for the child's parents we told you so father screamed violet and peony as he re-entered the parlor you would bring her in and now a poor dear beautiful little sister is dawed and their own sweet little faces were already dissolved in tears so that their father seeing what strange things occasionally happen in this everyday world felt not a little anxious lest his children might be going to doll too in the utmost perplexity he demanded an explanation of his wife she could only reply that being summoned to the parlor by the cries of violet and peony she found no trace of the little white maiden unless it were the remains of a heap of snow which while she was gazing at it melted quite away upon the hurt world and there you see all that is left of it added she pointing to a pool of water in front of the stove yes father said violet looking reproachfully at him through her tears there is all that is left of our dear little snow sister naughty father cried peony stamping his foot and i shudder to say shaking his little fist at the common sensible man we told you how it would be what for did you bring her in in the heidenberg stove through the instant glass of his door seemed to glare at good mr lindsay like a red-eyed demon triumphing in the mischief which it had done this you will observe was one of those rare cases which yet will occasionally happen where common sense finds itself at fault the remarkable story of the snow image though to that sagacious class of people to whom good mr lindsay belongs it may not seem but a childish affair is nevertheless capable of being moralized in various methods greatly for their edification one of his lessons for instance might be that it behooves men and especially men of benevolence to consider well what they are about and before acting on their philanthropic purposes to be quite sure that they comprehend the nature and all the relations of the business in hand what has been established as an element of good to one being may prove absolute mischief to another 
even as the warmth of the parlor was proper enough for children of flesh and blood like violet and peony though by no means very wholesome even for them involved nothing short of annihilation to the unfortunate snow image but after all there is no teaching anything to wise men of good mr lindsay's stamp they know everything oh to be sure everything that has been and everything that is and everything that by any possibility can be and should some phenomenon of nature or providence transcend their system they will not recognize it even if it come to pass under their very noses wife said mr lindsay after a fit of silence see what a quantity of snow the children have brought in on their feet it has made quite a puddle here before the snow pray tell dora to bring some towels and sop it up End of chapter three Recording by Nikki five zero four Chapter four Part one of Famous Stories Every Child Should Know. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Famous Stories Every Child Should Know, edited by Hamilton Wright Maybe. Chapter 4, Part 1, Undine, by Friedrich Baron de Lamotte Folk. Part 1. How the Knight Came to the Fisherman's Cottage. Once, it may be some hundreds of years ago, there lived a good old fisherman who on a fine summer's evening was sitting before the door mending his nets. He dwelt in a land of exceeding beauty. The green slope upon which he had built his hut stretched far out into a great lake, and it seemed either that the cape, enamored of the glassy blue waters, had pressed forward into their bosom, or that the lake had lovingly folded in its arms the blooming promontory with her waving grass and flowers, and the refreshing shade of her tall trees each bade the other welcome and increased its own beauty by so doing this lovely nook was scarcely ever visited by mankind except by the fisherman and his family for behind the promontory lay a very wild forest which beside being gloomy and pathless had too bad a name as the resort of wondrous spirits and goblins to be crossed by any one who could help it Yet the pious old fisherman went through it without being molested whenever he walked to a large city beyond the forest to dispose of the costly fish that he caught in the lake for him indeed there was little danger even in that forest for his thoughts were almost all thoughts of devotion and his custom was to carol forth to heaven a loud and heartfelt hymn on first setting foot within the treacherous shades as he sat this evening most peacefully over his nets he was startled in an unwonted manner by a rustling sound in the forest like that of a man and horse and the noise came nearer and nearer the dreams he had had in many a stormy night of the spirits of the forest started up before his mind particularly the image of a gigantic long snow-white man who kept nodding his head mysteriously nay as he raised his eyes and looked into the forest he could fancy he saw through the thick screen of leaves the nodding creature advance toward him but he soon composed himself recollecting that even in the heart of the woods nothing had ever befallen him much less here in the open air could the bad spirits have power to touch him he moreover repeated a text from the bible aloud and earnestly which quite restored his courage and he almost laughed to see how his fancy had misled him the white nodding man suddenly resolved himself into a little brook he knew of old which gushed bubbling out of the wood and emptied itself into the lake and the rustling had been caused by a horseman in gorgeous attire who now came forward toward the hut from beneath the trees he wore a scarlet mantle over his purple gold embroidered jerkin a plume of red and purple feathers waved over his gold-colored barret cap and from his golden belt hung a glittering jeweled sword 
The white courser which carried him was of lighter make than the generality of chargers, and trod so airily that the enameled turf seemed scarcely to bend under him. The aged fisherman could not quite shake off his uneasiness, although he told himself that so noble a guest could bring him no harm, and accordingly doffed his hat courteously and interrupted his work when he approached. The knight reined in his horse and asked whether they could both obtain one night shelter. As to your horse, good sir, answered the fisherman, I have no better stable to offer him than the shady meadow, and no provender but the grass which grows upon it. But you shall yourself be heartily welcome to my poor house, and to the best of my supper and night lodging. The stranger seemed quite content. He dismounted, and they helped each other to take off the horse's girth and saddle, after which the knight let him graze on the flowery pasture, saying to his host, Even if I had found you less kind and hospitable, my good old man, you must have borne with me till to-morrow, for I see we are shut in by a wide lake, and heaven forbid that I should cross the haunted forest again at nightfall. We will not say much about that, replied the fisherman, and he led his guest into the cottage. There, close by the hearth, from whence a scanty fire shed its glimmering light over the clean little room, sat the fisherman's old wife. When their noble guest came in, she rose to give him a kind welcome, but immediately resumed her place of honor, without offering it to him. And the fisherman said with a smile, Do not take it amiss, young sir, if she does not give up to you the most comfortable place. It is the custom among us poor people that it should always belong to the oldest. Why, husband, said the wife quietly, what are you thinking of? Our guest is surely a Christian gentleman, and how could it come into his kind young heart to turn old people out of their places? Sit down, my young lord, added she, turning to the knight. There stands a very comfortable chair for you, only remember it must not be too roughly handled, for one leg is not so steady as it has been. The knight drew the chair carefully forward, seated himself sociably, and soon felt quite at home in this little household, and as if he had just returned to it from a far journey. The three friends began to converse openly and familiarly together. First the knight asked a few questions about the forest, but the old man would not say much of that. Least of all, said he, was it fitting to talk of such things at nightfall. But on household concerns, and their own way of life, the old folks talked readily, and were pleased when the knight told them of his travels, and that he had a castle near the source of the Danube, and that his name was Lord Huldbrand of Ringstetten. In the middle of their discourse, the stranger often observed a noise outside a small window, as if someone were dashing water against it. The old man knit his brows and looked grave whenever this occurred. At last, when a great splash of water came full against the panes, and some found its way into the room, he could bear it no longer, but started up crying, Undine, will you never leave off these childish tricks, when we have a stranger gentleman in the house too? And this produced silence outside, all but a sound of suppressed giggling. And the fisherman said, as he came back, My honored guest, you must put up with this, and perhaps with many another piece of mischief, but she means no harm. It is our adopted child, Undine. There is no breaking her of her childish ways, though she is eighteen years old now. But as I told you, she is as good a child as ever lived at bottom. Ay, so you may say, rejoined his wife, shaking her head, when you come home from fishing, or from a journey, her playful nonsense may be pleasant enough, but to be keeping her out of mischief all day long as I must do, and never get a word of sense from her, nor a bit of help and comfort in my old age, is enough to weary the patience of a saint. Well, well, said the good man, you feel toward Undine as I do towards the lake. Though its waves are apt enough to burst my banks and my nets, yet I love them for all that, and so do you love our pretty wench, with all her plaguey tricks, don't you? Why, one cannot be really angry with her, to be sure, said the dame, smiling. Here the door flew open, and a beautiful fair creature tripped in, and said playfully, Well, father, you made game of me. Where is your guest? The next moment she perceived the knight, and stood fixed in mute admiration. 
while Huldbrand gazed upon her lovely form, and tried to impress her image on his mind, thinking that he must avail himself of her amazement to do so, and that in a moment she would shrink away in a fit of bashfulness. But it proved otherwise. After looking at him a good while, she came up to him, familiarly, knelt down beside him, and playing with a golden medal that hung from his rich chain, she said, So, thou kind, thou beautiful guest, hast thou found us out in our poor hut at last? Why didst thou roam the world so many years without coming near us? Art come through the wild forest, my handsome friend? The old woman allowed him no time to answer. She desired her to get up instantly like a modest girl and to set about her work. But Undine, without replying, fetched a footstool and put it close to Huldbrand's chair, sat down there with her spinning, and said cheerfully, I will sit and work here. The old man behaved as parents are apt to do with spoiled children. He pretended not to see Undine's waywardness, and was beginning to talk of something else. But she would not let him. She said, I asked our visitor where he came from, and he has not answered me yet. From the forest I came, you beautiful sprite, answered Huldbrand, and she continued, Then you must tell me how you came there, and what wonderful adventures you had in it, for I know that nobody can escape without some. Huldbrand could not help shuddering on being reminded of his adventures, and involuntarily glanced at the window, half expecting to see one of the strange beings he had encountered in the forest grinning at him through it but nothing was to be seen except the deep black night which had now closed in. He recollected himself, and was just beginning his narrative when the old man interposed, Not just now, Sir Knight, this is no time for such tales. But Undine jumped up passionately, put her beautiful arms akimbo, and standing before the fisherman exclaimed, What? May not he tell his story, father? May not he? But I will have it. He must. He shall indeed, and she stamped angrily with her pretty feet. But it was all done in so comical and graceful a manner that Huldbrand thought her still more bewitching in her wrath than in her playful mood. Not so the old man. His long-restrained anger burst out uncontrolled. He scolded Undine smartly for her disobedience and unmannerly conduct to the stranger, his wife chiming in. Undine then said, Very well. If you will be quarrelsome, and not let me have my own way, you may sleep alone in your smoky old hut. And she shot through the door like an arrow, and rushed into the dark night. End of chapter 4, part 1all LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Lynn Thompson. Famous Stories Every Child Should Know. Edited by Hamilton Wright Maybe. Chapter 4, Part 2. Undine. By Friedrich Baron de la Motte Fouquet. How Undine First Came to the Fisherman. Huldebrand and the fishermen sprang from their seats and tried to catch the angry maiden, but before they could reach the house door, Undine had vanished far into the thick shades, and not a sound of her light footsteps was to be heard by which to track her course. Huldebrand looked doubtfully at his host. He almost thought that the whole fair vision which had so suddenly plunged into the night must be a continuation of the phantom play which had whirled around him in his passage through the forest. But the old man mumbled through his teeth, It is not the first time she has served us so, and here we are, left in our anxiety with a sleepless night before us, for who can tell what harm may befall her, all alone, out of doors till daybreak? Then let us be after her, good father, for God's sake, cried Huldbrand eagerly. The old man replied, Where would be the use? It were a sin to let you set off alone in pursuit of the foolish girl, and my old legs would never overtake such a will with the wisp, even if we could guess which way she is gone. At least let us call her and beg her to come back, 
said Huldbrand, as he began calling after her in most moving tones, Undine, oh, Undine, do return. The old man shook his head and said that all the shouting in the world would do no good with such a wilful little thing. But yet he could not himself help calling out from time to time in the darkness, Undine, ah, sweet Undine, I entreat thee, come back this once. The fisherman's words proved true. Nothing was to be seen or heard of Undine, and as her foster-father would by no means suffer Huldbrand to pursue her, they had nothing for it but to go in again. They found the fire on the hearth nearly burnt out, and the dame, who did not take to heart Undine's flight and danger so much as her husband, was gone to bed. The old man blew the coals, laid on dry wood, and by the light of the reviving flames he found a flagon of wine, which he put between himself and his guest. "'You are uneasy about that silly wench, Sir Knight,' he said. "'We had better kill part of the night chatting and drinking, than toss about in our beds, trying to sleep in vain, had not we?' Huldbrand agreed. The fisherman made him sit in his wife's empty armchair, and they both drank and talked together, as a couple of worthy friends should do. Whenever, indeed, there was the least stir outside the window, or even sometimes without any, one of them would look up and say, There she comes. Then they would keep silence for a few moments, and, as nothing came, resume their conversation, with a shake of the head and a sigh. But as neither could think of much beside Undine, the best means they could devise for beguiling the time was that the fisherman should relate, and the knight listen to, the history of her first coming to the cottage. He began as follows. One day, some fifteen years ago, I was carrying my fish through that dreary wood to the town. My wife stayed at home as usual, and at that time she had a good and pretty reason for it. The Lord had bestowed upon us, old as we already were, a lovely babe. It was a girl, and so anxious were we to do our best for the little treasure that we began to talk of leaving our beautiful home in order to give our darling a good education among other human beings. With us poor folks, wishing is one thing, and doing is quite another, Sir Knight. But what then? We can only try our best. Well then, as I plodded on, I turned over the scheme in my head. I was loath to leave our own dear nook, and it made me shudder to think in the din and brawls of the town. So it is here we shall soon live, or in some place nearly as bad. Yet I never murmured against our good God, but rather thanked him in secret for his last blessing nor can I say that I met with anything extraordinary in the forest, either coming or going. Indeed, nothing to frighten me had ever crossed my path. The Lord was ever with me in the awful shades. Here he uncovered his bald head, and sat for a time in silent prayer. Then putting on his cap again, he continued, On this side of the wood it was, on this side, that the sad news met me, my wife came toward me with eyes streaming like two fountains. She was in deep mourning. Oh, good heaven, I called out. Where is our dear child? Tell me. Gone, dear husband, she replied, and we went into our cottage together, weeping silently. I looked for the little corpse, and then first heard how it had happened. My wife had been sitting on the shore with the child, and playing with it, all peace and happiness when the babe all at once leaned over, as if she saw something most beautiful in the water. There she sat smiling, sweet angel, and stretching out her little hands, but the next moment she darted suddenly out of her arms, and down into the smooth waters. I made much search for the poor little corpse, but in vain, not a trace of her could I find. When evening was come, we childless parents were sitting together in the hut, silent, neither of us had a mind to speak even if the tears had let us we were looking idly into the fire just then something made a noise at the door it opened and a beautiful little maid of three or four years old stood there gaily dressed and smiling in our faces we were struck dumb with surprise and at first hardly knew if she were a little human being or only an empty shadow but i soon saw that her golden hair and gay clothes were dripping wet and it struck me that the little fairy must have been in the water and distressed for help. Wife, said I, our dear child had no friend to save her. Shall we not do for others what would have made our remaining days so happy, if anyone had done it for us? 
We undressed the child and put her to bed, and gave her a warm drink, while she never said a word, but kept smiling at us with her sky-blue eyes. The next morning we found she had done herself no harm, and I asked her who were her parents, and what had brought her here. But she gave me a strange, confused answer. I am sure she must have been born far away, for these fifteen years have we kept her, without ever finding out where she came from. And besides, she is apt to let drop such marvellous things in her talk that you might think she had lived on the moon. She will speak of golden castles, of crystal roofs, and I can't tell what besides. The only thing she has told us clearly is that as she was sailing on the lake with her mother, she fell into the water, and when she recovered her senses, found herself lying under these trees in safety and comfort upon our pretty shore. So now we had a serious, anxious charge thrown upon us. To keep and bring up the foundling, instead of our own poor drowned child, that was soon resolved upon. But who should tell us if she had yet been baptized or no? She knew not how to answer the question. That she was one of God's creatures made for his glory and service, that much she knew. And anything that would glorify and please him, she was willing to have done. So my wife and I said to each other, If she has never been baptized, there is no doubt it should be done. And if she has, better do too much than too little, in a matter of such consequence. We therefore began to seek a good name for the child. Dorothea seemed to us the best, for I had once heard that meant God's gift, and she had indeed been sent us by him as a special blessing to comfort us in our misery. But she would not hear of that name. She said Undine was what her parents used to call her, and Undine she would still be. That, I thought, sounded like a heathen name, and occurred in no calendar, and I took counsel with a priest in the town about it. He also objected to the name Undine, and in my earnest request came home with me through the dark forest in order to baptize her. The little creature stood before us, looking so gay and charming in her holiday clothes, that the priest's heart warmed toward her, and what with coaxing and wilfulness she got the better of him, so he clean forgot all the objections he had thought of to the name Undine. She was therefore so christened, and behaved particularly well and decently during the sacred rite, wild and unruly as she had always been before. For what my wife said just now was too true. We have indeed found her the wildest little fairy. If I were to tell you all, here the knight interrupted the fisherman, to call his attention to a sound of roaring waters, which he had noticed already in the pauses of the old man's speech, and which now rose in fury as it rushed past the windows. They both ran to the door. By the light of the newly risen moon, they saw the brook which gushed out of the forest breaking wildly over its banks, and whirling along stones and branches in its eddying course. A storm, as if awakened by the uproar, burst from the heavy clouds that were chasing each other across the moon. The lake howled with the wings of the wind. The trees on the shore groaned from top to bottom, and bowed themselves over the rushing waters. "'Undine! For God's sake, Undine!' cried the knight and the old man. No answer was to be heard, and, heedless now of any danger to themselves, they ran off in different directions, calling her in frantic anxiety. End of chapter 4, part 2 Chapter 4, part 3 of Famous Stories Every Child Should Know This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Reading by Matt Perard. Famous Stories Every Child Should Know Edited by Hamilton Wright Maybe Chapter 4, Part 3 Undine By Friedrich Baron de la Motte Folk How They Found Undine Again The longer Huldbrand wandered in vain pursuit of Undine, the more bewildered he became. The idea that she might be a mere spirit of the woods sometimes returned upon him with double force. 
nay amid the howling waves and storm the groaning of trees and the wild commotion of the once peaceful spot he might have fancied the whole promontory its hut and its inhabitants to be a delusion of magic but that he still heard in the distance the fisherman's piteous cries of undine and the old housewife's loud prayers and hymns above the whistling of the blast at last he found himself on the margin of the overflowing stream and saw it by the moonlight rushing violently along close to the edge of the mysterious forest so as to make an island of the peninsula on which he stood gracious heaven thought he undine may have ventured a step or two into that awful forest perhaps in her pretty waywardness just because i would not tell her my story and the swollen stream has cut her off and left her weeping alone among the spectres a cry of terror escaped him and he clambered down the bank by means of some stones and fallen trees hoping to wade or swim across the flood and seek the fugitive beyond it fearful and unearthly visions did indeed float before him like those he had met with in the morning beneath these groaning tossing branches especially he was haunted by the appearance of a tall white man whom he remembered but too well grinning and nodding at him from the opposite bank however the thought of these grim monsters did but urge him onward as he recollected undine now perhaps in deadly fear among them and alone he had laid hold of a stout pine branch and leaning on it was standing in the eddy though scarcely able to stem it but he stepped boldly forward when a sweet voice exclaimed close behind him trust him not trust not the old fellow is tricksy the stream well he knew those silver tones the moon was just disappearing behind a cloud and he stood amid the deepening shades made dizzy as the water shot by him with the speed of an arrow yet he would not desist and if thou art not truly there if thou flittest before me an empty shadow i care not to live i will melt into air like thee my beloved undine this he cried aloud and strode further into the flood look round then look round fair youth he heard just behind him and looking round he beheld by the returning moonbeams on a fair island left by the flood under some thickly interlaced branches undine all smiles and loveliness nestling in the flowery grass how much more joyfully than before did the young man use his pine staff to cross the waters a few strides brought him through the flood that had parted them and he found himself at her side on the nook of soft grass securely sheltered under the shade of the old trees undine half arose and twined her arms round his neck in the green arbor making him sit down by her on the turf here you shall tell me all my own friend said she in a low whisper the cross old folks cannot overhear us and our pretty bower of leaves is well worth their wretched hut this is heaven cried Haldbrand, as he as he clasped in his arms the beautiful flatterer meantime the old man had reached the banks of the stream and he called out so sir knight when i had made you welcome as one honest man should another here are you making love to my adopted child to say nothing of your leaving me to see her alone and terrified all night i have but this moment found her old man cried the knight in reply well i am glad of that said the fisherman now then bring her back to me at once but undine would not hear of it she had rather she said go quite away into the wild woods with a handsome stranger than return to the hut where she had never had her own way and which the knight must sooner or later leave embracing huldbrand she sang with peculiar charm and grace from misty cave 
the mountain wave leapt out and sought the main the ocean's foam she made her home and ne'er returned again the old man wept bitterly as she sang but this did not seem to move her she continued to caress her lover till at length he said undine the poor old man's grief goes to my heart if not to yours let us go back to him astonished she raised her large blue eyes toward him and after a pause answered slowly and reluctantly to please you i will whatever you like pleases me too but the old man yonder must first promise me that he will let you tell me all you saw in the forest and the rest we shall see about only come back do come cried the fisherman and not another word could he say at the same moment he stretched his arms over the stream toward her and nodded his head by way of giving her the desired promise and as his white hair fell over his face it gave him a strange look and reminded Huldbrand involuntarily of the nodding white man in the woods. Determined, however, that nothing should stop him, the young knight took the fair damsel in his arms and carried her through the short space of foaming flood which divided the island from the mainland. The old man fell upon Undine's neck and rejoiced and kissed her in the fullness of his heart. His aged wife also came up, and welcomed their recovered child most warmly. All reproaches were forgotten, the more so, as Undine seemed to have left her sauciness behind, and overwhelmed her foster parents with kind words and caresses. When these transports of joy had subsided, and they began to look about them, the rosy dawn was just shedding its glow over the lake. The storm had ceased, and the birds were singing merrily on the wet branches. As Undine insisted upon hearing the story of the night's adventure, both the old folks cheerfully indulged her. Breakfast was set out under the trees, between the cottage and the lake, and they sat down before it with glad hearts. Undine placing herself resolutely on the grass at the knight's feet, Huldbrand began his narrative as follows. End of chapter 4, part 3。chapter 4, part 4 of Famous Stories Every Child Should Know。This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Reading by Matt Perard. Famous Stories Every Child Should Know. Edited by Hamilton Wright Maybe. Chapter 4, Part 4 of Undine by Friedrich Baron de Lamont Falk. Of what had befallen the night in the forest. About eight days ago, I rode into the imperial city beyond this forest. A grand tournament and tilting was held there, and I spared neither lance nor steed. As I stood still a moment to rest myself in a pause of the noble game, and had just given my helmet in charge to a squire, my eye fell upon a most beautiful woman who stood, richly adorned, in one of the galleries, looking on. I inquired her name, and found that this charming lady was Bertalda, the adopted daughter of one of the principal lords in the neighborhood. I observed that her eye was upon me, too, and as is the way with us young knights, I had not been slack before, but I now fought more bravely still. That evening I was Bertalda's partner in the dance, and so I was again every evening during the jousting. Here a sudden pain in his left hand, which hung beside him, checked the knight in his tail, and he looked at his hand. Undine's pearly teeth, had bitten one of his fingers sharply, and she looked very black at him. But the next moment that look changed into an expression of tender sadness, and she whispered low, So you are faithless, too. Then she hid her face in her hands, and the knight proceeded with his tale, although staggered 
and perplexed. That Bertalda is a high-spirited, extraordinary maid. On the second day she charmed me far less than the first, and on the third less still. But I remained with her, because she was more gracious to me than any other knight, and so it fell out that I asked her, in jest, for one of her gloves. You shall have it, said she, if you will visit the haunted forest alone, and bring me an account of it. It was not that I cared much for her glove, but the words had been spoken, and not a knight that loves his fame does not wait to be twice urged to such a feat. I thought she had loved you, interrupted Undine. It looked like it, he replied. Well, cried the maiden, laughing, she must be a fool indeed to drive him away, whom she loves, and into a haunted forest besides. The forest and its mysteries might have waited long enough for me. I set out yesterday morning, continued the knight, smiling kindly at Undine. The stems of the trees looked so bright in the morning sunshine as it played upon the green turf, and the leaves whispered together so pleasantly that I could not but laugh at those who imagined any evil to lurk in such a beautiful place. I shall very soon have ridden through it and back again, thought I, pushing on cheerily, and before I was aware of it I found myself in the depths of its leafy shades, and the plains behind me far out of sight. It then occurred to me that I was likely enough to lose my way in this wilderness of trees, and that this might be the only real danger to which the traveller was here exposed. So I halted, and took notice of the course of the sun. It was now high in the heavens. On looking up, I saw something black among the boughs of a tall oak. I took it for a bear, and seized my rifle, but it addressed me in a human voice, most hoarse and grating, saying, If I did not break off the twigs up here, what should we do to-night for fuel to roast you with, Sir Simpleton? And he gnashed his teeth and rattled the boughs, so as to startle my horse, which ran away with me before I could make out what kind of a devil it was. You should not mention his name, said the fisherman, crossing himself. His wife silently did the same, while Undine turned her beaming eyes upon her lover and said, He is safe now. It is well they did not really roast him. Go on, pretty youth, he continued. My terrified horse had almost dashed me against many a trunk and branch. He was running down with fright and heat, and yet there was no stopping him. At length he rushed madly toward the brink of a stony precipice, but here, as it seemed to me, a tall white man threw himself across the plunging animal's path, and made him start back and stop. I then recovered the control of him, and found that, instead of a white man, my preserver was no other than a bright silvery brook, which gushed down from the hill beside me checking and crossing my horse in his course thanks dear brook cried undine clapping her hands but the old man shook his head and seemed lost in thought scarcely had i settled myself in the saddle and got firm hold of my reins again proceeded Holbrand, when an extraordinary little man sprang up beside me wizen and hideous beyond measure he was of a yellow-brown hue, and his nose almost as big as the whole of his body. He grinned at me in the most fulsome way with his wide mouth, bowing and scraping every moment. As I could not abide these antics, I thanked him abruptly, pulled my still trembling horse another way, and thought I would seek some other adventure, or perhaps go home for during my wild gallop the sun had passed his meridian and was now declining westward but the little imp sprang round like lightning and stood in front of my horse again make way cried i impatiently the animal is unruly and may run over you oh snarled the imp with a laugh more disgusting than before <laughs> first give me a piece of coin 
for having caught your horse so nicely. But for me, you and your pretty beast would be lying in the pit down yonder. Whew! Only have done with your grimaces, said I, and take your money along with you, though it is all a lie. Look there, it was that honest brook that saved me, not you, you pitiful wretch. So saying, I dropped a gold coin into his comical cap, which he held out toward me like a beggar. I trotted on, but he still followed, screaming, and with inconceivable rapidity whisked up to my side. I put my horse into a gallop. He kept pace with me, though with much difficulty, and twisted his body into various frightful and ridiculous attitudes, crying at each step as he held up the money, Bad coin! Bad gold! Bad gold! Bad coin! And this he shrieked in such a ghastly tone that you would have expected him to drop down dead after each cry. At last I stopped, much vexed, and asked, What do you want with your shrieks? Take another gold coin. Take two, if you will. Only let me alone. He began his odious smirking again and snarled. It's not gold. It's not gold that I want, young gentleman. I have rather more of that than I can use. You shall see. All at once the surface of the ground became transparent. It looked like a smooth globe of green glass, and within it I saw a crowd of goblins at play with silver and gold. Tumbling about, head over heels, they pelted each other in sport, making a toy of the precious metals and powdering their faces with gold dust. My ugly companion stood half above, half below the surface. He made the others reach up to him quantities of gold, and showed it to me laughing, and then flung it into the fathomless depths beneath. He displayed the piece of gold I had given him to the goblins below, who held their sides with laughing, and hissed at me in scorn. At length all their bony fingers pointed at me together, and louder and louder, closer and closer, wilder and wilder grew the turmoil, as it rose toward me, till not my horse only, but I myself was terrified. I put spurs into him, and cannot tell how long I may have scoured the forest this time. When at last I halted, the shades of evening had closed in. Through the branches I saw a white footpath gleaming, and hoped it must be a road out of the forest to the town. I resolved to work my way thither, but lo, an indistinct dead-white face with ever-changing features peeped at me through the leaves. I tried to avoid it, but wherever I went, there it was. Provoked, I attempted to push my horse against it. Then it splashed us both over with white foam, and we turned away, blinded for the moment. So it drove us, step by step, further and further from the footpath, and indeed never letting us go on undisturbed but in one direction. While we kept to this, it was close upon our heels, but did not thwart us. Having looked round once or twice, I observed that the white foaming head was placed on a gigantic body, equally white. I sometimes doubted my first impression, and thought it merely a waterfall, but I never could satisfy myself that it was so. Wearily did my horse and I perceive this active white pursuer, who often nodded at us, as if saying, That's right, that's right. And it ended by our issuing from the wood here, where I rejoiced to see your lawn, the lake, and this cottage, and where the long white man vanished. Thank heaven he is gone, said the old man, and then proceeded to consider how his guest could best return to his friends in the city. Upon this, Undine was heard to laugh in a whisper. Holdbrand observed it, and said, I thought you had wished me to stay, and now you seem pleased when we talk of my going. Because, replied Undine, 
you cannot get away. Only try to cross the swollen brook in a boat, on horseback, or on foot. Or rather, do not try, for you would be dashed to pieces by the branches and stones that it hurls along. And as to the lake, I know how that is. Father never ventures across it in his boat. Huldebrand laughed and got up to see whether she had spoken true. The old man went with him, and the maiden tripped along playfully by their side. They found she had told them no worse than the truth, and the knight resigned himself to staying in the island, as it might now be called, till the floods had subsided. As they returned homeward, he whispered in his pretty companion's ear, "'Well, my little Undine, are you angry at my staying?' ah said she sullenly never mind if i had not bitten you who knows what might have come out in your story of bertalda end of chapter four part four chapter four part five of famous stories every child should know this is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Reading by Matt Perard. Famous Stories Every Child Should Know. Edited by Hamilton Wright Maybe. Chapter 4, Part 5. Undine. By Friedrich Baron de la Motte Folk. Of the Life Which the Knight Led on the Island. Has it ever befallen thee, gentle reader, after many ups and downs in this troublesome world, to alight upon a spot where thou foundest rest, where the love which is born with us for fireside comfort and domestic peace revived in thee, where thou couldst fancy thy early home with the blossoms of childhood, its pure, heartfelt affection, and the holy influence breathed from thy father's graves to be restored to thee and that it must indeed be good for thee to be here and to build tabernacles the charm may have been broken the dream dispelled but that has nothing to do with our present picture nor wilt thou care to dwell on such bitter moments but recall to mind that period of unspeakable peace that foretaste of angelic rest which was granted thee, and thou wilt partly conceived what the knight Huldbrand felt while he lived on the promontory. Often, with secret satisfaction, did he mark the forest stream, rolling by more wildly every day. Its bed became wider and wider, and he felt the period of his seclusion from the world must be still prolonged. Having found an old crossbow in a corner of the cottage, and mended it, he spent part of his days roving about, waylaying the birds that flew by, and bringing whatever he killed to the kitchen as rare game. When he came back laden with spoil, Undine would often scold him for taking the life of the dear little joyous creatures, soaring in the blue depths of heaven. She would even weep bitterly over the dead birds. But if he came home empty-handed, she found fault with his awkwardness and laziness, which obliged them to be content with fish and crabs for dinner. Either way, he took delight in her pretty fits of anger, the more so as she rarely failed to make up for them by the fondest caresses afterwards. The old folks, having been in the young people's confidence from the first, unconsciously looked upon them as a betrothed or even married pair, shut out from the world with them in this retreat and bestowed upon them for comforts in their own age and this very seclusion helped to make the young knight feel as if he were already undine's bridegroom it seemed to him that the whole world was contained within the surrounding waters or at any rate that he could never more cross that charmed boundary and rejoin other human beings and if at times the neighing of his steed reminded him of former feats of chivalry and seemed to ask for more, if his coat of arms embroidered on the saddle and trappings caught his eye, or if 
his good sword fell from the nail on which he had hung it and slipped out of its scabbard, he would silence the misgivings that arose by thinking. Undine is not a fisherman's daughter, but most likely sprung from some highly noble family in distant lands. The only thing that ever ruffled him was to hear the old woman scolding Undine. The wayward girl only laughed at her, but to him it seemed as if his own honor were touched. And yet he could not blame the good wife, for Undine mostly deserved ten times worse than she got. Therefore he still felt kindly toward the old dame, and these little rubs scarcely disturbed the even current of their lives. At length, however, a grievance did arise. The knight and the fisherman were in the habit of sitting cheerfully over a flask of wine, both at noon and also at eventide, while the wind whistled around, as it generally did at night. But they had now exhausted the whole stock which the fisherman had, long since, brought from the town with him, and they both missed it sadly. Undine laughed at them all day for it, but they could not join in her mirth as heartily as usual. Toward evening she left the cottage, saying she could no longer bear such long, dismal faces. As the twilight looked stormy, and the waters were beginning to moan and heave, the knight and the old man ran out anxiously to fetch her back, remembering the agony of that night when Huldebrand first came to the cottage. But they were met by Ondine, clapping her hands merrily, what will you give if I get you some wine? But indeed I want no reward for it, she added. I shall be satisfied if you will but look brighter and find more to say than you have done all these tedious mornings. Come along, the floods have washed a barrel ashore, and I will engage to sleep a whole week through, if it is not a barrel of wine. The men both followed her to a shady creek, and there found a barrel which did look as if it contained the generous liquor which they longed for. They rolled it toward the hut as fast as they could, for a heavy storm seemed stalking across the sky, and there was light enough left to show them the waves of the lake tossing up their foaming heads, as if looking out for the rain which would soon pour down upon them. Undine lent a hand in the work, and presently, when the shower threatened to break instantly over their heads, she spoke to the big clouds in playful defiance. You, you there, mind you do not give us a drenching. We are some way from home yet. The old man admonished her that this was sinful presumption, but she laughed slightly to herself, and no harm came of it. Beyond their hopes, they all three reached the comfortable fireside with their prize, unhurt, and it was not till they had opened the barrel and found it to contain excellent wine that the rain broke from the heavy clouds in torrents, and they heard the storm roaring among the trees and over the lakes heaving billows. A few bottles were soon filled from the great barrel, enough to last them several days, and they sat sipping and chatting over the bright fire secure from the raging tempest. But the old man's heart presently smote him. Dear me, said he, here are we making merry over the blessing of Providence, while the owner of it has perhaps been carried away by the flood and lost his life. No, that he has not, said Undine, smiling, and she filled the knight's glass again. He replied, I give you my word, good father, that if I knew how to find and save him, no danger should deter me. I would not shrink from setting out in this darkness. This much I promise you. If ever I set foot in an inhabited country again, I will make inquiry after him or his heirs and restore to them twice or three times the value of the wine. This pleased the old man. He gave an approving nod to the knight and drained his glass with a better conscience and a lighter heart. But Undine said to Huldbrand, Do as you like with your money. You may make what compensation you please, but as to setting out and wandering after him, that was hastily said. I should cry my heart out if we chanced to lose you. And had not you rather stay with me and with the good wine? 
Why, yes, said Huldbrand, laughing. Well, then, rejoined Undine, it was a foolish thing you talked of doing. Charity begins at home, you know. The old woman turned away, shaking her head and sighing. Her husband forgot his usual indulgence for the pretty lassie, and reproved her sharply. One would think, said he, you had been reared by Turks and heathens. God forgive you and us, you perverse child. Aye, but it is my way of thinking, pursued Undine. Whoever has reared me, so what is the use of your talking? Peace, cried the fisherman, and she, who, with all her wildness, was sometimes cowed in a moment, clung trembling to Huldebrand and whispered, And are you angry with me, dear friend? The knight pressed her soft hand and stroked down her ringlets. Not a word could he say. His distress at the old man's harshness toward Undine had sealed his lips, and so each couple remained sitting opposite the other in moody silence and constraint. End of chapter 4, part 5「IV, Part Six of Famous Stories Every Child Should Know. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Matt Perard. Famous Stories Every Child Should Know. Edited by Hamilton Wright Maybe. Chapter Four, Part Six. Undine by Friedrich, Baron de la Motte Funk, of a bridal. A gentle tap at the door broke the silence and made them all start. It sometimes happens that a mere trifle, coming quite unexpectedly, strikes the senses with terror. They looked at each other, hesitating. The tap was repeated, accompanied by a deep groan, and the knight grasped his sword. But the old man muttered, If it is what I fear, it is not a sword that will help us. Undine, however, stepped forward to the door, and said boldly and sharply, If you are after any mischief, you spirits of earth, Colborne shall teach you manners. The terror of the others increased at these strange words. They looked at the maiden with awe, and Holbrand was just mustering courage to ask her a question, when a voice answered her, from without. I am no spirit of earth. Call me, if you will, a spirit pent in mortal clay. If you fear God and will be charitable, you dwellers in the cottage, open the door to me. Undine opened it before he had done speaking, and held out a lamp into the stormy night, so as to show them the figure of an aged priest, who started back as the radiant beauty of Undine flashed upon his sight. Well might he suspect magic and witchery when so bright a vision shone out of a mean-looking cottage. He accordingly began a canticle. All good spirits give praise to the Lord. I am no ghost, said Undine, smiling. Am I so frightful to behold? And you may see that a pious saying has no terrors for me. I worship God, too, and praise him after my own fashion. He has not created us all alike. Come in, venerable father. You will find worthy folks here. The holy man walked in, bowing and casting his eyes around, and looking most mild and venerable. Every fold of his dark garment was dripping with water, and so were his long white beard and hoary locks. The fisherman and the knight led him to a bedroom and gave him change of clothing, while the women dried his wet garments by the hearth fire. The aged stranger thanked them with all humility and gentleness, but would by no means accept of the knight's splendid mantle, which he offered him. He chose himself an old grey wrapper of the fisherman's instead. So they returned to the kitchen. The dame up gave her own armchair to the priest, and had no peace till he sat himself down on it. For, said she, 
you are old and weary and a priest besides undine pushed her little footstool toward the good man's feet and altogether behaved to him quite properly and gracefully huldbrand took notice of this in a playful whisper but she answered very gravely because he is a servant of the maker of us all that is too serious for a jest meantime the two men set meat and wine before their guest and when he had recruited his strength a little he began his story saying that the day before he had left his monastery which was a good way off beyond the lake intending to visit the bishop at his palace and report to him the distress which these almost supernatural floods had caused the monks and their poor tenantry after going round a long way to avoid these floods he had been obliged toward evening to cross an arm of the overflowing lake with the help of two honest sailors but added he no sooner had our little vessel touched the waves than we were wrapped in the tremendous storm which is still raging over our heads now it looked as if the waters had only awaited our coming to give a loose to their fury the oars were soon dashed from the seamen's hands and we saw their broken fragments carried further and further from us by the waves we floated on the wave tops helpless driven by the furious tempest toward your shores which we saw in the distance whenever the clouds parted for a moment the boat was tossed about still more wildly and giddily and whether it upset or i fell out i cannot tell i floated on till a wave landed me at the foot of a tree in this your island ay island indeed said the fisherman it was a promontory but a short time ago but since the stream and our lake are gone raving mad together everything about us is new and strange the priest continued as i crept along the waterside in the dark with a wild uproar around me something caught my eye and presently i descried a beaten pathway which was soon lost in the shades i spied the light in your cottage and ventured to come hither and i cannot sufficiently thank my heavenly father who has not only delivered me from the waters but guided me to such kind souls i feel this blessing the more as it is very likely i may never see any faces but yours again how so asked the fisherman can you guess how long this fury of the elements may last replied the priest and i am an old man my stream of life may perhaps lose itself in the earth before these floods subside and besides it may be the foaming waters will divide you from the forest more and more till you are unable to get across in your fishing boat and the people of the mainland full of their own concerns would quite forget you in your retreat shuddering and crossing herself the fisherman's wife exclaimed god forbid but the old man smiled at her and said what creatures we are that would make no difference to you at least my dear wife how many years is it since you have set foot within the forest and have you seen any face but on dean's and mine lately indeed we have had the good knight and priest besides but they would stay with us so that if we are forgotten in this island you will be the gainer so i see said the dame yet somehow it is cheerless to feel ourselves quite cut off from the rest of the world however seldom we had seen it before then you will stay with us murmured undine in a sweet voice and she pressed closer to huldebrand's side but he was lost in deep thought since the priest had last spoken the land beyond the wild stream had seemed to his fancy more dark and distant than ever while the flowery island he had lived in and his bride the fairest flower in the picture bloomed and smiled more and more freshly in his imagination here was the priest at hand to unite them and to complete his resolution 
the old dame just then darted a reproving look at undine for clinging to her lover's side in the holy man's presence an angry lecture seemed on the point of beginning he turned toward the priest and these words burst from him you see before you a betrothed pair reverend sir if this damsel and the kind old people will consent you shall unite us this very evening the old folks were much surprised such a thought had often crossed their minds but they had never till this moment heard it uttered and it now fell upon their ears like an unexpected thing undine had suddenly become quite grave and sat musing deeply while the priest inquired into various circumstances and asked the old couple's consent to the deed after some deliberation they gave it the dame went away to prepare the young people's bridal chamber and to fetch from her stores two consecrated tapers for the wedding ceremony meanwhile the knight was pulling two rings off his gold chain for himself and his bride to exchange but this roused undine from her reverie and she said stay my parents did not send me into the world quite penniless they looked forward long ago to this occasion and provided for it she quickly withdrew and returned bringing two costly rings one of which she gave to her betrothed and kept the other herself this astonished the old fisherman and still more his wife who came in soon after for they neither of them had ever seen these jewels about the child my parents said undine had these rings sewed into the gay dress which i wore when first i came to you they charged me to let no one know of them till my wedding day came therefore i took them secretly out of the dress and have kept them hidden till this evening here the priest put a stop to the conversation by lighting the holy tapers placing them on the table and calling the young pair to him with few and solemn words he joined their hands the aged couple gave their blessing while the bride leaned upon her husband pensive and trembling when it was over the priest said you are stranger people after all what did you mean by saying you were the only inhabitants of this island during the whole ceremony there was a fine-looking tall man in a white cloak standing just outside the window opposite me he must be near the door still if you like to invite him in heaven forbid said the dame shuddering the old man shook his head without speaking and huldbrand rushed to the window he could fancy he saw a streak of white but it was soon lost in darkness so he assured the priest he must have been mistaken and they all sat down comfortably round the fire end of chapter four part six chapter four part seven of famous stories every child should know this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit LibriVox.org. Famous Stories Every Child Should Know, edited by Hamilton Wright Maybe. Chapter 4, Part 7, Undine, by Friedrich Baron de Lamotte Folk. Part 7, How the Rest of the Evening Passed Away. Undine had been perfectly quiet and well-behaved both before and during the marriage ceremony but now her wild spirits seemed the more uncontrollable from the restraint they had undergone and rose to an extravagant height she played all manner of childish tricks on her husband her foster parents and even the venerable priest and when the old woman began to check her one or two words from huldbrand who gravely called undine his wife reduced her to silence the knight himself, however, was far from being pleased at Undine's childishness, but no hint or sign would stop her. Whenever she perceived his disapproving looks, which she occasionally did, it subdued her for the moment. She would sit down by him, whisper something playfully in his ear, and so dispel the frown as it gathered on his brow. 
but the next instant some wild nonsense would dart into her head and set her off worse than ever at last the priest said to her in a kind but grave manner my dear young lady no one that beholds you can be severe upon you it is true but remember it is your duty to keep watch over your soul that it may be ever in harmony with that of your wedded husband soul cried undine laughing that sounds very fine but for most people may be very edifying and moral advice but if one has no soul at all pray how is one to keep watch over it and that is my case the priest was deeply hurt and turned away his face in mingled sorrow and anger but she came up to him beseechingly and said nay hear me before you are angry for it grieves me to see you displeased and you would not distress any creature who has not done you no harm only have patience with me and i will tell you all from the beginning they saw she was preparing to give them a regular history but she stopped short appearing thrilled by some secret recollection and burst into a flood of gentle tears they were quite at a loss what to think of her and gazed upon her distressed from various causes at length drying her eyes she looked at the priest earnestly and said there must be much to love in a soul but much that is awful too for god's sake holy father tell me were it not better to be still without one she waited breathlessly for an answer restraining her tears her hearers had all risen from their seats and now stepped back from her shuddering she seemed to have no eyes but for the saintly man her countenance assumed an expression of anxiety and awe which yet more alarmed the others heavy must be the burden of a soul added she as no one answered her heavy indeed for the mere approach of mine overshadows me with anxious melancholy and ah how light-hearted how joyous i used to be a fresh burst of weeping overcame her and she covered her face with her veil the priest then approached her with much gravity and adjured her by the holiest names to confess the truth if any evil lurked in her unknown to them but she fell on her knees before him repeated after him all his words of piety gave praise to god and declared she was in charity with all the world the priest turned to the young knight sir bridegroom said he i leave you alone with her whom i have made your wife as far as i can discover there is no evil although much that is mysterious in her i exhort you to be sober loving and faithful and so he went out and the old people followed crossing themselves undine was still on her knees she uncovered her face and looked timidly at huldbrand saying ah thou wilt surely cast me off now and yet i have done nothing wrong poor poor child that i am and this she said with so touching and gentle an expression that her husband forgot all the gloom and mystery that had chilled his heart he hastened toward her and raised her in his arms she smiled through her tears it was like the glow of dawn shining upon a clear fountain thou canst not forsake me whispered she in accents of the firmest reliance and she stroked his cheeks with her soft little hands he tried to shake off the gloomy thoughts which still lurked in a corner of his mind suggesting to him that he had married a fairy or some shadowy being from the world of spirits one question however he could not help asking my dear little undine just tell me one thing what was that you said about spirits of earth and colborne when the priest knocked at the door all nonsense said undine laughing with her usual gaiety first i frightened you with it and then you frightened me and that is the end of the story and of our wedding day end of chapter four part seven Chapter Four, Part Eight of Famous Stories Every Child Should Know. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. 
Famous Stories Every Child Should Know, edited by Hamilton Wright Maybe. Chapter 4, Part 8. Undine by Friedrich Baron de la Motte Folk. Part 8. The Day After the Marriage. A bright morning light wakened the young people, and Huldbrand lay musing silently. As often as he had dropped asleep, he had been scared by horrible dreams of spectres who suddenly took the form of fair women, or of fair women who were transformed into dragons. And when he started up from these grim visions, and saw the pale cold moonlight streaming in at the window, he would turn an anxious look toward Undine. She lay slumbering in undisturbed beauty and peace. Then he would compose himself to sleep again, soon again to wake in terror. When he looked back upon all this in broad daylight, he was angry with himself for having let a suspicion, a shade of distrust, of his beautiful wife enter his mind. He frankly confessed to her this injustice. She answered him only by pressing his hand and sighing from the bottom of her heart. But a look such as her eyes had never before given of the deepest and most confiding tenderness left him no doubt that she forgave him. So he arose cheerfully and joined the family in the sitting room. The three others were gathered round the hearth looking uneasy and neither of them having ventured to speak his thoughts yet. The priest seemed to be secretly praying for deliverance from evil. But when the young husband appeared, beaming with happiness, the careworn faces brightened up. Nay, the fisherman ventured upon a few courteous jokes with the knight, which won a smile even from the good housewife. Meanwhile, Undine had dressed herself and now came in. They could not help rising to meet her and stood still astonished. The young creature was the same, yet so different. The priest was the first to address her with an air of paternal kindness and when he raised his hands in benediction the fair woman sank on her knees trembling with pious awe in a few meek and humble words she begged him to forgive the folly of the day before and besought him with great emotion to pray for the salvation of her soul then rising she kissed her foster parents and thanking them for all their kindness she said Oh, now I feel from the bottom of my heart how much you have done for me, how deeply grateful I ought to be, dear, dear people. She seemed as if she could not caress them enough, but soon observing the dame glance toward the breakfast, she went toward the hearth, busied herself arranging and preparing the meal, and would not suffer the good woman to take the least trouble herself. And so she went on all day, at once a young matron and a bashful, tender, delicate bride. The three who knew her best were every moment expecting this mood to change and give place to one of her crazy fits, but they watched in vain. There was still the same angelic mildness and sweetness. The priest could not keep his eyes away from her, and he said more than once to the bridegroom, Sir, it was a great treasure which heaven bestowed upon you yesterday by my poor ministration. Cherish her worthily, and she will be to you a blessing in time and eternity. Toward evening, Undine clasped the knight's arm with modest tenderness and gently led him out before the door where the rays of the setting sun were lighting up the fresh grass and the tall taper stems of trees. The young wife's face wore a melting expression of love and sadness, and her lips quivered with some anxious momentous secret, which as yet betrayed itself only by scarce audible sighs. She silently led her companion onward. If he spoke, she replied by a look which gave him no direct answer, but revealed a whole heaven of love and timid submission. So they reached the banks of the stream which had overflowed, and the knight started on, finding the wild torrent changed into a gentle, rippling brook, without a trace of its form of violence left. By tomorrow it will have dried up completely, said the bride in a faltering voice and thou mayest be gone whither thou wilt. Not without thee, my Undine, said the knight playfully. Consider, if I had a mind to forsake thee, the church, the emperor, and his ministers might step in and bring thy truant home. No, no, you are free. It shall be as you please, murmured Undine, half tears, half smiles. But I think thou will not cast me away. Is not my heart bound up in thine? Carry me over to that little island opposite. There I will know my fate. 
I could indeed easily step through the little waves, but I love to rest in thine arms, and thou mayest cast me off. This may be the last time. Huldbrand, full of anxious emotion, knew not how to answer. He took her up in his arms and carried her over, now recollecting that from this very island he had borne her home to the fisherman on the night of his arrival. When there he placed his fair burden on the turf and was going to sit down beside her, but she said no. Sit there opposite me. I will read my doom in your eyes before your lips have spoken it. Now listen, and I will tell you all. And she began. You must know, my own love, that in each element exists a race of beings, whose form scarcely differs from yours, but who very seldom appear to mortal sight. In the flames the wondrous salamanders glitter and disport themselves, in the depths of earth dwell the dry, spiteful race of gnomes. The forests are peopled by wood nymphs, who are also spirits of air, and the seas, the rivers, and brooks contain the numberless tribes of water sprites. Their echoing halls of crystal, where the light of heaven pours in, with its sun and stars, are glorious to dwell in. The gardens contain beautiful coral plants with blue and red fruits. They wander over bright sea sands and gay-colored shells among the hidden treasures of the old world, too precious to be bestowed on these latter days, and long since covered by the silver mantle of the deep. Many a noble monument still gleams there below, bedewed by the tears of ocean, who garlands it with flowery seaweeds and wreaths of shells. Those that dwell there below are noble and lovely to behold, far more so than mankind. Many a fisherman has had a passing glimpse of some fair water nymph, rising out of the sea with her song. He would then spread the report of her apparition, and these wonderful beings came to be called Undines. And you now see before you, my love, an Undine. The knight tried to persuade himself that his fair wife was in one of her wild moods and had invented this strange tale in sport. But though he said this to himself, he could not for a moment believe it. A mysterious feeling thrilled him, and unable to utter a word, he kept his eyes riveted on the beautiful speaker. She shook her head sadly, heaved a deep sigh, and went on. We might be happier than our human fellow-creatures, for we call you fellow-creatures, as our forms are alike, but for one great evil. We and the other children of the elements go down to the dust, body and spirit. Not a trace of us remains, and when the time comes for you to rise again to a glorified existence, we shall have perished with our native sands, flames, winds, and waves. For we have no souls. The elements move us, obey us while we live, close over us when we die, and we light spirits live as free from care as the nightingale, the goldfish, and all such bright children of nature. But no creature rests content in their appointed place. My father, who is a mighty prince in the Mediterranean Sea, determined that his only child should be endowed with a soul, even at the cost of much suffering, which is ever the lot of souls. But a soul can be infused into one of our race, only by being united in the closest bands of love to one of yours. And now I have obtained a soul. To thee I owe it, O best beloved, and for that gift I shall ever bless thee, unless thou dost devote my whole futurity to misery. For what is to become of me should thou recoil from me and cast me off? Yet I would not detain thee by deceit, and if I am to leave thee, say so now, Go back to the land alone. I will plunge into this brook. It is my uncle who leads a wonderful sequestered life in this forest, away from all his friends. But he is powerful, and allied to many great rivers. And as he brought me here to the fisherman, a gay and laughing child, so he is ready to take me back to my parents, a loving, suffering, forsaken woman. She would have gone on. But Huldbrand, full of compassion and love, caught her in his arms and carried her back. There, with tears and kisses, he swore never to forsake his beloved wife, and said he felt more blessed than the Greek sculptor Pygmalion, 
whose beautiful statue dame venus transformed into a living woman hanging on his arm in peaceful reliance undine returned and she felt from her inmost heart how little cause she had to regret the crystal palaces of her father end of chapter four part eight Chapter 4, Part 9 of Famous Stories Every Child Should Know. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Famous Stories Every Child Should Know, edited by Hamilton Wright Maybe. Chapter 4, Part 9, Undine, by Friedrich Baron de Lamont Folk. Part Nine: How the Knight and His Young Bride Departed. When Huldbrand awoke from sleep the next morning, he missed his fair companion, and again he was tormented with a doubt whether his marriage and the lovely Undine might not be all a fairy dream. But she soon reappeared, came up to him, and said, "I have been out early to see if my uncle had kept his word." He has recalled all the straying waters into his quiet bed, and now takes his lonely and pensive course through the forest as he used to do. His friends in the lake and the air are gone to rest also. All things have returned to their usual calmness, and you may set out homeward on dry land as soon as you please. Huldbrand felt as if dreaming still, so little could he understand his wife's wonderful relations. But he took no notice of this, and his sweet Undine's gentle attentions soon charmed his every uneasy thought away. A little while after, as they stood at the door together, looking over the fair scene with its boundary of clear waters, his heart yearned so toward this cradle of his love that he said, But why should we go away so soon? We shall never spend happier days in yonder world than we have passed in this peaceful nook. Let us at least see two or three more suns go down here. As my lord wishes, answered Undine, with cheerful submission. But you see, the old people will be grieved at parting with me, whenever it is, and if we give them time to become acquainted with my soul, and with its new powers of loving and honoring them, I fear that when I go, their aged hearts will break under the load of sorrow. As yet they take my gentle mood for a passing whim, such as they saw me liable to formerly, like a calm on the lake when the winds are lulled, and they will soon begin to love some favorite tree or flower in my place. They must not learn to know this newly obtained affectionate heart, in the first overflowings of its tenderness, just at the moment when they are to lose me for this world, and how could I disguise it from them if we remain together longer? Huldbrand agreed with her. He went to the old couple, and finding them ready to consent, he resolved upon setting out that very hour. The priest offered to accompany them. After a hasty farewell, the pretty bride was placed on the horse by her husband, and they crossed the stream's dry bed quickly, and entered the forest. Undine shed silent but bitter tears, while the old folks wailed after her aloud. It seemed as if some foreboding were crossing their minds of how great their loss would prove. The three travelers reached the deepest shades of the forest without breaking silence. It was a fair sight to behold as they passed through the leafy bowers. The graceful woman sitting on her noble steed, guarded on one side by the venerable priest in the white habit of his order, on the other by the youthful knight with his gorgeous attire and glittering sword. Old Brand had no eyes but for his precious wife, Undine, who had dried her duteous tears, no thought but for him, and they soon fell into a noiseless interchange of glances and signs, which at length were interrupted by the sound of a low murmur proceeding from the priest and a fourth fellow traveller who had joined them unobserved. He wore a white robe very like the priest's dress, except that the hood almost covered his face and the rest of it floated round him in such large folds that he was perpetually obliged to gather up, throw it over his arm, or otherwise arrange it. Yet it did not seem to impede him at all in walking. When the young people saw him, 
he was saying, And so, my worthy father, I have dwelt in the forest for many a year, yet I am not what you commonly call a hermit. For, as I told you, I know nothing of penance, nor do I think it would do me much good. What makes me so fond of the woods is that I have a very particular fancy for winding through the dark shades and forest walks, with my loose white clothes floating about me. Now and then a pretty sunbeam will glance over me as I go. You seem to be a very curious person, replied the priest, and I should so like to know more about you. And pray, who are you to carry on the acquaintance, said the stranger? They call me Father Heilman, answered the priest, and I belong to St. Mary's Monastery beyond the lake. Aye, aye, rejoined the other. My name is Colborne, and if I stood upon ceremony, I might well call myself Lord of Colborne, or Baron Freeherr Colborne. For free I am, as the bird of the air, or a trifle more free. For instance, I must now have a word with the young woman there. And before they could look around, he was on the other side of the priest, close to Undine, stretching up his tall figure to whisper in her ear. But she turned hastily away, saying, I have nothing more to do with you now. Heyday, said the stranger, laughing. What a prodigiously grand marriage yours must be, if you are to cast off your relations in this way. Have you forgotten Uncle Colborne, who brought you all the way here on his back so kindly? But I entreat you, said Undine, never come to me again. I am afraid of you now, and will not my husband become afraid of me, if he finds I have so strange a family? My little niece, said Colborne, please to remember that I am protecting you all this time. The foul spirits of earth might play you troublesome tricks if I did not. So you had better let me go on with you, and no more words. The old priest there has a better memory than yours, for he would have it he knew my face very well, and that I must have been with him in the boat when he fell into the water, and he may well say so, seeing that the wave which washed over him was none but myself, and I landed him safe on the shore in time for your wedding. Undine and the knight looked at Father Heilman, but he seemed to be plodding on in a waking dream and not listening to what was said. Undine said to Colborne, There, I can see the end of the wood. We want your help no longer, and there is nothing to disturb us but you. So in love and kindness I entreat you, be gone, and let us go in peace. This seemed to make Colborne angry. He twisted his face hideously and hissed at Undine, who cried aloud for help. Like lightning the knight passed round her horse, and aimed a blow at Colborne's head with his sword. But instead of the head, he struck into a waterfall, which gushed down a high cliff near them, and now showered them all with a splash that sounded like laughter, and wetted them to the bone. The priest, seeming to wake up, said, Well, I was expecting this, because that brook gushed down the rock so close to us. At first I could not shake off the idea that it was a man and was speaking to me. The waterfall whispered distinctly in Holbrand's ear. Rash youth, dashing youth, I chide thee not, I shame thee not. Still shield thy precious wife, safe and sure, rash young soldier, dashing knight. A little further on they emerged into the open plains. The city lay glittering before them, and the evening sun that gilded her towers lent its grateful warmth to dry their soaked garments. End of chapter 4, part 9chapter 4 part 10 of famous stories every child should know this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox.org famous stories every child should know edited by hamilton wright maybe chapter 4 part 10 undine by friedrich Baron de la Motte Folk, Part Ten, of their way of life in the town. The sudden disappearance of the young knight Huldbrand of Ringstetten had made a great stir in the city, and distressed the inhabitants with whom his gallantry in the lists and the dance, and his gentle courteous manners, had made him very popular. 
His retainers would not leave the place without their master, yet none had the courage to seek him in the haunted forest. They therefore remained in their hostelry, idly hoping as men are so apt to do, and keeping alive the remembrance of their lost lord by lamentations. But soon after, when the tempest raged and the rivers overflowed, few doubted that the handsome stranger must have perished. Bertalda, among others, mourned him for lost, and was ready to curse herself for having urged him to the fatal ride through the forest. Her ducal forest parents had arrived to take her away, but she prevailed upon them to wait a little, in hope that a true report of Holdbrand's death or safety might reach them. She tried to persuade some of the young knights who contended for her favor to venture into the forest and seek the noble adventurer, but she would not offer her hand as the reward because she still hoped to bestow it some day on the wanderer himself and to obtain a glove, a scarf, or some such token from her. None of them cared to expose his life to bring back so dangerous a rival. Now when Huldbrand unexpectedly reappeared, it spread joy among his servants, and all the people generally, except Bertalda, for while the others were pleased at his bringing with him such a beautiful wife, and Father Heilman to bear witness to their marriage, it could not but grieve her first because the young knight had really won her heart, and next because she had betrayed her feelings by so openly lamenting his absence far more than was now becoming. However, she behaved like a prudent woman, and suited her conduct to the circumstances by living in the most cordial intimacy with Undine, who passed in the town for a princess released by Huldbrandt from the power of some wicked enchanter of the forest. If she or her husband were questioned about it, they gave evasive answers. Father Heilman's lips were sealed on all such idle topics, besides which he had left them soon after they arrived and returned to his cloister. So the citizens were left to their own wondering conjectures, and even Bertolda came no nearer the truth than others. Meanwhile, Undine grew daily more fond of this winning damsel. We must have known each other before, she would often say, or else some secret attraction draws us toward each other, for without some cause, some strange, mysterious cause, I am sure nobody would love another as I have loved you from the moment we met. Bertalda, on her part, could not deny that she felt strongly inclined to like Undine, notwithstanding the grounds of complaint she thought she had against this happy rival. The affection being mutual, the one persuaded her parents, the other her wedded lord, to defer the day of departure repeatedly. They even went so far as to propose that Bertalda should accompany Undine to the castle of Ringstetten, near the source of the Danube. They were talking of this one fine evening, as they sauntered by starlight round the market-place, which was surrounded by high trees. The young couple had invited Bertalda to join their evening stroll, and they now paced backward and forward in pleasant talk, with the dark blue sky over their heads and a beautiful fountain before them in the centre, which, as it bubbled and sprang up into fanciful shapes, often caught their attention and interrupted the conversation. All around them was serene and pleasant. Through the foliage gleamed the light of many a lamp from the surrounding houses, and the ear was soothed by the hum of children at play and of sauntering groups like themselves, they enjoyed at once the pleasure of solitude and the social happiness of being near the cheerful haunts of men. Every little difficulty that had occurred to their favorite plan seemed to vanish upon nearer examination, and the three friends could not imagine that Bertalda's consent to the journey need be delayed a moment. But as she was on the point of naming a day for joining them and setting out, a very tall man came forward from the middle of the place, bowed to them respectfully, and began whispering in Undine's ear. She, though apparently displeased with the interruption and with the speaker, stepped aside with him, and they began a low discourse together in what sounded like a foreign language. Holdbrand thought he knew the strange man's face, and fixed his attention upon him so earnestly 
that he neither heard nor answered the astonished Bertalda's questions. All at once, Undine clapped her hands joyfully and turned her back, laughing upon the stranger. He shook his head and walked off in an angry, hurried manner and stepped into the fountain. This confirmed Huldbrand in his guess, while Bertalda inquired, My dear Undine, what business had that man of the fountain with you? Her friend smiled archly and replied, On your birthday, the day after tomorrow, I will tell you, my sweet girl, and she would say no more. She only pressed Bertalda to come and dine with them on that day and bring her foster parents, after which they separated. Colborne said Holbrand to his wife with a suppressed shudder as they walked home through the dark streets. Yes, it was he, replied Undine, and he tried to put all sorts of nonsense into my head. However, without intending it, he delighted me by one piece of news. If you wish to hear it now, my kind lord, you have but to say so, and I will tell you every word. But if you would like to give your Undine a very great delight, you will wait two days, and then have your share in the surprise. The knight readily granted her what she had asked so meekly and gracefully, and as she dropped asleep she murmured, How it will delight her! How little she expects such a message from the mysterious man! Dear, dear Bertolda. End of chapter 4, part 10《Chapter Four, Part Eleven of Famous Stories Every Child Should Know. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. — Famous Stories Every Child Should Know, edited by Hamilton Wright Maybe. Chapter Four, Part Eleven. Undine by Friedrich Baron de Lamotte Folk. Part Eleven, Bertalda's Birthday. The guests were now assembled at table. Bertalda sat at the top, adorned with flowers like the goddess of spring, and flashing with jewels, the gifts of many friends and relations. Undine and Huldbrand were on either side of her. When the sumptuous meal was ended and the dessert served, the doors were opened, according to the good old German custom, to let the common people look in and have their share in the gaiety of the rich. The attendants offered wine and cake to the assembled crowd. Huldbrand and Bertalda were eagerly watching for the promised disclosure, and both kept their eyes fixed upon Undine. But she was still silent, her cheeks dimpled occasionally with a bright conscious smile. Those that knew what she was about to do could perceive that her interesting secret was ready to burst from her lips, but that she was playfully determined to keep it in, as children sometimes will, save their daintiest morsels for the last. Her silent glee communicated itself to the other two, who watched impatiently for the happy news that was about to gladden their hearts. Some of the company now asked Undine for a song. She seemed to be prepared with one, and sent for her lute to which she sang as follows the sun gilds the wave the flowers are sweet and the ocean doth lave the grass at our feet what lies on the earth so blooming and gay doth a blossom peep forth and greet the new day ah tis a fair child she sports with the flowers so gladsome and mild through the warm sunny hours o oh, sweet one who brought thee from far distant shore Old ocean, he caught thee, and many a league bore. Poor babe, all in vain, thou dost put forth thy hand, none clasp it again. Tis a bleak foreign land. The flowers bloom brightly, and soft breathes the air, but all pass thee lightly. Thy mother is far, thy life scarce begun, thy smiles fresh from heaven, thy best treasure is gone. To another tis given, a gallant charger treads the dell, his noble rider pities thee. He takes thee home, he tends thee well, and cares for thee right generously. Well thou becomest thy station high, and bloomest the fairest in the land, and yet, alas, the purest joy is left on thine own distant strand. Undine put down her lute, with a melancholy smile, and the eyes of the Duke and Duchess filled with tears. 
So it was when I found you, my poor innocent orphan, said the Duke with great emotion. As the fair singer said, your best treasure was gone, and we have been unable to supply its place. Now let us think of the poor parents, said Undine, and she struck the chords and sang. Mother roves from room to room, seeking rest she knows not how. The house is silent as the tomb, and who is there to bless her now? Silent house, O oh, words of sorrow, where is now her darling child? She who should have cheered the morrow, and the evening hours beguiled. The buds are swelling on the tree, the sun returns when night is o'er, but mother, ne'er comes joy to thee, thy child shall bless thine eyes no more. And when the evening breezes blow, and father seeks his own fireside, he smiles forgetful of his woe, but ah, his tears that smile shall hide. Father knows that in his home death-like stillness dwells for a, the voice of mirth no more shall come, and mother sighs the live-long day. Oh, Undine, for God's sake, where are my parents? cried Bertalda, weeping. Surely you know you have discovered it, most wonderful woman, else how could you have stirred my inmost heart as you have done? They are perhaps even now in the room, can it be? And her eyes glanced over the gay assembly, and fixed upon a reigning princess who sat next to the duke. But Undine bent forward to the door, her eyes overflowing with the happiest tears. Where are they, the poor anxious parents, said she. And the old fisherman and his wife came out from the crowd of bystanders. They turned an inquiring eye upon Undine, and then upon the handsome lady, whom they were to call daughter. There she is, faltered the delighted Undine, and the aged couple caught their long-lost child in their arms, thanking God and weeping aloud. Affrighted and enraged, Bertalda shrunk from their embrace. It was more than her proud spirit could bear to be thus degraded, at a moment, too, when she was fully expecting an increase of splendor, and fancy was showering pearls and diadems upon her head. She suspected that her rival had contrived this, on purpose, to mortify her before Huldbrand and all the world. She reviled both Undine and the old people. The hateful words, treacherous creature, and bribed wretches, burst from her lips. The old woman said, in a half-whisper, Dear me! She has grown up a wicked woman, and yet my heart tells me she is my own child. The fisherman had clasped his hands and was praying silently that this girl might not prove to be theirs indeed. Undine, pale as death, looked from Bertalda to the parents, from the parents to Bertalda, and could not recover the rude shock she had sustained at being plunged from all her happy dreams into a state of fear and misery such as she had never known before. "'Have you a soul? Have you indeed a soul, Bertalda?' she exclaimed once or twice, trying to recall her angry friend to reason from what she took for a fit of madness or a kind of nightmare. But Bertalda only stormed the louder. The repulsed parents wailed piteously, and the company began to dispute angrily and to side with one or the other when undine stepped forward and asked with so much earnest gentleness to be listened to in her husband's house that all was hushed in a moment she took the place which bertalda had left at the head of the table and as she stood there in modest dignity the eyes of all turned toward her and she said you all that cast such angry looks at each other and so cruelly spoil the joy of my poor feast alas I little knew what your foolish, angry passions were, and I think I never shall understand you. What I had hoped would do so much good has led to all this. But that is not my fault. It is your own doing, believe me. I have little more to say. But one thing you must hear. I have told no falsehood. Proofs I have none to give, beyond my word. But I will swear to the truth of it. I heard it from him who decoyed Bertalda from her parents into the water, and then laid her down in the meadow where the duke was to pass. She is a sorceress, cried Bertalda, a witch who has dealings with evil spirits. She has acknowledged it. I have not, said Undine, with a heaven of innocence and guilelessness in her eyes. Nor am I a witch. Only look at me. 
Then she lies, cried Bertalda, and she dares not assert that I was born of these mean people. My noble parents, I beseech you, take me out of this room and this town where they are leagued together to insult me. But the venerable duke stood still, and his lady said, We must first sift this matter to the bottom. Nothing shall make me leave the room till my doubts are satisfied. Then the old woman came up, made a deep obeisance to the duchess, and said, You give me courage to speak, my noble, worthy lady. I must tell you that if this ungodly young woman is my daughter, I shall know her by a violet mark between her shoulders and another on the left instep. If she would but come with me into another room, I will not uncover myself before that countrywoman, said Bertolda, proudly turning away. But before me you will, rejoined the Duchess gravely. You shall go with me into that room, young woman, and the good dame will accompany us. They withdrew together, leaving the party in silent suspense. In a few minutes they came back. Bertalda was deadly pale, and the Duchess said, Truth is truth, and I am bound to declare that our lady hostess has told us perfectly right. Bertalda is the fisherman's daughter. More than that, it concerns nobody to know. And the princely pair departed, taking with them their adopted child, and followed, upon a sign from the duke, by the fisherman and his wife. The rest of the assembly broke up, in silence or with secret murmurs, and Undine sank into Huldbrand's arms, weeping bitterly. End of chapter 4, part 11《Chapter Four, Part Twelve of Famous Stories Every Child Should Know. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. — Famous Stories Every Child Should Know, edited by Hamilton Wright Maybe. — Chapter Four, Part Twelve, Undine, by Friedrich Baron de Lamotte Folk. Part Twelve, How They Left the Imperial City There was certainly much to displease the Lord of Ringstetten in the events of this day, and yet he could not look back upon them without feeling proud of the guileless truth and the generosity of heart shown by his lovely wife. If indeed her soul was my gift, thought he, it is nevertheless much better than my own, and he devoted himself to the task of soothing her grief and determined he would take her away the next morning from a spot now so full of bitter recollections. They were mistaken, however, in thinking that she had lost in the eyes of the world by this adventure. So prepared were the minds of the people to find something mysterious in her, that her strange discovery of Bertalda's origin scarcely surprised them. While, on the other hand, everyone had heard of Bertalda's history, and of her passionate behavior, was moved with indignation. Of this the knight and Undine were not aware, nor would it have given them any comfort, for she was still as jealous of Bertalda's good name as of her own. Upon the whole they had no greater wish than to leave the town without delay. At daybreak next morning Undine's chariot was in readiness at the door, and the steeds of Holdbrand and of his squires stood around it, pawing the ground with impatience. As the knight led his fair bride to the door, a fishing girl accosted them. We want no fish, said Huldbrand. We are just going away. The girl began to sob bitterly, and then they recognized her as Bertalda. They immediately turned back into the house with her, and she said that the Duke and Duchess had been so incensed at her violence the day before as to withdraw their protection from her though not without giving her a handsome allowance. The fisherman, too, had received a liberal gift, and had departed that evening with his wife to return to the promontory. I would have gone with them, she continued, but the old fisherman, whom they call my father, and so he is Bertalda, interrupted Undine, he is your father, for the man you saw at the fountain told me how it is. He was trying to persuade me that I had better not take you to Ringstetten, and he let drop the secret. Well, then, said Bertalda, 
My father, if so it must be, my father said, You shall not live with us until you are an altered creature. Take courage and come across the haunted forest to us, and that will show you sincerely wish to belong to your parents. But do not come in your finery. Be like what you are, a fisherman's daughter, and I will do as he bids me, for the whole world has forsaken me, and I have nothing left but to live and die humbly in a poor hut alone with my lowly parents i do dread the forest very much they say it is full of grim spectres and i am so timid but what can i do i came here only to implore the lady of ringstetten's pardon for my rude language yesterday i have no doubt you meant what you did kindly noble dame but you little knew what a trial your words would be to me and i was so alarmed and bewildered that many a hasty wicked word escaped my lips ah forgive me forgive me i am unhappy enough already only consider what i was yesterday morning even at the beginning of your feast and what i am now her words were lost in a flood of bitter tears and undine equally affected fell weeping on her neck it was long before her emotion would let her speak at length she said you shall go to Ringstetten with us. All shall be as we had settled it before. Only call me Undine again, and not Lady and Noble Dame. You see, we began by being exchanged in our cradles. Our lives have been linked from that hour, and we will try to bind them so closely that no human power shall sever us. Come with us to Ringstetten, and all will be well. We will live like sisters there. Trust me for arranging that. Bertalda looked timidly at Huldbrand. The sight of this beautiful forsaken maiden affected him. He gave her his hand, and encouraged her kindly to trust herself to him and his wife. As to your parents, said he, we will let them know why you do not appear. And he would have said much more concerning the good old folks. But he observed that Bertalda shuddered at the mention of them, and therefore dropped the subject. He gave her his arm, placed first her and then Undine in the carriage, and rode cheerfully after them. He urged the drivers on so effectually that they very soon found themselves out of sight of the city and beyond the reach of sad recollections, and the two ladies could fully enjoy the beautiful country through which the road wound along. After a few days' traveling, they arrived one sunny evening at the castle of Ringstetten. Its young lord had much business with his steward and laborers to occupy him, so that Undine was left alone with Bertalda. They took a walk on the high ramparts of the castle, and admired the rich Swabian landscape, which lay far and wide around them. A tall man suddenly came up, with a courteous obeisance, and Bertalda could not help thinking him very like the ominous man of the fountain. The likeness struck her still more when, upon an impatient, and even menacing gesture of Undine's, he went away with the same hasty step and shake of the head as before. Do not be afraid, dear Bertalda, said Undine. The ugly man shall not harm you this time. After which she told her whole history, beginning from her birth, and how they had been exchanged in their earliest childhood. At first her friend looked at her with serious alarm. She thought Undine was possessed by some delirium. But she became convinced it was all true as she listened to the well-connected narrative which accounted so well for the strange events of the last months besides which there is something in genuine truth which finds an answer in every heart and can hardly be mistaken she was bewildered when she found herself one of the actors in a living fairy tale and as wild a tale as any she had read she gazed upon undine with reverence but could not help feeling a chill thrown over her affection for her, and that evening at supper time she wondered at the knight's fond love and familiarity towards a being whom she now looked upon as rather a spirit than a human creature. End of chapter 4, part 12Chapter 4, Part 13 of Famous Stories Every Child Should Know. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox. 
www.hamilton.org. Famous Stories Every Child Should Know, edited by Hamilton Wright Maybe. Chapter 4, Part 13, Undine, by Friedrich Baron de Lamotte Folk. Part 13, How They Lived in the Castle of Ringstetten. As he who relates this tale is moved to the heart by it, and hopes that it may affect his readers too, he entreats of them one favor, namely, that they will bear with him while he passes rapidly over a long space of time, and be content if he barely touches upon what happened therein. He knows well that some would relate in great detail, step by step, how Huldbrand's heart began to be estranged from Undine, and drawn toward Bertalda while she cared not to disguise from him her ardent love, and how between them the poor injured wife came to be rather feared than pitied. And when he showed her kindness, a cold shiver would often creep over him and send him back to the child of earth, Bertolda. All this, the author knows, might be dwelt upon. Nay, perhaps it ought to be so, but his heart shrinks from such a task. For he has met with such passages in real life and cannot even abide their shadows in his memory. Perhaps, gentle reader, such feelings are known to thee also, for they are the common lot of mortal man. Well is thee if thou hast felt not inflicted these pangs. In these cases it is more blessed to receive than to give. As such recollections wake up from their cells, they will but cast a soft shade over the past, and it may be the thought of thy withered blossoms one so fondly loved brings a gentle tear down thy cheek. Enough of this. We will not go on to pierce our hearts with a thousand separate arrows, but content ourselves with saying that so it happened in the present instance. Poor Undine drooped day by day, and the others were neither of them happy. Bertalda especially was uneasy and ready to suspect the injured wife whenever she fancied herself slighted by Huldbrand. Meantime, she had gradually assumed the command in the house, and the deluded Huldbrand supported her openly. Undine looked on in meek resignation. To increase the discomfort of their lives, there was no end to the mysterious sights and sounds that haunted Huldbrand and Bertalda in the vaulted galleries of the castle, such as had never been heard of before. The long white man, too, well known to him as Uncle Colborne, and to her as the spirit of the fountain, often showed his threatening countenance to both, but chiefly to Bertalda, who had more than once been made ill by the fright, and thought seriously of leaving the castle. But her love for Huldbrand detained her, and she quieted her conscience by thinking that it had never come to a declaration of love between them. And besides, she would not have known which way to turn. After receiving the Lord of Ringstetten's message that Bertalda was with them, the old fisherman had traced a few lines, scarcely legible from infirmity and long disuse, saying, I am now a poor old widower, for my dear good wife is dead. But lonely as I am by my fireside, I had rather Bertalda stayed away than come here, provided she does not harm my dear Undine. My curse be upon her if she does. Bertalda scattered these last words to the winds, but treasured up her father's command that she should not join him, as is the way with us selfish beings. One day, when Huldbrand had just ridden out, Undine sent for her servants and desired them to fetch a large stone and carefully to stop up the mouth of the magnificent fountain which played in the center of the court. The men objected that they must then always go down the valley to a great distance for water. Undine smiled mournfully. It grieves me to add to your burdens, my good friends, said she. I had rather go and fill my pitcher myself, but this fountain must be sealed up. Trust me, nothing else will do, and it is our only way of escaping a much worse evil. The servants rejoiced at any opportunity of pleasing their gentle mistress. Not a word more was said, and they lifted the huge stone. They had raised it, and were about to let it down on the mouth of the spring, when Bertalda ran up, calling out to them to stop. The water of this fountain was the best for her complexion, and she never would consent to its being stopped. But Undine, instead of yielding as usual, kept firmly, though gently, to her resolution. 
she said that it behooved her as mistress of the house to order all such matters as appeared best to her and none but her lord and husband should call her to account look oh look cried bertalda eagerly and angrily how the poor bright water curls and writhes because you would deprive it of every gleam of sunshine and of the cheerful faces of men whose mirror it was created to be in truth the spring did writhe and bubble up wonderfully just as if someone were trying to force his way through but undine pressed them the more to dispatch the work nor was there much need to repeat her commands the household people were too glad at once to obey their gentle lady and to mortify the pride of bertalda in spite of whose threats and wrath the stone was soon firmly fastened down on the mouth of the spring undine bent over it thoughtfully and wrote on its surface with her delicate fingers something very hard and sharp must have been hidden in her hand for when she walked away and the others came up they found all manner of strange characters on the stone none of which were there before when the knight came home that evening bertalda received him with tears and complaints of undine he looked sternly at his poor wife who mournfully cast down her eyes saying however with firmness my lord and husband would not chide the meanest of his vassals without giving him a hearing much less his wedded wife speak then what was your reason for this strange proceeding said the knight with a frown i would rather tell it to you quite alone sighed undine you can say it just as well in bertalda's presence replied he yes if thou requirest it said undine but require it not she looked so humble and so submissive in her touching beauty that the knight's heart was melted as by a sunbeam from happier days he took her affectionately by the hand and led her to his own room where she spoke to him as follows you know that wicked uncle colborne my dearest lord and have often been provoked at meeting him about the castle bertalda too has often been terrified by him no wonder he is soulless shallow and unthinking as a mirror in whom no feeling can pierce the surface he has two or three times seen that you were displeased with me that i and my childishness could not help weeping and that bertalda might chance to laugh at the same moment and upon this he builds all manner of unjust suspicions and interferes unasked in our concerns what is the use of my reproaching him or repulsing him with angry words he believes nothing that i say a poor cold life is his how should he know that the sorrows and joys of love are so sweetly alike so closely linked that it is not in human power to part them when a tear gushes out a smile lies beneath and a smile will draw the tears from their secret cells she smiled through her tears in huldbrand's face and a warm ray of his former love shot through his heart she perceived this pressed closer to him and with a few tears of joy she went on as i found it impossible to get rid of our tormentor by words i had nothing for it but to shut the door against him and his only access to us was that fountain he has quarrelled with the other fountain spirits in the surrounding valleys and it is much lower down the danube below the junction of some friends with the great river that his power begins again therefore i stop the mouth of our fountain and inscribe the stone with characters which cripple the might of my restless uncle so that he can no longer cross your path or mine or bertalda's men can indeed lift the stone off as easily as ever the inscription has no power over them so you are free to comply with bertalda's wish but indeed she little knows what she asks against her the wild culborn has a most particular spite and if some of his forebodings were to come true as they might without her intending any harm o oh dearest even thou wert not free from danger huldbrand deeply felt the generosity of his noble-minded wife in so zealously shutting out her formidable protector even when reviled by bertalda for so doing he clasped her fondly in his arms and said with much emotion the stone shall remain and everything shall be done as thou wishest now and hereafter my sweetest undine scarce could she trust these words of love after so dreary an estrangement she returned his caresses with joyful but timid gratitude and at length said my own dear love as you are so exceedingly kind to me to-day 
may i ask you to promise one thing herein you are like the summer is he not most glorious when he decks his brows with thunders and frowns upon us from his throne of clouds so it is when your eyes flash lightning it becomes you well although in my weakness i may often shed a tear at it only if you would promise to refrain from it when we are sailing or even near any water for there you see my relations have a right to control me they might relentlessly tear me from you in their wrath fancying that there is an insult offered to one of their race and i should be doomed to spend the rest of my life in the crystal palaces below without ever coming to you or if they did send me up again oh heaven that would be far worse no no my best beloved you will not let it come to that if you love your poor undine he solemnly promised to do as she asked him and they returned to the saloon quite restored to comfort and peace they met bertalda followed by a few laborers whom she had sent for and she said in a tone of bitterness that had grown common with her of late so now your private consultation is over and we may have the stone taken up make haste you people and do it for me but Huldbrand, incensed at her arrogance said shortly and decidedly the stone shall not be touched and he then reproved bertalda for her rudeness to his wife upon which the laborers walked off exulting secretly while bertalda hurried away to her chamber pale and disturbed the hour of supper came and they waited in vain for bertalda a message was sent to her the servants found her room empty and brought back only a sealed letter directed to the knight he opened it with trepidation and read i feel with shame that i am only a fisherman's daughter having forgotten it a moment i will expiate my crime in the wretched hut of my parents live happy with your beautiful wife undine was sincerely grieved she entreated huldbrand to pursue their friend at once and bring her back with him alas there was little need of entreaty his passion for bertalda returned with fresh violence he searched the castle all over asking everyone if they could tell him in what direction the fair one had fled he could discover nothing and now he had mounted his horse in the court and stood ready to set forth and try the route by which he had brought bertalda to the castle a peasant boy just then came up saying that he had met the lady riding toward the black valley like a shot the knight darted through the gate and took that direction without heeding undine's anxious cries from a window to the black valley oh not there huldbrand not there or take me with you for god's sake finding it vain to cry she had her white palfrey saddled in all haste and galloped after her husband without allowing anyone to attend her end of chapter four part thirteen chapter four part fourteen of famous stories every child should know this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org famous stories every child should know edited by hamilton wright maybe chapter four part fourteen undine by friedrich baron de la motte folk part fourteen how bertalda drove home with the knight the black valley lay among the deepest recesses of the mountains what is called now none can tell in those times it bore that name among the countrymen on account of the deep gloom shed over it by many high trees mostly pines even the brook which gushed down between the cliffs was tinged with black and never sparkled like the merry streams from which nothing intercepts the blue of heaven now in the dusk of twilight it looked darker still as it gurgled between the rocks the knight spurred his horse along its banks now fearing to lose ground in his pursuit and now again that he might overlook the fugitive in her hiding place if he hurried past too swiftly he presently found himself far advanced in the valley and hoped he must soon overtake her if he were but in the right track then again the thought that it might be a wrong one roused the keenest anxiety in his breast where was the tender bertalda to lay her head if he missed her in this bleak stormy night which was setting in black and awful upon the valley 
and now he saw something white gleaming through the boughs on the slope of a mountain. He took it for Bertalda's robe and made for it. But the horse started back and reared so obstinately that Huldbrand, impatient of delay and having already found him difficult to manage among the brambles of the thicket, dismounted and fastened the foaming steed to a tree. He then felt his way through the bushes on foot. The boughs splashed his head and cheeks roughly with cold, wet dew. Far off he heard the growl of thunder beyond the mountains, and the whole strange scene had such an effect upon him that he became afraid of approaching the white figure which he now saw lying on the ground at a short distance. And yet he could distinguish it to be a woman, dressed in long white garments like Bertalda's, asleep or in a swoon. He came close to her, made the boughs rustle and his sword ring, but she stirred not. Bertalda, cried he first gently, then louder and louder, in vain. When at length he shouted the beloved name with the whole strength of his lungs, a faint mocking echo returned it from the cavities of the rocks. Bertalda! But the sleeper awoke not. He bent over her, but the gloom of the valley and the shades of the night prevented his discerning her features. At length, though kept back by some boding fears, he knelt down by her on the earth, and just then a flash of lightning lighted up the valley. He saw a hideous distorted face close to his own, and heard a hollow voice say, Give me a kiss, thou sweet shepherd. With a cry of horror, Holdbrand started up, and the monster after him. Go home, it cried. The bad spirits are abroad. Go home, or I have you. And its long white arm nearly grasped him. Spiteful, Culborn, cried the knight, taking courage. What matters it? I know thee, foul spirit. There is a kiss for thee. And he raised his sword furiously against the figure. But it dissolved, and a drenching shower made it sufficiently clear to the knight what enemy he had encountered. He would scare me away from Bertalda, said he aloud to himself. He thinks he can subdue me by his absurd tricks, and make me leave the poor terrified maiden in his power, that he may wreak his vengeance upon her. But that he never shall, wretched goblin. What power lies in a human breast when steeled by firm resolve, the contemptible juggler has yet to learn. And he felt the truth of his own words, and seemed to have nerved himself afresh by them. He thought, too, that fortune now began to aid him, for before he had got back to his horse again, he distinctly heard the piteous voice of Bertalda, as if near at hand, borne toward him on the winds as their howling mingled with the thunder. Eagerly did he push on in that direction, and he found the trembling damsel was just attempting to climb the mountain's side in order at any risk to get out of these awful shades. He met her affectionately and however proudly she might before have determined to hold out, she could not but rejoice at being rescued by her much-loved Huldbrand from the fearful solitude, and warmly invited to return to his cheerful home in the castle. She accompanied him with scarcely a word of reluctance, but was so exhausted that the knight felt much relieved when they had reached the horse in safety. He hastened to loose him and would have placed his tender charge upon him, and walked by her side to guide her carefully through the dangerous shades. But Colborne's mad pranks had driven the horse quite wild. Hardly could the knight himself have sprung upon the terrified plunging creature's back. To place the trembling Bertalda upon him was quite impossible, so they made up their minds to walk home. With his horse's bridle over one arm, Holbrand supported his half-fainting companion on the other. Bertalda mustered what strength she could in order the sooner to get beyond this dreaded valley, but fatigue weighed her down like lead, and every limb shook under her, partly from the recollection of all she had already suffered from Colborne's spite, and partly from terror at the continued crashing of the tempest through the mountain forests. At length she slid down from her protector's arm, and sinking on the moss, she said, Leave me to die here, noble Huldbrand. I reap the punishment of my folly, and must sink under this load of fatigue and anguish. Never, my precious friend, never will I forsake you, cried Huldbrand, vainly striving to curb his raging steed, who was now beginning to start and plunge worse than ever. The knight, 
contrived to keep him at some distance from the exhausted maiden so as to save her the terror of seeing him near her but no sooner had he withdrawn himself and the wild animal a few steps than she began to call him back in the most piteous manner thinking he was indeed going to desert her in this horrible wilderness he was quite at a loss what to do gladly would he have let the horse gallop away in the darkness and expend his wild fury but that he feared he might rush down upon the very spot where Batalda lay in this extremity of distress it gave him unspeakable comfort to descry a wagon slowly descending the stony road behind him he called out for help a man's voice replied telling him to have patience but promising to come to his aid soon two white horses became visible through the thicket and next the white smock frock of the wagoner and a large sheet of white linen that covered his goods inside ho oh, stop cried the man and the obedient horses stood still i see well enough said he what ails the beast when first i came through these parts my horses were just as troublesome because there is a wicked water sprite living hard by who takes delight in making them play tricks but i know a charm for this if you will give me leave to whisper it in your horse's ear you will see him as quiet as mine yonder in a moment try your charm if it will do any good said the impatient knight the driver pulled the unruly horse's head toward him and whispered a couple of words in his ear at once the animal stood still tamed and pacified and showed no remains of his former fury but by panting and snorting as if he still chafed inwardly this was no time for huldbrand to inquire how it had been done he agreed with the wagoner that bertalda should be taken into the wagon which by his account was loaded with bales of soft cotton and conveyed to the castle of ringstetten while the knight followed on horseback but his horse seemed too much spent by his former violence to be able to carry his master so far and the man persuaded huldbrand to get into the wagon with bertalda the horse was to be fastened behind we shall go downhill said the man and that is light work for my horses the knight placed himself beside bertalda his horse quietly followed them and the driver walked by steadily and carefully in the deep stillness of night while the storm growled more and more distant and in the consciousness of safety and easy progress huldbrand and bertalda insensibly got into confidential discourse he tenderly reproached her for having so hastily fled she excused herself with bashful emotions and through all she said it appeared most clearly that her heart was all his own huldbrand was too much engrossed by the expression of her words to attend to their apparent meaning and he only replied to the former upon this the wagoner cried out in a voice that rent the air now my horses up with you show us what you're made of my fine fellows the knight put out his head and saw the horses treading or rather swimming through the foaming waters while the wheels whirled loudly and rapidly like those of a watermill and the wagoner was standing upon the top of his wagon overlooking the floods why what road is this it will take us into the middle of the stream cried huldbrand no sir cried the driver laughing it's just the other way the stream is coming into the middle of the road look round and see how it is all flooded in fact the whole valley was now heaving with waves that had swollen rapidly to a great height this must be colborne the wicked sprite trying to drown us cried the knight have you no charm to keep him off friend i do know of one said the driver but i can't and won't make use of it till you know who i am is this a time for riddles shouted the knight the flood is rising every moment and what care i to know who you are it rather concerns you however to know said the driver for i am colborne and he grinned hideously into the wagon which was now a wagon no longer nor were the horses horses but all dissolved into foaming waves the wagoner himself shot up into a giant waterspout bore down the struggling horses into the flood and towering over the heads of the hapless pair till he had swelled into a watery fountain he would have swallowed them up the next moment but now the sweet voice of undine was heard above the wild uproar the moon shone out between the clouds 
and at the same instant undine came into sight upon the high grounds above them she addressed colborn in a commanding tone the huge wave laid itself down muttering and murmuring the waters rippled gently away in the moon's soft light and undine alighted like a white dove from her airy height and led them to a soft green spot on the hillside where she refreshed their jaded spirits with choice food she then helped bertalda to mount her own white palfrey and at length they all three reached the castle of ringstetten in safety end of chapter four part fourteen Chapter 4, Part 15 of Famous Stories Every Child Should Know. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Famous Stories Every Child Should Know. Edited by Hamilton Wright Maybe. Chapter 4, Part 15 Undine by Friedrich Baron de Lamotte. Folk. Part 15. The Trip to Vienna. For some time after this adventure, they led a quiet and peaceful life in the castle. The knight was deeply touched by his wife's angelic goodness, so signally displayed by her pursuing and saving them in the Black Valley, where their lives were threatened by Colborne. Undine herself was happy in the peace of an approving conscience. Besides that, many a gleam of hope now brightened her path, as her husband's love and confidence seemed to revive. Bertalda, meanwhile, was grateful, modest, and timid, without claiming any merit for being so. If either of her companions alluded to the sealing up of the fountain, or the adventures in the Black Valley, she would implore them to spare her on those subjects, because she could not think of the fountain without a blush, nor the valley without a shudder. She was therefore told nothing further. Indeed, what would have been the use of enlightening her? Nothing could add to the peace and happiness which had taken up their abode in the castle of Ringstetten. They enjoyed the present in full security, and the future lay before them, all blooming with fair fruits and flowers. The winter had gone by without any interruption to their social comfort, and spring, with her young green shoots and bright blue skies, began to smile upon men. Their hearts felt light, like the young season, and from its returning birds of passage they caught a fancy to travel. One day, as they were walking together near the sources of the Danube, Huldbrand fell into talk about the glories of that noble river. How proudly he flowed on through fruitful lands to the spot where the majestic city of Vienna crowned his banks, and how every mile of his course was marked by fresh grandeur and beauty. How delightful it would be to follow his course down to Vienna, cried Bertalda, but instantly relapsing into a timid, chastened manner. She blushed and was silent. This touched Undine, and in her eagerness to give her friend pleasure, she said, And why should we not take the trip? Bertalda jumped for joy, and their fancy began to paint this pleasant recreation in the brightest colors. Huldbrand encouraged them cheerfully but whispered once to undine but should not we get within colborne's power again down there let him come said she laughing i shall be with you and in my presence he durst not attempt any mischief so the only possible objection seemed removed and they prepared for departure and were soon sailing along full of spirit and of gay hopes but o oh, man it is not for thee to wonder when the course of events differs widely from the paintings of thy fancy the treacherous foe that lures us to our ruin lulls his victims to rest with sweet music and golden dreams our guardian angel on the contrary will often rouse us by a sharp and awakening blow the first days they spent on the danube were days of extraordinary enjoyment the further they floated down the proud stream the nobler and fairer grew the prospect but just as they had reached a most lovely district the first sight of which had promised them great delight the unruly colborne began openly to give signs of his presence and power at first they were only sportive tricks because whenever he ruffled the stream and raised the wind 
Undine repressed him by a word or two, and made him again subside at once. But his attempts soon began again and again. Undine was obliged to warn him off, so that the pleasure of the little party was grievously disturbed. To make things worse, the watermen would mutter many a dark surmise into each other's ears, and cast strange looks at the three gentle folks, whose very servants began to feel suspicion, and to show distrust of their lord. Huldbrand said to himself more than once, This comes of uniting with other than one's like. A son of earth may not marry a wondrous maid of ocean. To justify himself, as we all love to do, he would add, but I did not know she was a maid of ocean. If I am to be pursued and fettered, wherever I go by the mad freaks of her relations, mine is the misfortune, not the fault. Such reflections somewhat checked his self-reproaches, but they made him the more disposed to accuse, nay, even to hate Undine. Already he began to scowl upon her, and the poor wife understood but too well his meaning. Exhausted by this, and by her constant exertions against Colborn, she sank back one evening in the boat, and was lulled by its gentle motion into a deep sleep. But no sooner were her eyes closed than to every one in the boat thought he saw, just opposite his own eyes, a terrific human head rising above the water, not like the head of a swimmer, but planted upright on the surface of the river and keeping pace with the boat. Each turned to his neighbor to show him the cause of his terror, and found him looking equally frightened, but pointing in a different direction, where the half-laughing, half-scowling goblin met his eyes. When at length they tried to explain the matter to each other, crying out, Look there! No, there! Each of them suddenly perceived the other's phantom, and the water round the boat appeared, all alive with ghastly monsters. The cry which burst from every mouth awakened Undine. Before the light of her beaming eyes, the horde of misshapen faces vanished. But Holdbrand was quite exasperated by these fiendish tricks, and would have burst into loud imprecations had not Undine whispered in the most beseeching manner, For God's sake, my own lord, be patient now. Remember, we are on the water. The knight kept down his anger, and soon sank into thought. Presently Undine whispered to him, My love, had we not better give up the foolish journey, and go home to Ringstetten in comfort? But Holdbrand muttered angrily, Then I am to be kept a prisoner in my own castle, and even there I may not breathe freely unless the fountain is sealed up. Would to heaven the absurd connection! But Undine pressed her soft hand gently upon his lips, and he held his peace, and mused upon all she had previously told him. In the meantime, Bertolda had yielded herself up to many and strange reflections. She knew something of Undine's origin, but not all, and Colborne in particular was only a fearful but vague image in her mind. She had not even once heard his name, and as she pondered these wonderful subjects, she half unconsciously took off a golden necklace which Holbrand had bought for her of a travelling jeweller a few days before. She held it close to the surface of the river, playing with it and dreamily watching the golden gleam that it shed on the glassy water. Suddenly a large hand came up out of the Danube, snatched the necklace, and ducked under with it. Bertolda screamed aloud, and was answered by a laugh of scorn from the depths below. And now the knight could contain himself no longer. Starting up, he gave loose to his fury, loading with imprecations those who chose to break into his family and private life, and challenging them, were they goblins or sirens, to meet his good sword. Bertolda continued to weep over the loss of her beloved jewel, and her tears were as oil to the flames of his wrath, while Undine kept her hand dipped into the water with a ceaseless low murmur, only once or twice interrupting her mysterious whispers, to say to her husband, in tones of entreaty, Dearest love, speak not roughly to me here. Say whatever you will, only spare me here. You know why and he still restrained his tongue, which stammered with passion, from saying a word directly against her. She soon drew her hand from under the water, bringing up a beautiful coral necklace whose glitter dazzled them all. Take it, said she, offering it kindly to Bertolda. 
I have sent for this instead of the one you lost. Do not grieve any more, my poor child. But Huldbrand darted forward, snatched the shining gift from Undine's hand, hurled it again into the water, and roared furiously, so you still have intercourse with them. In the name of sorcery, go back to them with all your baubles, and leave us men in peace, which as you are. With eyes aghast, yet streaming with tears, poor Undine gazed at him, still holding out the hand which had so lovingly presented to Bertalda the bright jewel and then she wept more and more, like a sorely injured innocent child, and at length she said faintly, Farewell, my dearest, farewell. They shall not lay a finger on thee. Only be true to me, that I may still guard thee from them. But I, alas, I must be gone. All this bright morning of life is over. Woe, woe is me. What hast thou done? Woe, woe and she slipped out of the boat and passed away whether she went down into the river or flowed away with it none could tell it was like both and yet like neither she soon mingled with the waters of the danube and nothing was to be heard but the sobbing whispers of the stream as it washed against the boat seeming to say distinctly woe woe oh be true to me woe woe Holbrand lay flat in the boat, drowned in tears, till a deep swoon came to the unhappy man's relief, and steeped him in oblivion. End of chapter 4, part 15chapter 4, part 16 of Famous Stories Every Child Should Know. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Famous Stories Every Child Should Know, edited by Hamilton Wright Maybe. Chapter 4, Part 16, Undine, by Friedrich Baron de Lamotte Folk. Part 16, Of What Befell Huldbrand Afterwards. Shall we say, alas, or thank God, that our grief is so often transient? I speak of such grief as has its source in the wellsprings of life itself, and seems so identified with our lost friend as almost to fill up the void he has left, and his hallowed image seems fixed within the sanctuary of our soul, until the signal of our release comes and sets us free to join him. In truth, a good man will not suffer this sanctuary to be disturbed. Yet even with him, it is not the first, the all-engrossing sorrow which abides. New objects will intermingle, and we are compelled to draw from our grief itself a fresh proof of the perishableness of earthly things. Alas, then, that our grief is transient. So it was with the Lord of Ringstetten. Whether for his weal or woe, the sequel of this story will show us. At first he could do nothing but weep abundantly, as his poor kind Undine had wept, when he snatched from her the beautiful gift which she thought would have comforted and pleased them so much. He would then stretch out his hand as she had done, and burst into tears afresh like her. He secretly hoped that he might end by altogether dissolving in tears. And are there not many whose minds have been visited by the same painfully pleasing thought at some season of great sorrow? Bertalda wept with him, and they lived quietly together at Ringstetten a long while, cherishing the memory of Undine, and seeming to have forgotten their own previous attachment. Moreover, the gentle Undine often appeared to Huldbrand in his dreams. She would caress him meekly and fondly, and depart again with tearful resignation, so that when he awoke, he doubted whose tears they were that bedewed his face. Were they hers, or only his own? But as time went on, these visions became less frequent, and the night's grief milder. Still he might perhaps have spent the rest of his days contentedly, devoting himself to the memory of Undine, and keeping it alive by talking of her, had not the old fisherman unexpectedly made his appearance, 
and laid his serious commands upon Bertalda, his daughter, to return home with him. The news of Undine's disappearance had reached him, and he would no longer suffer Bertalda to remain in the castle alone with its lord. I do not ask whether my daughter cares for me or not, said he. Her character is at stake, and where that is the case, nothing else is worth considering. This summons from the old man, and the prospect of utter loneliness amid the halls and long galleries of the castle after Bertalda's departure, revived in Huldbrand's heart the feeling that had lain dormant, and as it were buried under his mourning for Undine, namely, his love for the fair Bertalda. The fishermen had many objections to their marriage. Undine had been very dear to the old man, and he thought it hardly certain yet that his lost darling was really dead. But if her corpse were indeed lying stiff and cold in the bed of the Danube, or floating down its stream to the distant ocean, then Bertalda ought to reproach herself for her death, and it ill became her to take the place of her poor victim. However, the fisherman was very fond of Huldbrand also. The entreaties of his daughter, who was now grown much more gentle and submissive, had their effect, and it seems that he did yield his consent at last, for he remained peaceably at the castle, and an express was sent for Father Heilman, who in earlier, happier days had blessed Undine's and Huldbrand's union, that he might officiate at the knight's second marriage. No sooner had the holy man read the Lord of Ringstetten's letter then he set forth on his way thither, with far greater speed than the messenger had used to reach him. If his straining haste took away his breath, or if he felt his aged limbs ache with fatigue, he would say to himself, I may be in time to prevent a wicked deed. Sink not till thou hast reached the goal, my withered frame. And so he exerted himself afresh, and pushed on without flagging or halting, till late one evening he entered the shady court of Ringstetten. The lovers were sitting hand in hand under a tree, with a thoughtful old man near them. As soon as they saw Father Heilman, they rose eagerly and advanced to meet him. But he, scarcely noticing their civilities, begged the knight to come with him into the castle. As he stared at this request and hesitated to comply, the pious old priest said, Why indeed should I speak to you alone, my lord of Ringstetten? What I have to say equally concerns the fishermen and Bertalda, and as they must sooner or later know it, it had better be said now. How can you be certain, Lord Holdbrand, that your own wife is indeed dead? For myself I can hardly think so. I will not venture to speak of things relating to her wondrous nature. In truth, I have no clear knowledge about it. But a godly and faithful wife she proved herself beyond all about. And these fourteen nights has she come to my bedside in dreams, wringing her poor hands in anguish and sighing out, Oh, stop him, dear father, I am yet alive. Oh, save his life. Oh, save his soul. I understand not the meaning of the vision till your messenger came, and I have now hastened hither not to join but to part those hands which may not be united in holy wedlock. Part from her Huldbrand, part from him Bertalda, he belongs to another. See you not how his cheeks turn pale at the thought of his departed wife? Those are not the looks of a bridegroom, and the spirit tells me this. If thou leavest him not now, there is joy for thee no more. They all three felt at the bottom of their hearts that Father Heilman's words were true, but they would not yield to them. Even the old fisherman was so blinded as to think that what had been settled between them for so many days could not now be relinquished. So they resisted the priest's warnings, and urged the fulfillment of their wishes with headlong gloomy determination till Father Heilman departed with a melancholy shake of the head, without accepting even for one night their proffered hospitalities, or tasting any of the refreshments they set before him. But Holbrand persuaded himself that the old priest was a weak dotard, and early next morning he sent to a monk from the nearest cloister, who readily promised to come and marry them in a few days. End of chapter 4, part 16
Chapter 5, Part 17 of Famous Stories Every Child Should Know. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Famous Stories Every Child Should Know, edited by Hamilton Wright Maybe. Chapter 4, Part 17 undine by friedrich baron de la motte folk part seventeen the knight's dream the morning twilight was beginning to dawn and the knight lay half awake on his couch whenever he dropped asleep he was scared by mysterious terrors and started up as if sleep were peopled by phantoms if he woke up in earnest he felt himself fanned all around by what seemed like swan's wings and soothed by watery airs which lulled him back again into the half unconscious twilight state at length he did fall asleep and fancied himself lifted by swans on their soft wings and carried far away over lands and seas all to the sound of their sweetest melody swans singing swans singing thought he continually is not that the strain of death Presently he found himself hovering above a vast sea. A swan warbled in his ear that it was the Mediterranean, and as he looked down into the deep, it became like clear crystal, transparent to the bottom. This rejoiced him much, for he could see Undine sitting in a brilliant hall of crystal. She was shedding tears, indeed, and looked sadly changed since the happy times which they had spent together at Ringstetten happiest at first but happy also a short time since just before the fatal sail on the danube the contrast struck huldbrand deeply but undine did not seem to be aware of his presence culborn soon came up to her and began rating her for weeping she composed herself and looked at him with a firmness and dignity before which he almost quailed though i am condemned to live under these deep waters said she i have brought my soul with me therefore my tears cannot be understood by thee but to me they are blessings like everything that belongs to a loving soul he shook his head incredulously and said after a pause nevertheless niece you are still subject to the laws of our element and you know you must execute sentence of death upon him as soon as he marries again and breaks faith with you to this hour he is a widower said undine and loves and mourns me truly ah but he will be a bridegroom soon said colborne with a sneer wait a couple of days only and the marriage blessing will have been given and you must go up and put the criminal to death i cannot answered the smiling undine i have had the fountain sealed up against myself and my whole race but suppose he leaves his castle said Colborne, or forgets himself so far as to let them set the fountain free, for he thinks mighty little of those matters. And that is why, said Undine, still smiling through her tears, that is why his spirit hovers at this moment over the Mediterranean and listens to our conversation as in a dream. I have contrived it on purpose, that he may take warning. On hearing this, Colborne looked up angrily at the knight, scowled at him, stamped and then shot upward through the waves like an arrow his fury seemed to make him expand into a whale again the swans began to warble to wave their wings and to fly the knight felt himself borne high over the alps and rivers till he was deposited in the cattle of ringstetten and awoke in his bed he did awake in his bed just as one of his squires entered the room and told him that father heilman was still lingering near the castle for he had found him the evening before in the forest living in a shed that he had made for himself with branches and moss on being asked what he was staying for since he had refused to bless the betrothed couple he answered it is not the wedded only who stand in need of prayer and though i came not for the bridal there may yet be work for me of another kind we must be prepared for everything sometimes marriage and mourning are not so far apart and he who does not wilfully close his eyes may perceive it the knight built all manner of strange conjectures upon these words and upon his dream 
but if once a man has formed a settled purpose, it is hard indeed to shake it. The end of this was that their plans remained unchanged. End of chapter 4, part 17. Chapter 4, part 18 of Famous Stories Every Child Should Know. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Famous Stories Every Child Should Know, edited by Hamilton Wright Maybe. Chapter 4, Part 18. Undine, by Friedrich Baron de la Motte Folk. Part 18, of the Knight Hulbrand's Second Bridal. Were I to tell you how the wedding day at Ringstetten passed, you might imagine yourself contemplating a glittering heap of gay objects with a black crepe thrown over them, through which the splendid pageant, instead of delighting the eye, would look like a mockery of all earthly joys. Not that the festive meeting was disturbed by any spectral apparitions. We have seen that the castle was safe from any intrusion of the malicious water sprites. But the knight, the fisherman and all the guests were haunted by a feeling that the chief person the soul of the feast was missing and who was she but the gentle beloved undine as often as they heard a door open every eye turned involuntarily toward it and when nothing ensued but the entrance of the steward with more dishes or the cup-bearer with a fresh supply of rich wine the guests would look sad and blank and the sparks of gaiety kindled by the light jest or the cheerful discourse were quenched in the damp of melancholy recollections the bride was the most thoughtless and consequently the most cheerful person present but even she at moments felt it unnatural to be sitting at the head of the table decked out in her wreath of green and her embroidery of gold while undine's corpse was lying cold and stiff in the bed of the danube or floating down its stream to the ocean for ever since her father had used these words they had been ringing in her ears and today especially they pursued her without ceasing the party broke up before night had closed in not as usual dispersed by the eager impatience of the bridegroom to be alone with his bride but dropping off listlessly as a general gloom spread over the assembly Bertalda was followed to her dressing-room by her women only, and the knight by his pages. At this gloomy feast there was no question of the gay and sportive train of bridesmaids and young men who usually attend the wedded pair. Bertalda tried to call up brighter thoughts. She bade her women display before her a splendid set of jewels, the gift of Holdbrand, together with her richest robes and veils, that she might select the gayest and handsomest dress for the morrow. Her maid seized the opportunity of wishing their young mistress all manner of joy, nor did they fail to extol the beauty of the bride to the skies. Bertalda, however, glanced at herself in the glass and sighed, Ah, but look at the freckles just here on my throat. They looked and found it was indeed so, but called them beauty spots that would only enhance the fairness of her delicate skin bertalda shook her head and replied still it is a blemish and i once might have cured it said she with a deep sigh but the fountain in the court is stopped up that fountain which used to supply me with precious beautifying water if i could get but one jugful to-day is that all cried an obsequious attendant and slipped out of the room why she will not be so mad asked bertalda in a tone of complacent surprise as to make them raise the stone this very night and now she heard men's footsteps crossing the court and on looking down from her window she saw the officious handmaid conducting them straight to the fountain they carried levers and other tools upon their shoulders well it is my will to be sure said bertalda smiling provided they are not too long about it and elated by the thought that a hint from her could now effect what had once been denied to her entreaties she watched the progress of the work in the moonlit court below the men began straining themselves to lift the huge stone 
Occasionally a sigh was heard as someone recollected that they were now reversing their dear lady's commands But the task proved lighter than they had expected some power from beneath seemed to second their efforts and help the stone upward Why said the astonished workmen to each other it feels as if the spring below had turned into a water spout more and more did the stone heave till without any impulse from the men it rolled heavily along the pavement with a hollow sound But from the mouth of the spring arose slowly and solemnly What looked like a column of water at first they thought so but presently saw that it was no water spout But the figure of a pale woman veiled in white she was weeping abundantly wringing her hands and clasping them over her head while she proceeded with slow and measured step toward the castle the crowd of servants fell back from the spot while pale and aghast the bride and her women looked on from the window when the figure had arrived just under that window she raised her tearful face for a moment and bertalda thought she recognized undine's pale features through the veil the shadowy form moved on slowly and reluctantly like one sent to execution Bertalda screamed out that the night must be called no one durst stir a foot and the bride herself kept silence Frightened at the sound of her own voice While these remained at the window as if rooted to the spot the mysterious visitor had entered the castle and passed up the well-known stairs and through the familiar rooms still weeping silently alas how differently had she trodden those floors in days gone by the knight had now dismissed his train half undressed and in a dejected mood he was standing near a large mirror by the light of a dim taper he heard the door tapped by a soft soft touch it was thus undine had been wont to knock when she meant to steal upon him playfully it is all fancy thought he the bridal bed awaits me yes but it is a cold one said a weeping voice from without and the mirror then showed him the door opening slowly and the white form coming in and closing the door gently behind her they have opened the mouth of the spring murmured she and now i am come and now must thou die his beating heart told him this was indeed true but he pressed his hands over his eyes and said do not bewilder me with terror in my last moments if thy veil conceals the features of a specter hide them from me still and let me die in peace alas rejoined the forlorn one wilt thou not look upon me once again i am fair as when thou didst woo me on the promontory oh could that be true sighed Holdbrand, and if i might die in thy embrace be it so my dearest said she and she raised her veil and the heavenly radiance of her sweet countenance beamed upon him trembling at once with love and awe the knight approached her she received him with a tender embrace but instead of relaxing her hold she pressed him more closely to her heart and wept as if her soul would pour itself out drowned in her tears and his own huldbrand felt his heart sink within him and at last he fell lifeless from the fond arms of undine upon his pillow i have wept him to death said she to the pages whom she passed in the antechamber and she glided slowly through the crowd and went back to the fountain end of chapter four part eighteen Chapter 4, Part 19 of Famous Stories Every Child Should Know. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Famous Stories Every Child Should Know. Edited by Hamilton Wright Maybe. Chapter 4, Part 19. Undine by Friedrich Baron de Lamotte Folk. Part 19 How the Knight Huldbrand Was Interred. Father Heilman had returned to the castle as soon as he heard of the Lord of Ringstetten's death, and he appeared there just after the monk, who had married the hapless pair, had fled full of alarm and horror, 
It is well, answered Heilman, when told this. Now is the time for my office. I want no assistant. He addressed spiritual exhortations to the widowed bride, but little impression could be made on so worldly and thoughtless a mind. The old fisherman, although grieved to the heart, resigned himself more readily to the awful dispensation. And when Bertalda kept calling Undine a witch and a murderer, the old man calmly answered, The stroke could not be turned away. For my part I see only the hand of God therein, and none grieved more deeply over Huldbrand's sentence than she who was doomed to inflict it, the poor forsaken Undine and he helped to arrange the funeral ceremonies in a manner suitable to the high rank of the dead. He was to be buried in a neighboring hamlet, whose churchyard contained the graves of all his ancestors, and which he himself enriched with many noble gifts. His helmet and coat of arms lay upon the coffin, about to be lowered into earth with all his mortal remains, for Lord Huldbrand of Ringstetten was the last of his race. The mourners began their dismal procession, and the sound of their solemn dirge rose into the calm blue depths of heaven. Heilman walked first, bearing on high a crucifix, and the bereaved Bertalda followed leaning on her aged father. Suddenly, amid the crowd of mourners who composed the widow's train, appeared a snow-white figure, deeply veiled, with hands uplifted in an attitude of intense grief. Those that stood near her felt a shudder creep over them. They shrank back, and thus increased the alarm of those whom the stranger next approached, so that confusion gradually spread itself through the whole train. Here and there was to be found a soldier bold enough to address the figure and attempt to drive her away, but she always eluded their grasp, and the next moment reappeared among the rest, moving along with slow and solemn step. At length, when the attendants had all fallen back, she found herself close behind Bertalda, and now slackened her pace to the very slowest measure, so that the widow was not aware of her presence. No one disturbed her again, while she meekly and reverently glided on behind her. And so they advanced, till they reached the churchyard, when the whole procession formed a circle round the open grave. Bertalda, then discovered the unbidden guest, and half angry, half frightened, she forbade her to come near the knight's resting place. But the veiled form gently shook her head, and extended her hands in humble entreaty. This gesture reminded Bertalda of poor Undine, when she gave her the coral necklace on the Danube, and she could not but weep. Father Heilman enjoined silence, for they had begun to heap earth over the grave and were about to offer up solemn prayers around it. Bertalda knelt down in silence, and all her followers did the same. When they rose, lo, the white form had vanished, and on the spot where she had knelt, a bright silvery brook now gushed out of the turf, and flowed round the knight's tomb till it had almost wholly encircled it, and then it ran further on and emptied itself into a shady pool which bounded one side of the churchyard. From that time forth, the villagers are said to have shown travellers this clear spring, and they still believe it to be the poor forsaken Undine, who continues thus to twine her arms round her beloved lord. End of chapter 4, part 19《Chapter 5 of Famous Stories Every Child Should Know》This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Lynn Silva Famous Stories Every Child Should Know Edited by Hamilton Wright Maybe Chapter 5 The Story of Ruth From the Book of Ruth it came to pass in the days when the judges ruled that there was a famine in the land and a certain man of bethlehem judah went to sojourn in the country of moab he and his wife and his two sons and the name of the man was elimelech and the name of his wife naomi and the names of his two sons malon and chileon 
Ephratites of Bethlehem, Judah. And they came into the country of Moab and continued there. And Elimelech, Naomi's husband, died. She was left and her two sons. And they took them wives of the women of Moab. The name of the one was Orpa, and the name of the other was Ruth. And they dwelt there about ten years. And Malon and Chilion died also, both of them. And the woman was left of her two sons and her husband. Then she arose with her daughters-in-law, that she might return from the country of Moab. For she had heard in the country of Moab how that the Lord had visited his people in giving them bread. Wherefore she went forth out of the place where she was, and her two daughters-in-law with her. And they went on the way to return unto the land of Judah. And Naomi said unto her two daughters-in-law, Go, return each to her mother's house. The Lord deal kindly with you, as ye have dealt with the dead and with me. The Lord grant you that ye may find rest, and the of you in this house of her husband. Then she kissed them, and they lifted up their voice and wept. And they said unto her, Surely we will return with thee unto thy people. And Naomi said, Turn again, my daughters, why will you go with me? Turn again, my daughters, go your way. And they lifted up their voice and wept again. And Orpah kissed her mother-in-law, but Ruth cleave unto her. And she said, Behold, thy sister-in-law is gone back unto her people and unto her gods. Return thou after thy sister-in-law. And Ruth said, Entreat me not to leave thee or to return from following after thee. For whither thou goest, I will go, and where thou lodgest, I will lodge. Thy people shall be my people, and thy God my God. Where thou didst, will I die, and there will I be buried. The Lord do so to me, and more also, if aught but death part thee and me. When Naomi saw that Ruth was steadfastly minded to go with her, then she left, speaking unto her. So they two went until they came to Bethlehem. And it came to pass, when they were come to Bethlehem, that all the city was moved about them, and they said, Is this Naomi? And she said unto them, Call me not Naomi, call me Mara, for the Almighty hath dealt very bitterly with me. I went out full, and the Lord hath brought me home again empty. Why then call ye me Naomi, seeing that the Lord hath testified against me, and the Almighty hath afflicted me? So Naomi returned, and Ruth, the Moabites, her daughter-in-law with her, which returned out of the country of Moab, and they came to Bethlehem in the beginning of barley harvest. And Naomi had a kinsman of her husband's, a mighty man of wealth, of the family of Elimelech, and his name was Boaz. And Ruth said unto Naomi, Let me now go to the field and glean ears of corn after him, in whose sight I shall find grace. And Naomi said unto her, Go, my daughter. And she went and came and gleaned in the field after the reapers. And her hap was to light on a part of the field belonging unto Boaz, who was of the kindred of Elimelech. And behold, Boaz came from Bethlehem and said unto the reapers, The Lord be with you. And they answered him, The Lord bless thee. Then said Boaz unto his servant that was set over the reapers, Whose damsel is this? And the servant that was set over the reapers answered and said, It is the Moabitish damsel that came back with Naomi out of the country of Moab. And she said, I pray you, let me glean and gather after the reapers among the sheaves. So she came and hath continued even from the morning until now, that she tarried a little in the house. Then said Boaz unto Ruth, 
Hearest thou not my daughter? Go not to glean in another field, neither go from hence, but abide here fast by my maidens. Let thine eyes be on the field that they do reap, and go thou after them. Have I not charged the young men that they shall not touch thee? And when thou art athirst, go unto the vessels and drink of that which the young men have drawn. Then she fell on her face, and bowed herself to the ground, and said unto him, Why have I found grace in thine eyes, that thou shouldest take knowledge of me, seeing I am a stranger? And Boaz answered, and said unto her, It hath fully been showed me all that thou hast done unto thy mother-in-law since the death of thine husband, and how thou hast left thy father and thy mother and the land of thy nativity and art come unto a people which thou knowest not heretofore the lord recompense thy work and a full reward be given thee of the lord god of israel under whose wings thou art come to trust then she said let me find favor in thy sight my lord for that thou hast comforted me and for that thou hast spoken friendly unto thine handmaid though i be not like unto one of thine handmaidens and boaz said unto her at mealtime come thou hither and eat of the bread and dip thy morsel in the vinegar and she sat beside the reapers and he reached her parched corn and she did eat, and was sufficed, and left. And when she was risen up to glean, Boaz commanded his young men, saying, Let her glean even among the sheaves, and reproach her not, and let fall also some of the handfuls of purpose for her, and leave them that she may glean them, and rebuke her not. So she gleaned in the field until even, and beat out that she had gleaned, and it was about an eva of barley and she took it up and went into the city and her mother-in-law saw that she had cleaned and she brought forth and gave to her that she had reserved after she was sufficed and her mother-in-law said unto her where hast thou cleaned today and where wrothest thou blessed be he that did take knowledge of thee and she showed her mother-in-law with whom she had wrought, and said, The man's name with whom I wrought today is Boaz. And Naomi said unto her daughter-in-law, Blessed be he of the Lord, who hath not left of his kindness to the living and to the dead. The man is near of kin unto us, one of our next kinsmen. And Ruth the Moabites said, he said unto me also, Thou shalt keep fast by my young men until they have ended all my harvest. And Naomi said unto Ruth, her daughter-in-law, It is good, my daughter, that thou go out with his maidens, that they meet thee, not in any other field. So she kept fast by the maidens of Boaz, to glean unto the end of barley harvest and of wheat harvest, and dwelt with her mother-in-law. Then Naomi, her mother-in-law, said unto her, My daughter, shall I not seek rest for thee, that it may be well with thee? And now is not Boaz of our kindred, with whose maidens thou wast? Behold, he winnoweth barley tonight in the threshing floor. Wash thyself therefore, and anoint thee, and put thy raiment upon thee, and get thee down to the floor, but make not thyself known unto the man, until he shall have done eating and drinking. And it shall be, when he lie down, that thou shalt mark the place where he shall lie, and thou shalt go in, and uncover his feet, and lay thee down, and he will tell thee what thou shalt do. And Ruth said unto her, All that thou sayest unto me I will do. 
and she went down onto the floor and did according to all that her mother-in-law bade her. And when Boaz had eaten and drunk, and his heart was merry, he went to lie down at the end of the heap of corn, and she came softly and uncovered his feet and laid her down. And it came to pass at midnight that the man was afraid, and turned himself, and behold, a woman lay at his feet. And he said, Who art thou? And she answered, I am Ruth, thine handmaid, spread therefore thy skirt over thine handmaid, for thou art a near kinsman. And he said, Blessed be thou of the Lord my daughter, for thou hast showed more kindness in the latter end than in the beginning, inasmuch as thou followedst not young men, whether poor or rich. And now, my daughter, fear not, I will do to thee all that thou requirest. For all the city of my people doth know that thou art a virtuous woman, and now it is true that I am thy near kinsman. Howbeit, there is a kinsman nearer than I. Tarry this night, and it shall be in the morning, that if he will perform unto thee the part of a kinsman, well, let him do the kinsman's part, for if he will not do the part of a kinsman's to thee, then will I do the part of a kinsman to thee, as the Lord lived. Lie down until the morning. And she lay at his feet until the morning, and she rose up before one could know another. And he said, Let it not be known that a woman came into the floor. Also he said, Bring the veil that thou hast upon thee, and hold it. And when she held it, he measured six measures of barley, and laid it on her. And she went to the city, and when she came to her mother-in-law, she said, Who art thou, my daughter? And she told her all that the man had done to her, and she said, These six measures of barley gave he me, for he said to me, Go not empty unto thy mother-in-law. Then Naomi said, Sit still, my daughter, until thou know how the matter will fall, for the man will not be in rest until he have finished the thing this day. Then went Boaz up to the gate and sat him down there, and behold, the kinsman of whom Boaz spake came by, unto whom he said, Ho, oh, such a one, turn aside, sit down here. And he turned aside and sat down. And Boaz took ten men of the elders of the city and said, Sit ye down here. And they sat down. And he said unto the kinsman, Naomi, that is come again out of the country of Moab, selleth a parcel of land, which was our brother's Elimelech's. And I thought to advertise thee by saying, Buy it before the inhabitants and before the elders of my people. If thou wilt redeem it, redeem it. But if thou wilt not redeem it, then tell me that I may know. For there is none to redeem it beside thee, and I am after thee. And he said, I will redeem it. Then said Boaz, What day thou buyest the field of the hand of Naomi? Thou must buy it also of Ruth the Moabites, the wife of the dead to raise up the name of the dead upon his inheritance. And the kinsman said, I cannot redeem it for myself, lest I mar mine own my inheritance. Redeem thou my right to thyself, for I cannot redeem it. Now, this was the manner in former time in Israel, concerning redeeming and concerning changing, for to confirm all things, a man plucked off his shoe and gave it to his neighbor. And this was his testimony in Israel. Therefore the kinsman said unto Boaz, Buy it for thee. So he threw off his shoe. And Boaz said unto the elders and unto all the people, Ye are witnesses this day that I have bought all that was Elimelech's and that was Chilion's and Malon's, 
at the hand of Naomi. Moreover, Ruth, the Moabites, the wife of Malon, have I purchased to be my wife, to raise up the name of the dead upon his inheritance, that the name of the dead be not cut off from among his brethren, and from the gate of his place. Ye are witnesses this day. And all the people that were in the gate and the elders said, We are witnesses. The Lord make the woman that is come into thine house like Rachel and like Leah, which do did build the house of Israel. And do thou worthily in Ephrathah, and be famous in Bethlehem. Let thy house be like the house of Paris, whom Tamar bare unto Judah, of the seed which the Lord shall give thee of this young woman. So Boaz took Ruth, and she was his wife. And Ruth bare a son, and the women said unto Naomi, Blessed be the Lord, which hath not left thee this day without a kinsman, that his name may be famous in Israel. And he shall be unto thee a restorer of thy life, and a nourisher of thine old age, for thy daughter-in-law, which loveth thee, which is better to thee than seven sons, hath borne him. And Naomi took the child, and laid it in her bosom, and became nurse to it. And the women, her neighbors, gave it a name, saying, There is a son born to Naomi, and they called his name Obed. End of chapter 5「Chapter Six, Part One of Famous Stories Every Child Should Know. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Famous Stories Every Child Should Know, edited by Hamilton Wright Maybe. Chapter Six, Part One, The Great Stone Face, by Nathaniel Hawthorne. Part One. One afternoon, when the sun was going down, a mother and her little boy sat at the door of their cottage, talking about the great stone face. They had but to lift their eyes, and there it was plainly to be seen, though miles away, with the sunshine brightening all its features. And what was the great stone face? Embosomed amongst a family of lofty mountains, there was a valley so spacious that it contained many thousand inhabitants. Some of these good people dwelt in log huts, with a black forest all around them on the steep and difficult hillsides. Others had their homes in comfortable farmhouses, and cultivated the rich soil on the gentle slopes or level surfaces of the valley. Others again were congregated into populous villages, where some wild highland rivulet, tumbling down from its birthplace in the upper mountain region, had been caught and tamed by human cunning, and compelled to turn the machinery of cotton factories. The inhabitants of this valley, in short, were numerous and of many modes of life. But all of them, grown people and children, had a kind of familiarity with a great stone face, although some possessed the gift of distinguishing this grand natural phenomena more perfectly than many of their neighbors. The great stone face, then, was a work of nature in her mood of majestic playfulness, formed on the perpendicular side of a mountain by some immense rocks, which had been thrown together in such a position as, when viewed at a proper distance, precisely to resemble the features of the human countenance. It seemed as if an enormous giant, or a titan, had sculptured his own likeness on the precipice. There was the broad arch of the forehead a hundred feet in height, the nose with its long bridge, and the vast lips, which, if they could have spoken, would have rolled their thunder accents from one end of the valley to the other. True it is that if the spectator approached too near, he lost the outline of the gigantic visage, and could discern only a heap of ponderous and gigantic rocks, piled in chaotic ruin one upon another. Retracing his steps, however, the wondrous features would again be seen, and the farther he withdrew from them, the more like a human face, with all its original divinity intact, did they appear, 
until as it grew dim in the distance with the clouds and glorified vapor of the mountains clustering about it the great stone face seemed positively to be alive it was a happy lot for children to grow up to manhood or womanhood with a great stone face before their eyes for all the features were noble and the expression was at once grand and sweet as if it were the glow of a vast warm heart that embraced all mankind in its affections and had room for more it was an education only to look at it according to the belief of many people the valley owed much of its fertility to this benign aspect that was continually beaming over it illuminating the clouds and infusing its tenderness into the sunshine as we began with saying a mother and her little boy sat at their cottage door gazing at the great stone face and talking about it the child's name was ernest mother said he while the titanic visage smiled on him i wish that it could speak for it looks so very kindly that its voice must needs be pleasant if i were to see a man with such a face i should love him dearly if an old prophecy should come to pass answered his mother we may see a man some time or other with exactly such a face as that what prophecy do you mean dear mother eagerly inquired ernest pray tell me all about it so his mother told him a story that her own mother had told to her when she herself was younger than little ernest a story not of things that were past but of what was yet to come a story nevertheless so very old that even the indians who formerly inhabited this valley had heard it from their forefathers to whom as they affirmed it had been murmured by the mountain streams and whispered by the wind among the treetops the purport was that at some future day a child should be born hereabouts who was destined to become the greatest and noblest personage of his time and whose countenance in manhood should bear an exact resemblance to the great stone face not a few old-fashioned people and young ones likewise in the ardor of their hopes still cherished an enduring faith in this old prophecy but others who had seen more of the world had watched and waited till they were weary and had beheld no man with such a face nor any man that proved to be much greater or nobler than his neighbors concluded it to be nothing but an idle tale at all events the great man of the prophecy had not yet appeared oh mother dear mother cried ernest clapping his hands above his head i do hope that i shall live to see him his mother was an affectionate and thoughtful woman and felt that it was wisest not to discourage the generous hopes of her little boy so she only said to him perhaps you may and ernest never forgot the story that his mother told him it was always in his mind whenever he looked upon the great stone face he spent his childhood in the log cottage where he was born and was dutiful to his mother and helpful to her in many things assisting her much with his little hands and more with his loving heart in this manner from a happy yet often pensive child he grew up to be a mild quiet unobtrusive boy and sun browned with labor in the fields but with more intelligence brightening his aspect than is seen in many lads who have been taught at famous schools yet ernest had had no teacher save only that the great stone face became one to him when the toil of the day was over he would gaze at it for hours until he began to imagine that those vast features recognized him and gave him a smile of kindness and encouragement responsive to his own look of veneration we must not take upon us to affirm that this was a mistake although the face may have looked no more kindly at ernest than at all the world beside but the secret was that the boy's tender and confiding simplicity discerned what other people could not see and thus the love which was meant for all became his peculiar portion about this time there went a rumor throughout the valley that the great man foretold from ages long ago who was to bear a resemblance to the great stone face had appeared at last it seems that many years before a young man had migrated from the valley and settled at a distant seaport where after getting together a little money he had set up as a shopkeeper his name but i could never learn whether it was his real one or a nickname that had grown out of his habits and success in life was 
gather gold. Being shrewd and active, and endowed by Providence with that inscrutable faculty which develops itself in what the world calls luck, he became an exceedingly rich merchant, and owner of a whole fleet of bulky bottomed ships. All the countries of the globe appeared to join hands for the mere purpose of adding heap upon heap to the mountainous accumulation of this one man's wealth. The cold regions of the north, almost within the gloom and shadow of the Arctic Circle, sent him their tribute in the shape of furs. Hot Africa sifted for him the golden sands of her rivers, and gathered up the ivory tusks of her great elephants out of the forests. The east came bringing him the rich shawls, and spices, and teas, and the effulgence of diamonds, and the gleaming purity of large pearls. The ocean, not to be behindhand with the earth, yielded up her mighty whales, that Mr. Gathergold might sell their oil, and make a profit on it. Be the original commodity what it might, it was gold within his grasp. It might be said of him, as of Midas in the fable, that whatever he touched with his finger immediately glistened, and grew yellow, and was changed at once into sterling metal, or, which suited him still better, into piles of coin. And when Mr. Gathergold had become so very rich that it would have taken him a hundred years only to count his wealth, he bethought himself of his native valley, and resolved to go back thither, and end his days where he was born. With this purpose in view, he sent a skilful architect to build him such a palace as should be fit for a man of his vast wealth to live in. As I have said, it had already been rumored in the valley that Mr. Gathergold had turned out to be the prophetic personage so long and vainly looked for, and that his visage was the perfect and undeniable similitude of the great stone face. People were the more ready to believe that this must needs be the fact when they beheld the splendid edifice that rose, as if by enchantment, on the side of his father's old weather-beaten farmhouse. The exterior was of marble, so dazzlingly white, that it seems as though the whole structure might melt away in the sunshine. Like those humbler ones which Mr. Gathergold, in his young play-days, before his fingers were gifted with a touch of transmutation, had been accustomed to build of snow. It had a richly ornamented portico, supported by tall pillars, beneath which was a lofty door, studded with silver knobs, and made of a kind of variegated wood that had been brought from beyond the sea. The windows, from the floor to the ceiling of each stately apartment, were composed respectively of but one enormous pane of glass, so transparently pure that it was said to be a finer medium than even the vacant atmosphere. Hardly anybody had been permitted to see the interior of this palace, but it was reported, and with good semblance of truth, to be far more gorgeous than the outside, insomuch that whatever was iron or brass in other houses was silver or gold in this. And Mr. Gathergold's bedchamber, especially, made with such a glittering appearance that no ordinary man would have been able to close his eyes there. But on the other hand, Mr. Gathergold was now so inured to wealth that perhaps he could not have closed his eyes unless with a gleam of it was certain to find its way beneath his eyelids. In due time the mansion was finished. Next came the upholsterers with magnificent furniture, then a whole troop of black and white servants, the harbingers of Mr. Gathergold, who in his own majestic person was expected to arrive at sunset. Our friend Ernest, meanwhile, had been deeply stirred by the idea that the great man, the noble man, the man of prophecy, after so many ages of delay, was at length to be made manifest to his native valley. He knew, boy as he was, that there were a thousand ways in which Mr. Gathergold, with his vast wealth, might transform himself into an angel of beneficence, and assume a control over human affairs as wide and benignant as the smile of the great stone face. Full of faith and hope, Ernest doubted not that what the people said was true, and that now he was to behold the living likeness of those wondrous features on the mountainside. While the boy was still gazing up the valley, and fancying, as he always did, that the great stone face returned his gaze, and looked kindly at him, the rumbling of wheels was heard approaching swiftly along the winding road. "'Here he comes!' 
cried a group of people who were assembled to witness the arrival. Here comes the great Mr. Gathergold. A carriage drawn by four horses dashed round the turn of the road. Within it, thrust partly out of the window, appeared the physiognomy of a little old man, with a skin as yellow as if his own Midas hand had transmuted it. He had a low forehead, small, sharp eyes, puckered about with innumerable wrinkles, and very thin lips, which he made still thinner by pressing them forcibly together. The very image of the great stone face, shouted the people. Sure enough the old prophecy is true, and here we have the great man come at last. And what greatly perplexed Ernest, they seemed actually to believe that here was the likeness which they spoke of. By the roadside there chanced to be an old beggar woman and two little beggar children, stragglers from some far-off region, who, as the carriage rolled onward, held out their hands and lifted up their doleful voices, most piteously beseeching charity. A yellow claw, the very same that had clawed together so much wealth, poked itself out of the coach window and dropped some copper coins upon the ground, so that, though the great man's name seems to have been Gather Gold, he might just as suitably have been nicknamed Scatter Copper. Still, nevertheless, with an earnest shout, and evidently with as much good faith as ever, the people bellowed, He is the very image of the great stone face. But Ernest turned sadly from the wrinkled shrewdness of that sordid visage, and gazed up the valley, where amid a gathering mist gilded by the last sunbeams he could still distinguish those glorious features which had impressed themselves into his soul. Their aspect cheered him. What did the benign lips seem to say? He will come. Fear not, Ernest. The man will come. The years went on, and Ernest ceased to be a boy. He had grown to be a young man now. He attracted little notice from the other inhabitants of the valley, for they saw nothing remarkable in his way of life, save that when the labor of the day was over, he still loved to go apart and gaze and meditate upon the great stone face. According to their idea of the matter, it was folly indeed, but pardonable, inasmuch as Ernest was industrious, kind, and neighborly, and neglected no duty for the sake of indulging this idle habit. They knew not that the great stone face had become a teacher to him, and that the sentiment which was expressed in it would enlarge the young man's heart, and fill it with wider and deeper sympathies than other hearts. They knew not that thence would come a better wisdom that could be learned from books, and a better life that could be molded on the defaced example of other human lives. Neither did Ernest know that the thoughts and affections which came to him so naturally in the fields and at the fireside, and wherever he communed with himself, were of a higher tone than those which all men shared with him. A simple soul simple as when his mother first taught him the old prophecy. He beheld the marvellous features beaming adown the valley, and still wondered that their human counterpart was so long in making his appearance. By this time poor Mr. Gathergold was dead and buried, and the oddest part of the matter was that his wealth, which was the body and spirit of his existence, had disappeared before his death, leaving nothing of him but a living skeleton covered over with a wrinkled yellow skin. Since the melting away of his gold, it had been very generally conceded that there was no such striking resemblance, after all, betwixt the ignoble features of the ruined merchant and that majestic face upon the mountainside. And so the people ceased to honor him during his lifetime, and quietly consigned him to forgetfulness after his decease. Once in a while, it is true, his memory was brought up in connection with the magnificent palace which he had built, and which had long ago been turned into a hotel for the accommodation of strangers, multitudes of whom came every summer to visit that famous natural curiosity, the great stone face. Thus Mr. Gathergold, being discredited and thrown into the shade, the man of prophecy was yet to come. It so happened that a native-born son of the valley many years before had enlisted as a soldier, and after a great deal of hard fighting had now become an illustrious commander. Whatever he may be called in history, he was known in camps and on the battlefield under the nickname of Old Blood and Thunder. 
this war-worn veteran, being now infirm with age and wounds, and weary of the turmoil of a military life and of the roll of the drum and the clangor of the trumpet that had so long been ringing in his ears, had lately signified a purpose of returning to his native valley, hoping to find repose where he remembered to have left it. The inhabitants, his old neighbors, and their grown-up children were resolved to welcome the renowned warrior with a salute of cannon and a public dinner. And all the more enthusiastically, it being affirmed that now, at last, the likeness of the great stone face had actually appeared. An aide-de-camp of old blood and thunder, traveling through the valley, was said to have been struck with the resemblance. Moreover, the schoolmates and early acquaintances of the general were ready to testify on oath that to the best of their recollection the aforesaid general had been exceedingly like the majestic image, even when a boy only that the idea had never occurred to them at that period. Great, therefore, was the excitement throughout the valley, and many people, who had never once thought of glancing at the great stone face for years before, now spent their time in gazing at it, for the sake of knowing exactly how General Blood and Thunder looked. On the day of the great festival, Ernest, with all the other people of the valley, left their work, and proceeded to the spot where the sylvan banquet was prepared. As he approached, the loud voice of the Reverend Dr. Battleblast was heard, beseeching a blessing on the good things set before them, and on the distinguished friend of peace in whose honor they were assembled. The tables were arranged in a cleared space of the woods, shut in by the surrounding trees, except where a vista opened eastward and afforded a distant view of the great stone face. Over the general's chair, which was a relic from the home of Washington, there was an arch of verdant boughs, with a laurel profusely intermixed and surmounted by his country's banner, beneath which he had won his victories. Our friend Ernest raised himself on his tiptoes, in hopes to get a glimpse of the celebrated guest. But there was a mighty crowd about the tables, anxious to hear the toasts and speeches, and to catch any word that might fall from the general in reply. And a volunteer company, doing duty as a guard, pricked ruthlessly with their bayonets at any particularly quiet person among the throng. So Ernest, being of an unobtrusive character, was thrust quite into the background, where he could see no more of old blood and thunder's physiognomy than if it had been still blazing on the battlefield. To console himself, he turned towards the great stone face, which, like a faithful and long-remembered friend, looked back and smiled upon him through the vista of the forest. Meantime, however, he could overhear the remarks of various individuals who were comparing the features of the hero with the face on the distant mountainside. "'Tis the same face to a hair," cried one man, cutting a caper for joy. "'Wonderfully like, that's a fact,' responded another. "'Like! Why, I call it old blood and thunder himself in a monstrous looking-glass!' cried a third. "'And why not?' He's the greatest man of this or any other age, beyond a doubt. And then all three of the speakers gave a great shout, which communicated electricity to the crowd, and called forth a roar from a thousand voices that went reverberating for miles among the mountains, until you might have supposed that the great stone face had poured its thunder breath into the cry. All these comments and this vast enthusiasm served the more to interest our friend. Nor did he think of questioning that now at length the mountain visage had found its human counterpart. It is true Ernest had imagined that this long-looked-for personage would appear in the character of a man of peace, uttering wisdom and doing good, and making people happy. But taking an habitual breath of view with all his simplicity, he contended that Providence should choose its own method of blessing mankind, and could conceive that this great end might be effected even by a warrior and a bloody sword, should inscrutable wisdom see fit to order matters so. The general, the general, was now the cry. Hush! Silence! Old blood and thunder's going to make a speech. Even so, for the cloth being removed, the general's health had been drunk amid shouts of applause, and he now stood upon his feet to thank the company. Ernest saw him. There he was, over the shoulders of the crowd, from the two glittering epaulets and embroidered collar upward beneath the arch of green boughs with intertwined laurel, 
and the banner drooping as if to shade his brow and there too visible in the same glance through the vista of the forest appeared the great stone face and was there indeed such a resemblance as the crowd had testified alas ernest could not recognize it he beheld a war-worn and weather-beaten countenance full of energy and expressive of an iron will but the gentle wisdom the deep broad tender sympathies were altogether wanting in old blood and thunder's visage and even if the great stone face had assumed his look of stern command the milder traits would still have tempered it this is not the man of prophecy sighed ernest to himself as he made his way out of the throng and must the world wait longer yet the mists had congregated about the distant mountain side and there were seen the grand and awful features of the great stone face awful but benignant as if a mighty angel were sitting among the hills and enrobing himself in a cloud vesture of gold and purple as he looked ernest could hardly believe but that a smile beamed over the whole visage with a radiance still brightening although without motion of the lips it was probably the effect of the western sunshine melting through the thinly diffused vapors that had swept between him and the object that he gazed at but as it always did the aspect of his marvelous friend made ernest as hopeful as if he had never hoped in vain fear not ernest said his heart even as if the great face were whispering to him fear not ernest he will come nor years sped swiftly and tranquilly away ernest still dwelt in his native valley and was now a man of middle age by imperceptible degrees he had become known among the people now as heretofore he labored for his bread and was the same simple-hearted man that he had always been but he had thought and felt so much he had given so many of the best hours of his life to unworldly hopes for some great good to mankind that it seems as though he had been talking with the angels and had imbibed a portion of their wisdom unawares it was visible in the calm and well-considered beneficence of his daily life the quiet stream of which had made a wide green margin all along its course not a day passed by that the world was not the better because this man humble as he was had lived he never stepped aside from his own path yet would always reach a blessing to his neighbor almost involuntarily too he had become a preacher the pure and high simplicity of his thought which as one of its manifestations took shape in the good deeds that dropped silently from his hand flowed also forth in speech he uttered truths that wrought upon and molded the lives of those who heard them his auditors it may be never suspected that ernest their own neighbor and familiar friend was more than an ordinary man least of all did ernest himself suspect it but inevitably as the murmur of a rivulet came thoughts out of his mouth that no other human lips had spoken when the people's minds had had a little time to cool they were ready enough to acknowledge their mistake in imagining a similarity between general blood and thunder's truculent physiognomy and the benign visage on the mountain side but now again there were reports and many paragraphs in the newspapers affirming that the likeness of the great stone face had appeared upon the broad shoulders of a certain eminent statesman he like mr gathergold and old blood and thunder was a native of the valley but had left it in his early days and taken up the trades of law and politics instead of the rich man's wealth and the warrior's sword he had but a tongue and it was mightier than both together so wonderfully eloquent was he that whatever he might choose to say his auditors had no choice but to believe him wrong looked like right and right like wrong for when it pleased him he could make a kind of illuminated fog with his mere breath and obscure the natural daylight with it his tongue indeed was a magic instrument sometimes it rumbled like the thunder sometimes it warbled like the sweetest music it was the blast of war the song of peace and it seemed to have a heart in it when there was no such matter in good truth he was a wondrous man and when his tongue had acquired him all the other imaginable success when it had been heard in halls of state and in the courts of princes and potentates 
after it had made him known all over the world even as a voice crying from shore to shore it finally persuaded his countrymen to select him for the presidency before this time indeed as soon as he began to grow celebrated his admirers had found out the resemblance between him and the great stone face and so much were they struck by it that throughout the country this distinguished gentleman was known by the name of old stony fizz the phrase was considered as giving a highly favorable aspect to his political prospects for as is likewise the case with the popedom nobody ever becomes president without taking a name other than his own while his friends were doing their best to make him president old stony fizz as he was called set out on a visit to the valley where he was born of course he had no other object than to shake hands with his fellow citizens and neither thought nor cared about any effect which his progress through the country might have upon the election magnificent preparations were made to receive the illustrious statesman a cavalcade of horsemen set forth to meet him at the boundary line of the state and all the people left their businesses and gathered along the wayside to see him pass among these was Ernest though more than once disappointed as we have seen he had such a hopeful and confiding nature that he was always ready to believe in whatever seemed beautiful and good he kept his heart continually open and thus was sure to catch the blessing from on high when it should come so now again as buoyantly as ever he went forth to behold the likeness of the great stone face the cavalcade came prancing along the road with a great clattering of hoofs and a mighty cloud of dust which rose up so dense and high that the visage of the mountainside was completely hidden from Ernest's eyes all the great men of the neighborhood were there on horseback militia officers in uniform the member of Congress the sheriff of the county the editors of newspapers and many a farmer too had mounted his patient steed with his Sunday coat upon his back it really was a very brilliant spectacle especially as there were numerous banners flaunting over the cavalcade on some of which were gorgeous portraits of the illustrious statesman and the great stone face smiling familiarly at one another like two brothers if the pictures were to be trusted the mutual resemblance it must be confessed was marvelous we must not forget to mention that there was a band of music which made the echoes of the mountains ring and reverberate with a loud triumph of its strains so that airy and soul thrilling melodies broke out among all the heights and hollows as if every nook of his native valley had found a voice to welcome the distinguished guest but the grandest effect was when the far-off mountain precipice flung back the music for then the great stone face itself seemed to be swelling the triumphant chorus in acknowledgment that at length the man of prophecy was come. End of chapter 6, part 1. Chapter 6, part 2. Of famous stories every child should know. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Famous stories every child should know. Edited by Hamilton Wright Maybe. Chapter 6, Part 2 The Great Stone Face by Nathaniel Hawthorne. Part two. All this while the people were throwing up their hats and shouting with enthusiasm so contagious that the heart of Ernest kindled up, and he likewise threw up his hat and shouted as loudly as the loudest, Hurrah for the great man! Hurrah for old Stony Fizz! But as yet he had not seen him. Here he is now, cried those who stood near Ernest. There, there, look at old Stony Fizz, and then at the old man of the mountain and see if they're not as like as two twin brothers in the midst of all this gallant array came an open barouche drawn by four white horses and in the barouche with his massive head uncovered sat the illustrious statesman old stony fizz himself confess it said one of Ernest's neighbors to him the great stone face has met its match at last now it must be owned 
that at his first glimpse of the countenance which was bowing and smiling from the barouche, Ernest did fancy that there was a resemblance between it and the old familiar face upon the mountainside. The brow with its massive depth and loftiness, and all the other features, indeed were boldly and strongly hewn, as if in emulation of a more than heroic, of a titanic model. But the sublimity and stateliness, the grand expression of a divine sympathy that illuminated the mountain visage, and etherealized its ponderous granite substance into spirit might here be sought in vain something had been originally left out or had departed and therefore the marvelously gifted statesman had always a weary gloom in the deep caverns of his eyes as of a child that has outgrown its playthings or a man of mighty faculties and little aims whose life with all its high performances was vague and empty because no high purpose had endowed it with reality still ernest's neighbor was thrusting his elbow into his side and pressing him for an answer confess confess is he not the very picture of your old man of the mountain no said ernest bluntly i see little or no likeness then so much the worse for the great stone face answered his neighbor and again he set up a shout for old stony fizz but ernest turned away melancholy and almost despondent for this was the saddest of his disappointments to behold a man who might have fulfilled the prophecy and had not willed to do so meantime the cavalcade the banners the music and the barouches swept past him with the vociferous crowd in the rear leaving the dust to settle down and the great stone face to be revealed again with the grandeur that it had worn for untold centuries lo here i am ernest the benign lips seemed to say i have waited longer than thou and am not yet weary fear not the man will come the years hurried onward treading in their haste on one another's heels and now they began to bring white hairs and scatter them over the head of Ernest. They made reverend wrinkles across his forehead and furrows in his cheeks. He was an aged man, but not in vain had he grown old. More than the white hairs on his head were the sage thoughts in his mind. His wrinkles and furrows were inscriptions that time had graved and in which he had written legends of wisdom that had been tested by the tenor of a life and ernest had ceased to be obscure unsought for undesired had come the fame which so many seek and made him known in the great world beyond the limits of the valley in which he had dwelt so quietly college professors and even the active men of cities came from far to see and converse with ernest for the report had gone abroad that this simple husbandman had ideas unlike those of other men not gained from books but of a higher tone a tranquil and familiar majesty as if he had been talking with the angels as his daily friends whether it were sage statesman or philanthropist ernest received these visitors with the gentle sincerity that had characterized him from boyhood and spoke freely with them of whatever came uppermost or lay deepest in his heart or their own while they talked together his face would kindle unawares and shine upon them as with a mild evening light pensive with the fullness of such discourse his guests took leave and went their way and passing up the valley paused to look at the great stone face imagining that they had seen its likeness in a human countenance but could not remember where while Ernest had been growing up and growing old, a bountiful providence had granted a new poet to this earth. He likewise was a native of the valley, but had spent the greater part of his life at a distance from that romantic region, pouring out his sweet music amid the bustle and din of cities. Often, however, did the mountains which had been familiar to him in his childhood lift their snowy peaks into the clear atmosphere of his poetry neither was the great stone face forgotten 
for the poet had celebrated it in an ode which was grand enough to have been uttered by its own majestic lips. This man of genius, we may say, had come down from heaven with wonderful endowments. If he sang of a mountain, the eyes of all mankind beheld a mightier grandeur reposing on its breast, or soaring to its summit, than had before been seen there. If his theme were a lovely lake, a celestial smile had now been thrown over it to gleam forever on its surface. If it were the vast old sea, even the deep immensity of its dread bosom seemed to swell the higher, as if moved by the emotions of the song. Thus the world assumed another and a better aspect from the hour that the poet blessed it with his happy eyes. The Creator had bestowed him, as the last best touch to his own handiwork. Creation was not finished till the poet came to interpret, and so complete it. The effect was no less high and beautiful when his human brethren were the subject of his verse. The man or woman, sordid with the common dust of life, who crossed his daily path, and the little child who played in it, were glorified if he beheld them in his mood of poetic faith. He showed the golden links of the great chain that intertwined them with an angelic kindred. He brought out the hidden traits of a celestial birth that made them worthy of such kin. Some indeed there were who thought to show the soundness of their judgment by affirming that all the beauty and dignity of the natural world existed only in the poet's fancy. Let such men speak for themselves, who undoubtedly appear to have been spawned forth by nature with a contemptuous bitterness, she having plastered them up out of her refuse stuff after all the swine were made. As respects all things else, the poet's ideal was the truest truth. The songs of this poet found their way to Ernest. He read them, after his customary toil, seated on the bench before his cottage door, where for such a length of time he had filled his repose with thought, by gazing at the great stone face. And now as he read stanzas that caused the soul to thrill within him, he lifted his eyes to the vast continents beaming on him so benignantly. O oh, majestic friend, he murmured, addressing the great stone face, is not this man worthy to resemble thee? The face seemed to smile, but answered not a word. Now it happened that the poet, though he dwelt so far away, had not only heard of Ernest, but had meditated much upon his character, until he deemed nothing so desirable as to meet this man, whose untaught wisdom walked hand in hand with the noble simplicity of his life. One summer morning, therefore, he took passage by the railroad, and in the decline of the afternoon alighted from the cars at no great distance from Ernest's cottage. The great hotel, which had formerly been the palace of Mr. Gathergold, was close at hand, but the poet, with his carpet-bag on his arm, inquired at once where Ernest dwelt, and was resolved to be accepted as his guest. Approaching the door, he there found the good old man holding a volume in his hand, which alternately he read, and then, with a finger between the leaves, looked lovingly at the great stone face. "'Good evening,' said the poet. "'Can you give a traveller a night's lodging?' "'Willingly,' answered Ernest, and then added, smiling, "'Methinks I never saw the great stone face look so hospitably at a stranger.' The poet sat down on the bench beside him, and he and Ernest talked together. Often had the poet held intercourse with the wittiest and the wisest, but never before with a man like Ernest, whose thoughts and feelings gushed up with such a natural freedom, and who made great truths so familiar by his simple utterance of them. Angels, as had been so often said, seemed to have wrought with him at his labor in the fields. Angels seemed to have sat with him by the fireside, and dwelling with angels as friends with friends, he had imbibed the sublimity of their ideas, and imbued it with the sweet and lowly charm of household words. So thought the poet. And Ernest, on the other hand, 
was moved and agitated by the living images which the poet flung out of his mind and which peopled all the air about the cottage door with shapes of beauty both gay and pensive the sympathies of these two men instructed them with a profounder sense than either could have attained alone their minds accorded into one strain and made delightful music which neither of them could have claimed as all his own nor distinguished his own share from the others they led one another as it were into a high pavilion of their thoughts so remote and hitherto so dim that they had never entered it before and so beautiful that they desired to be there always as ernest listened to the poet he imagined that the great stone face was bending forward to listen to he gazed earnestly into the poet's glowing eyes who are you my strangely gifted guest he asked the poet laid his finger on the volume that ernest had been reading you have read these poems said he you know me then for i wrote them again and still more earnestly than before ernest examined the poet's features and then turned toward the great stone face and then back with an uncertain aspect to his guest but his countenance fell he shook his head and sighed wherefore are you sad inquired the poet because replied ernest all through life i have awaited the fulfillment of a prophecy and when i read these poems i hoped that it might be fulfilled in you you hoped answered the poet faintly smiling to find in me the likeness of the great stone face and you are disappointed as formerly with mr gathergold and old blood and thunder and old stony fizz yes ernest it is my doom you must add my name to the illustrious three and record another failure of your hopes for in shame and sadness do i speak it ernest i am not worthy to be typified by yonder benign and majestic image and why asked ernest he pointed to the volume are not those thoughts divine they have a strain of the divinity replied the poet you can hear in them the far-off echo of a heavenly song but my life dear ernest has not corresponded with my thought I have had grand dreams, but they have only been dreams because I have lived and that too by my own choice among poor and mean realities Sometimes even shall I dare to say it I lack faith in the grandeur the beauty and the goodness Which my own works are said to have made more evident in nature and in human life Why then pure seeker of the good and true shouldst thou hope to find me in yonder image of the divine the poet spoke sadly and his eyes were dim with tears so likewise were those of ernest at the hour of sunset as had long been his frequent custom ernest was to discourse to an assemblage of the neighboring inhabitants in the open air he and the poet arm in arm still talking together as they went along proceeded to the spot it was a small nook among the hills with a gray precipice behind the stern front of which was relieved by the pleasant foliage of many creeping plants that made a tapestry for the naked rocks by hanging their festoons from all its rugged angles at a small elevation above the ground set in a rich framework of verdure there appeared a niche spacious enough to admit a human figure with freedom for such gestures as spontaneously accompany earnest thought and genuine emotion into this natural pulpit ernest ascended and threw a look of familiar kindness around upon his audience they stood or sat or reclined upon the grass as seemed good to each with the departing sunshine falling obliquely over them and mingling its subdued cheerfulness with the solemnity of a grove of ancient trees beneath and amid the boughs of which the golden rays were constrained to pass in another direction was seen the great stone face with the same cheer combined with the same solemnity in its benignant aspect ernest began to speak giving to the people of what was in his heart and mind his words had power 
because they accorded with his thoughts and his thoughts had reality and depth because they harmonized with the life which he had always lived it was not mere breath that this preacher uttered they were the words of life because a life of good deeds and holy love was melted into them pearls pure and rich had been dissolved into this precious draught the poet as he listened felt that the being and character of ernest were a nobler strain of poetry than he had ever written his eyes glistening with tears he gazed reverentially at the venerable man and said within himself that never was there an aspect so worthy of a prophet and a sage as that mild sweet thoughtful countenance with the glory of white hair diffused about it at a distance but distinctly to be seen high up in the golden light of the setting sun appeared the great stone face with hoary mists around it like the white hairs around the brow of ernest its look of grand beneficence seemed to embrace the world at that moment in sympathy with the thought which he was about to utter the face of Ernest assumed a grandeur of expression so imbued with benevolence that the poet by an irresistible impulse threw his arms aloft and shouted behold behold Ernest is himself the likeness of the great stone face then all the people looked and saw that what the deep-sighted poet said was true the prophecy was fulfilled but Ernest having finished what he had to say took the poet's arm and walked slowly homeward still hoping that some wiser and better man than himself would by and by appear bearing a resemblance to the great stone face end of chapter six part two chapter seven of famous stories every child should know this is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Chessie Joy. Famous Stories Every Child Should Know. Edited by Hamilton Wright Maybe. Chapter 7. The Diverting History of John Gilpin by William Cooper. Showing how he went farther than he intended and came safe home again john gilpin was a citizen of credit and renown a train bent captain eke was he of famous london town john gilpin's spouse said to her dear though wedded we have been these twice ten tedious years yet we no holiday have seen to-morrow is our wedding day and we will then repair unto the bell at edmonton all in a chaise and pair my sister and my sister's child myself and children three will fill the chaise so you must ride on horseback after we he soon replied i do admire of womankind but one and you are she my dearest dear therefore it shall be done i am a linen draper bold as all the world doth know and my good friend the calendar will lend his horse to go quoth mrs gilpin that's well said and for that wine is dear we will be furnished with our own which is both bright and clear john gilpin kissed his loving wife or joyed was he to find that though on pleasure she was bent she had a frugal mind the morning came the chaise was brought but yet was not allowed to drive up to the door lest all should say that she was proud so three doors off the chaise was stayed where they all did get in six precious souls and all agog to dash through thick and thin smack went the whip round went the wheels were never folks so glad the stones did rattle underneath as if Cheapside were mad. John Gilpin at his horse's side seized fast the flowing mane, and up he got in haste to ride. But soon came down again, for a saddle tree scarce reached had he his journey to begin, when, turning round his head, he saw three customers come in. So down he came, for loss of time, although it grieved him sore, yet loss of pence, full well he knew, would trouble him much more. "'Twas long before the customers were suited to their mind, "'when Betty screaming came downstairs. "'The wine is left behind!' "'Good lack,' quoth he, "'yet bring it me, my leathern belt likewise, "'in which I bear my trusty sword when I do exercise.' 
Now Mistress Gilpin, careful soul, had two stone bottles found, to hold the liquor that she loved and keep it safe and sound. Each bottle had a curling ear through which the belt he drew, and hung a bottle on each side to make his balance true. Then over all, that he might be equipped from top to toe, his long red cloak, well brushed and neat, he manfully did throw. Now see him mounted once again upon his nimble steed, full slowly pacing o'er the stones with caution and good heed. But finding soon a smoother road beneath his well-shod feet, the snorting beast began to trot, which galled him in his seat. So, fair and softly, John, he cried, but John, he cried in vain. That trot became a gallop soon, in spite of curb and rein. So stooping down, as needs be must, who cannot sit upright, he grasped the mane with both his hands, and eke with all his might. His horse, who never in that sort had handled been before, what thing upon his back had got, did wonder more and more. Away went Gilpin, neck or not, away went hat and wig. He little dreamt when he set out of running such a rig. The wind did blow, the cloak did fly, like streamer long and gay, till loop and button failing both, at last it flew away. Then might all people well discern the bottles he had slung, a bottle swinging at each side, as hath been said or sung. The dogs did bark, the children screamed, up flew the windows all, and every soul cried out, Well done! as loud as he could bawl. Away went Gilpin! Who but he? His fame soon spread around. He carries weight, he rides a race, tis for a thousand pound. And still as fast as he drew near, twas wonderful to view, how in a trice the turnpike men their gates wide open threw. And now as he went bowing down, his reeking head full low, the bottles twain behind his back were shattered at a blow. Down ran the wine to the road, most piteous to be seen, which made his horse's flanks to smoke, as they had basted been. But still he seemed to carry weight with leathern girdle braced, for all might see the bottlenecks still dangling at his waist. Thus all through merry Islington these gambles he did play, until he came unto the wash of Edmonton so gay. And there he threw the wash about on both sides of the way, just like unto a trundling mop or a wild goose at play. At Edmonton his loving wife from the balcony she spied, her tender husband, wondering much to see how he did ride. Stop, stop, John Gilpin, here's the house, they all at once did cry. The dinner waits, and we are tired, said Gilpin, so am I. But yet his horse was not a whit inclined to tarry there. For why? His owner had a house full ten miles off, but where? So like an arrow swift he flew, shot by an archer strong. So did he fly, which brings me to the middle of my song. Away went Gilpin, out of breath, and sore against his will, till at his friends the calendars his horse at last stood still. The calendar, amazed to see his neighbor in such trim, laid down his pipe, flew to the gate, and thus accosted him. What news, what news, your tidings tell? Tell me you must and shall. Say why bareheaded you are come, or why you come at all. Now Gilpin had a pleasant wit, and loved a timely joke. Thus to the calendar in merry guise he spoke. I came because your horse would come, and if I well forebode, my hat and wig will soon be here. They are upon the road. The calendar, right glad to find his friend in merry pin, returned him not a single word, but to the house went in. When straight he came with hat and wig, a wig that flowed behind, a hat not much the worse for wear, each comely in its kind. He held them up, and in his turn thus showed his ready wit. My head is twice as big as yours, they therefore needs must fit. But let me scrape the dirt away that hangs upon your face, and stop and eat, for well you may be in a hungry case. Said John, It is my wedding day, and all the world would stare, if wife should dine at Edmonton, and I should dine at Ware. So turning to his horse, he said, I am in haste to dine. Twas for your pleasure you came here, you shall go back for mine. Ah, luckless speech, and bootless boast! for which he paid full dear, for, while he spake, a braying ass did sing most loud and clear, whereat his horse did snort as he had heard a lion roar, and galloped off with all his might as he had done before. Away went Gilpin, and away went Gilpin's hat and wig. He lost them sooner than at first, for why? They were too big. Now Mrs. Gilpin, when she saw her husband posting down into the country far away, she pulled out half a crown. And thus unto the youth she said, that drove them to the bell, 
this shall be yours when you bring back my husband safe and well the youth did ride and soon did meet john coming back amain whom in a trice he tried to stop by catching at his rein but not performing what he meant and gladly would have done the frightened steed he frighted more and made him faster run away went gilpin and away went postboy at his heels the postboy's horse right glad to miss the lumbering of the wheels six gentlemen upon the road thus seeing gilpin fly with postboy scampering in the rear they raised the hue and cry stop thief stop thief a highwayman not one of them was mute and all in each that passed that way did join in the pursuit and now the turnpike gates again flew open in short space the tollman thinking as before that gilpin rode a race and so he did and won it too for he got first to town nor stopped till where he had got up he did again get down now let us sing long live the king and gilpin long live he and when he next doth ride abroad may i be there to see william cooper end of chapter seven chapter eight part one of famous stories every child should know this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org Recording by Lynn Thompson Famous Stories Every Child Should Know Edited by Hamilton Wright Maybe Chapter 8, Part 1 The Man Without a Country by Edward Everett Hale I suppose that very few casual readers of the New York Herald of August 13th, 1863 observe in an obscure corner among the deaths the announcement Nolan died on board U.S. Corvette Levant, latitude two degrees eleven minutes south, longitude one hundred and thirty-one degrees west, on the eleventh of May. Philip Nolan. I happened to observe it because I was stranded at the old mission house in Mackinaw, waiting for a Lake Superior steamer which did not choose to come, and I was devouring to the very stubble all the current literature I could get hold of even down to the deaths and marriages in the herald my memory for names and people is good and the reader will see as he goes on that i had reason enough to remember philip nolan there are hundreds of readers who would have paused at that announcement if the officer of the levant who reported it had chosen to make it thus died may eleventh the man without a country for it was as the man without a country that poor philip nolan had generally been known by the officers who had him in charge during some fifty years, as indeed by all the men who sailed under them. I dare say there is many a man who has taken wine with him once a fortnight in a three years' cruise, who never knew that his name was Nolan, or whether the poor wretch had any name at all. There can now be no possible harm in telling this poor creature's story. Reason enough there has been till now, ever since madison's administration went out in eighteen seventeen for the very strict secrecy the secrecy of honour itself among the gentlemen of the navy who have had nolan in successive charge and certainly it speaks well for the esprit de corps of the profession and the personal honour of its members that to the press this man's story has been wholly unknown and i think to the country at large also i have reason to think from some investigations I made in the naval archives when I was attached to the Bureau of Construction, that every official report relating to him was burned when Ross burned the public buildings at Washington. One of the Tuckers, or possibly one of the Watsons, had Nolan in charge at the end of the war, and when, on returning from his cruise, he reported at Washington to one of the Crowning Shields, who was in the Navy Department when he came home, he found that the department ignored the whole business whether they really knew nothing about it or whether it was a non mira cordo determined on as a piece of policy i do not know but this i do know that since eighteen seventeen and possibly before no naval officer has mentioned nolan in his report of a cruise but as i say there is no need for secrecy any longer and now the poor creature is dead it seems to me worth while to tell a little of his story 
by way of showing young Americans of today what it is to be a man without a country. Philip Nolan was as fine a young officer as there was in the Legion of the West, as the Western Division of our army was then called. When Aaron Burr made his first dashing expedition down to New Orleans in 1805, at Fort Massac, or somewhere above on the river, he met, as the devil would have it, this gay, dashing, bright young fellow, at some dinner party, I think. Burr marked him, talked to him, walked with him, took him a day or two's voyage in his flatboat, and, in short, fascinated him. For the next year, barrack life was very tame to poor Nolan. He occasionally availed himself of the permission the great man had given him to write to him. Long, high-worded, stilted letters the poor boy wrote, and rewrote, and copied, but never a line did he have in reply from the gay deceiver. The other boys in the garrison sneered at him, because he lost the fun which they found in shooting or rowing while he was working away on these grand letters to his grand friend. They could not understand why Nolan kept to himself while they were playing high-low jack. Poker was not yet invented. But before long the young fellow had his revenge. For this time His Excellency Honourable Aaron Burr appeared again under a very different aspect. There were rumours that he had an army behind him, and everybody supposed that he had an empire before him. At that time the youngsters all envied him. Burr had not been talking twenty minutes with the commander before he asked him to send for Lieutenant Nolan. Then, after a little talk, he asked Nolan if he could show him something of the great river and the plans for the new post. He asked Nolan to take him out in his skiff to show him a cane brake or a cottonwood tree, as he said, really to seduce him. And by the time the sail was over, Nolan was enlisted body and soul. From that time, though he did not yet know it, he lived as a man without a country. What Burr meant to do, I know no more than you, dear reader. It is none of our business just now. Only, when the grand catastrophe came, and Jefferson and the House of Virginia of that day undertook to break on the wheel all the possible clearances of the then House of York, by the great treason trial at Richmond, some of the lesser fry in that distant Mississippi Valley, which was farther from us than Puget Sound is today, introduced the like novelty on their provincial stage, and, to while away the monotony of the summer of Fort Adams, got up for spectacles a string of courts martial on the officers there. One and another of the colonels and majors were tried, and, to fill out the list, little Nolan, against whom heaven knows there was evidence enough, that he was sick of the service, had been willing to be false to it, and would have obeyed any order to march any whither with any one who would follow him, had the order been signed by command of His Excellency A. Burr. The courts dragged on. The big flies escaped, rightly for all I know. Nolan was proved guilty enough, as they say, yet you and I would never have heard of him, reader, but that, when the President of the court asked him at the close whether he wished to say anything to show that he had always been faithful to the United States, he cried out, in a fit of frenzy, Damn the United States! I wish I may never hear of the United States again! I suppose he did not know how the word shocked old Colonel Morgan, who was holding the court. Half the officers who sat in it had served through the Revolution, and their lives, not to say their necks, had been risked for the very eye which he so cavalierly cursed in his madness. He, on his part, had grown up in the West of those days, in the midst of Spanish plot, Orleans plot, and all the rest. He had been educated on a plantation where the finest company was a Spanish officer or a French merchant from Orleans. His education, such as it was, had been perfected in commercial expeditions to Vera Cruz, and I think he told me his father once hired an Englishman to be a private tutor for a winter on the plantation. He had spent half his youth with an older brother hunting horses in Texas, and, in a word, to him, United States was scarcely a reality. Yet he had been fed by United States for all the years since he had been in the army. He had sworn on his faith as a Christian to be true to the United States. It was the United States which gave him the uniform he wore and the sword by his side. 
Nay, my poor Nolan, it was only because United States had picked you out first, as one of her own confidential men of honour, that A. Burr cared for you a straw more than for the flatboat men who sailed his ark for him. I do not excuse Nolan, I only explain to the reader why he damned his country, and wished he might never hear her name again. He never did hear her name but once again. From that moment, September 23rd, 1807, till the day he died, May 11th, 1863, he never heard her name again. For that half-century and more, he was a man without a country. Old Morgan, as I said, was terribly shocked. If Nolan had compared George Washington to Benedict Arnold, or had cried, God save King George, Morgan would not have felt worse. He called the court into his private room and returned in fifteen minutes with a face like a sheet to say, Prisoner, hear the sentence of the court. The court decides, subject to the approval of the president, that you never hear the name of the United States again. Nolan laughed, but nobody else laughed. Old Morgan was too solemn, and the whole room was hushed dead as night for a minute. Even Nolan lost his swagger in a moment. Then Morgan added, Mr. Marshall, take the prisoner to Orleans in an armed boat, and deliver him to the naval commander there. The marshal gave his orders, and the prisoner was taken out of court. Mr. Marshall, continued old Morgan, see that no one mentions the United States to the prisoner. Mr. Marshall, make my respects to Lieutenant Mitchell at Orleans, and request him to order that no one shall mention the United States to the prisoner while he is on board ship. You will receive your written orders from the officer on duty here this evening. The court is adjourned without delay. I have always supposed that Colonel Morgan himself took the proceedings of the court to Washington City and explained them to Mr. Jefferson. Certain it is that the President approved them. Certain, that is, if I may believe the men who say they have seen his signature. Before the Nautilus got round from New Orleans to the North Atlantic coast with the prisoner on board, the sentence had been approved, and he was a man without a country. The plan then adopted was substantially the same which was necessarily followed ever after. Perhaps it was suggested by the necessity of sending him by water from Fort Adams and Orleans. The Secretary of the Navy, it must have been the first crowning shield, though he is a man I do not remember, was requested to put Nolan on board a government vessel bound on a long cruise, and to direct that he should only be so far confined there as to make it certain that he never saw or heard of the country. We had few long cruises then, and the navy was very much out of favour, and as almost all of this story is traditional, as I have explained, I do not know certainly what his first cruise was. But the commander to whom he was entrusted, perhaps it was Tingy or Shaw, though I think it was one of the younger men, we are all old enough now, regulated the etiquette and precautions of the affair, and according to his scheme they were carried out, I suppose, till Nolan died. When I was second officer of the Intrepid some thirty years after, I saw the original paper of instructions. I have been sorry ever since that I did not copy the whole of it. It ran, however, much in this way. Washington, with a date which must have been late in 1807. Sir, you will receive from Lieutenant Neal the person of Philip Nolan, later lieutenant in the United States Army. This person, on his trial by court-martial, expressed, with an oath, the wish that he might never hear of the United States again. The court sentenced him to have his wish fulfilled. For the present, the execution of the order is entrusted by the President to this department. You will take the prisoner on board your ship and keep him there with such precautions as shall prevent his escape. You will provide him with such quarters, rations and clothing as would be proper for an officer of his late rank, if he were a passenger on your vessel on the business of his government. The gentlemen on board will make any arrangements agreeable to themselves regarding his society. He is to be exposed to no indignity of any kind nor is he ever unnecessarily to be reminded that he is a prisoner. But under no circumstances is he ever to hear of his country or to see any information regarding it, 
and you will especially caution all the officers under your command to take care that in the various indulgences which may be granted this rule in which his punishment is involved shall not be broken it is the intention of the government that he shall never again see the country which he has disowned before the end of your cruise you will receive orders which will give effect to this intention respectfully yours w southard for the secretary of the navy if i had only preserved the whole of this paper there would be no break in the beginning of my sketch of this story for captain shaw if it were he handed it to his successor in the charge and he to his and i suppose the commander of the levant has it to-day as his authority for keeping this man in his mild custody the rule adopted on board the ships from which i have met the man without a country was i think transmitted from the beginning no mess liked to have him permanently because his presence cut off all talk of home or the prospect of return of politics or letters of peace or of war cut off more than half the talk men like to have at sea but it was always thought too hard that he should never meet the rest of us except to touch hats and we finally sank into one system he was not permitted to talk with the men unless an officer was by with officers he had an unrestrained intercourse as far as they and he chose but he grew shy though he had favourites i was one then the captain always asked him to dinner on monday every mess in succession took up the invitation on its turn according to the size of the ship you had him in your mess more or less often at dinner his breakfast he ate in his own stateroom he always had a stateroom which was where a sentinel or somebody on watch could see the door and whatever else he ate or drank he ate or drank alone sometimes when the marines or sailors had any special jollification they were permitted to invite plain buttons as they called him then nolan was sent with some officer and the men were forbidden to speak of home while he was there i believe the theory was that the sight of his punishment did them good they called him plain buttons because while he always chose to wear a regulation army uniform he was not permitted to wear the army button for the reason that it bore either the initials or the insignia of the country he had disowned i remember soon after i joined the navy i was on shore with some of the older officers from our ship and from the brandywine which we had met at alexandria we had leave to make a party and go up to cairo and the pyramids as we jogged along we went on donkeys then some of the gentlemen we boys called them dons but the phrase was long since changed fell to talking about nolan and someone told the system which was adopted from the first about his books and other reading as he was almost never permitted to go on shore even though the vessel lay in port for months his time at the best hung heavy and everybody was permitted to lend him books if they were not published in america and made no allusion to it these were common enough in the old days when people in the other hemisphere talked of the united states as little as we do of paraguay he had almost all the foreign papers that came into the ship sooner or later only somebody must go over them first and cut out any advertisement or stray paragraph that alluded to america this was a little cruel sometimes when the back of what was cut out might be as innocent as hesiod right in the midst of one of napoleon's battles or one of canning's speeches poor nolan would find a great hole because on the back of the page of that paper there had been an advertisement of a packet for new york or a scrap from the president's message i say this was the first time i ever heard of this plan which afterwards i had enough and more than enough to do with i remember it because poor phillips who was of the party as soon as the allusion to reading was made told a story of something which happened at the cape of good hope on nolan's first voyage and it is the only thing i ever knew of that voyage they had touched at the cape and had done the civil thing with the english admiral and the fleet and then leaving for a long cruise up the indian ocean phillips had borrowed a lot of english books from an officer which in those days as indeed in these was quite a windfall among them as the devil would order was the lay of the last minstrel which they had all of them heard of but which most of them had never seen 
I think it could not have been published long. Well, nobody thought there could be any risk of anything national in that, though Phillips swore Old Shaw had cut out The Tempest from Shakespeare before he let Nolan have it, because he said the Bermudas ought to be ours and, by Jove, should be one day. So Nolan was permitted to join the circle one afternoon when a lot of them sat on deck smoking and reading aloud. People do not do such things so often now, but when I was young we got rid of a great deal of time so. Well, so it happened that in his turn Nolan took the book and read to the others, and he read very well, as I know. Nobody in the circle knew a line of the poem, only it was all magic and border chivalry and was ten thousand years ago. Poor Nolan read steadily through the fifth canto, stopped a minute and drank something, and then began, without a thought of what was coming, Breathe there a man with soul so dead, who never to himself had said. It seems impossible to us that anybody ever heard this for the first time, but all these fellows did then, and poor Nolan himself went on, still unconsciously or mechanically. This is my own, my native land. Then they all saw that something was to pay, but he expected to get through, I suppose, turned a little pale, but plunged on. Whose heart hath ne'er within him burned, as home his footsteps he hath turned, from wandering on a foreign strand? If such there breathe, go, mark him well. By this time the men were all beside themselves, wishing there was any way to make him turn over two pages, but he had not quite presence of mind for that. He gagged a little, coloured crimson, and staggered on. For him no minstrel raptures swell. High though his titles, proud his name, boundless his wealth, as wish can claim. Despite these titles, power and pelf, the wretch concentred all in self. And here the poor fellow choked, could not go on, but started up, swung the book into the sea, vanished into his stateroom, and by jove said phillips we did not see him for two months again and i had to make up some beggarly story to that english surgeon why i did not return his walter scott to him that story shows about the time when nolan's brocadocio must have broken down at first they said he took a very high tone considered his imprisonment a mere farce affected to enjoy the voyage and all that but phillips said that after he came out of his stateroom he never was the same man again. He never read aloud again unless it was the Bible or Shakespeare or something else he was sure of. But it was not that merely. He never entered in with the other young men exactly as their companion again. He was always shy afterwards when I knew him, very seldom spoke unless he was spoken to, except to a very few friends. He lighted up occasionally. I remember late in his life hearing him fairly eloquent on something which had been suggested to him by one of Flechier's sermons, but generally he had the nervous, tired look of a heart-wounded man. When Captain Shaw was coming home, if, as I say, it was Shaw, rather to the surprise of everybody, they made one of the Windward Islands, and lay off and on for nearly a week. The boys said the officers were sick of salt junk, and meant to have turtle soup before they came home but after several days the warren came to the same rendezvous they exchanged signals she sent to phillips and these homeward bound men letters and papers and told them she was outward bound perhaps to the mediterranean and took poor nolan and his traps on the boat back to try his second cruise he looked very blank when he was told to get ready to join her he had known enough of the signs of the sky to know that till that moment he was going home but this was a distinct evidence of something he had not thought of, perhaps, that there was no going home for him, even to a prison, and this was the first of some twenty such transfers which brought him sooner or later into half our best vessels, but which kept him all his life at least some hundred miles from the country he had hoped he might never hear of again. It may have been on that second cruise, it was once when he was up in the Mediterranean, that Mrs. Graff, the celebrated southern beauty of those days, danced with him. They had been lying a long time in the Bay of Naples, and the officers were very intimate in the English fleet, and there had been great festivities, and our men thought they must give a great ball on board the ship. How they ever did it on board Warren, I'm sure I do not know. Perhaps it was not the Warren, 
or perhaps ladies did not take up so much room as they do now. They wanted to use Nolan's stateroom for something, and they hated to do it without asking him to the ball, so the captain said they might ask him if they would be responsible that he did not talk with the wrong people, who would give him intelligence. So the dance went on, the finest party that had ever been known, I dare say, for I never heard of a man-of-war ball that was not. For ladies, they had the family of the American consul, one or two travellers who had adventured so far, and a nice bevy of English girls and matrons, perhaps Lady Hamilton herself. Well, different officers relieved each other in standing and talking with Nolan in a friendly way, so as to be sure that nobody else spoke to him. The dancing went on with spirit, and after a while even the fellows who took this honorary guard of Nolan's ceased to fear any contretemps. Only when some English lady, Lady Hamilton, as I said, perhaps, called for a set of American dances, an odd thing happened. Everybody then danced contra-dances. The black band, nothing loath, conferred as to what American dances were, and started off with Virginia Reel, which they followed with Monkey Musk, which in its turn in those days should have been followed by the old thirteen. But just as Dick, the leader, tapped for his fiddles to begin and bent forward about to say in true negro state the old thirteen gentlemen and ladies as he had said virginie reel if you please and monkey musk if you please the captain's boy tapped him on the shoulder whispered to him and he did not announce the name of the dance he merely bowed began on the air and they all fell to the officers teaching the english girls the figure but not telling them why it had no name End of chapter 8, part 1the man without a country by edward everett hale part two but that is not the story i started to tell as the dancing went on nolan and our fellows all got at ease as i said so much so that it seemed quite natural for him to bow to that splendid mrs graff and say i hope you have not forgotten me miss rutledge shall i have the honour of dancing he said it so quickly that fellows who was with him could not hinder him she laughed and said i am not miss rutledge any longer mr nolan but i will dance all the same just nodded to fellows as if he must leave mr nolan to her and led him off to the place where the dance was forming nolan thought he had got his chance he had known her at philadelphia and at other places had met her and this was a godsend you could not talk in contra dances as you could in cotillions or even in the pauses of waltzing but there were chances for tongues and sounds as well as for eyes and blushes he began with her travels and europe and vesuvius and the french and then when they had worked down and had that long talking time at the bottom of the set he said boldly a little pale she said as she told me the story years after and what do you hear from home mrs graff and that splendid creature looked through him jove how she must have looked through him home mr nolan i thought you were the man who never wanted to hear of home again and she walked directly up the deck to her husband and left poor nolan alone as he always was he did not dance again i cannot give any history of him in order nobody can now and indeed i am trying not to these are the traditions which i sought out as i believe them from the myths which have been told about this man for forty years the lies that have been told about him are legion. The fellows used to say he was the Iron Mask, and poor George Pons went to his grave in the belief that this was the author of Junius, who was being punished for his celebrated libel on Thomas Jefferson. Pons was not very strong in the historical line. A happier story than either of these I have told is of the war. That came along soon after. 
I have heard this affair told in three or four ways, and indeed it may have happened more than once, but which ship it was on I cannot tell. However, in one at least of the great frigate duels with the English, in which the navy was really baptized, it happened that a round shot from the enemy entered one of our ports square and took right down the officer of the gun himself and almost every man of the gun's crew. Now you may say what you choose about courage, but that is not a nice thing to see. But as the men who were not killed picked themselves up, and as they and the surgeon's people were carrying off the bodies, there appeared Nolan, in his shirt sleeves, with the rammer in his hand, and, just as if he had been an officer, told them off with authority, who should go to the cockpit with the wounded men, who should stay with him, perfectly cheery, and with that way which makes men feel sure all is right and is going to be right. And he finished loading his gun with his own hands, aimed it, and bade the men fire. And there he stayed, captain of that gun, keeping those fellows in spirits till the enemy struck, sitting on the carriage while the gun was cooling, though he was exposed all the time, showing them easier ways to handle heavy shot, making the raw hands laugh at their own blunders, and when the gun cooled again, getting it loaded and fired twice as often as any other gun on the ship. The captain walked forward by way of encouraging the men, and Nolan touched his hat and said, I'm showing them how we do this in the artillery, sir. And this is the part of the story where all the legends agree. The Commodore said, I see you do, and I thank you, sir, and I shall never forget this day, sir, and you never shall, sir. And after the whole thing was over, and he had the Englishman's sword in the midst of the state and ceremony of the quarter-deck, he said, Where is Mr. Nolan? Ask Mr. Nolan to come here. And when Nolan came, he said, Mr. Nolan, we are all very grateful to you today. You are one of us today. You will be named in the dispatches. And then the old man took off his own sword of ceremony and gave it to Nolan and made him put it on. The man told me this who saw it. Nolan cried like a baby, and well he might. He had not worn a sword since that infernal day at Fort Adams, but always afterwards on occasion of ceremony he wore that quaint old French sword of the Commodore's. The captain did mention him in dispatches. It was always said he asked that he might be pardoned. He wrote a special letter to the Secretary of War, but nothing ever came of it. As I said, that was about the time when they began to ignore the whole transaction at Washington. And when Nolan's imprisonment began to carry itself on because there was nobody to stop it without any new orders from home. I have heard it said that he was with Porter when he took possession of the Nukahiwa Islands. Not this Porter, you know, but old Porter, his father, Essex Porter, that is, the old Essex Porter, not this Essex. As an artillery officer, who had seen service in the West, Nolan knew more about fortifications, embrasures, ravelins, stockades, and all that, than any of them did, and he worked with a right good will in fixing that battery all right. I have always said that it was a pity Porter did not leave him in command there with Gamble. That would have settled all the question about his punishment. We should have kept the islands, and at this moment we should have had one station in the Pacific Ocean. Our French friends, too, when they wanted this little watering place, could have found it was occupied. But Madison and the Virginians, of course, flung all that away. All that was near fifty years ago. If Nolan was thirty then, he must have been near eighty when he died. He looked sixty when he was forty, but he never seemed to change a hair afterwards. As I imagine his life, from what I have seen and heard of it, he must have been in every sea and yet almost never on land. He must have known, in a formal way, more officers in our service than any man living knows. He told me once, with a grave smile, that no man in the world lived so methodical a life as he. You know the boys say I am the Iron Mask, and you know how busy he was. He said it did not do for anyone to try to read all the time, more than to do anything else all the time, and that he used to read just five hours a day. Then, he said, I keep up my notebooks, writing in them at such and such hours from what I have been reading, and I include in these my scrapbooks. These were very curious indeed. He had six or eight of different subjects. There was one of history, one of natural science, 
one which he called odds and ends but they were not merely books of extracts from newspapers they had bits of plants and ribbons shells tied on and carved scraps of bone and wood which he had taught the men to cut for him and they were beautifully illustrated he drew admirably he had some of the funniest drawings there and some of the most pathetic that i have ever seen in my life i wonder who will have nolan's scrapbooks well he said his reading and his notes were his profession and that they took five hours and two hours respectively of each day then said he every man should have a diversion as well as a profession my natural history is my diversion that took two hours a day more the men used to bring him birds and fish but on a long cruise he had to satisfy himself with centipedes and cockroaches and such small game he was the only naturalist i ever met who knew anything about the habits of the housefly and the mosquito all those people can tell you whether they are lepidoptera or steptopotera but as for telling you how you can get rid of them or how they get away from you when you strike them why linares knew as little of that as john foy the idiot did these nine hours made nolan's regular daily occupation the rest of the time he talked or walked till he grew very old he went aloft a great deal he always kept up his exercise and i never heard that he was ill if any other man was ill he was the kindest nurse in the world and he knew more than half the surgeons do then if anybody was sick or died or if the captain wanted him to on any other occasion he was always ready to read prayers i have said that he read beautifully my own acquaintance with philip nolan began six or eight years after the english war on my first voyage after i was appointed a midshipman it was in the first days after our slave trade treaty while the reigning house which was still the house of virginia had still a sort of sentimentalism about the suppression of the horrors of the middle passage and something was sometimes done that way we were in the south atlantic on that business from the time i joined i believe i thought nolan was a sort of lay chaplain a chaplain with a blue coat i never asked about him everything in the ship was strange to me i knew it was green to ask questions and i suppose i thought there was a plain buttons on every ship we had him to dine in our mess once a week and the caution was given that on that day nothing was to be said about home but if they had told us not to say anything about the planet mars or the book of deuteronomy i should not have asked why there were a great many things which seemed to me to have as little reason i first came to understand anything about the man without a country one day when we overhauled a dirty little schooner which had slaves on board an officer was sent to take charge of her and after a few minutes he sent back his boat to ask that someone might be sent to him who could speak portuguese we were all looking over the rail when the message came and we all wished we could interpret when the captain asked who spoke portuguese but none of the officers did and just as the captain was sending forward to ask if any of the people could nolan stepped out and said he should be glad to interpret if the captain wished as he understood the language the captain thanked him fitted out another boat with him and in this boat it was my luck to go when we got there it was such a scene as you seldom see and never want to nastiness beyond account and chaos run loose in the midst of the nastiness there were not a great many of the negroes but by way of making what there were understand that they were free vaughan had had their handcuffs and ankle cuffs knocked off and for convenience's sake was putting them upon the rascals of the schooner's crew the negroes were most of them out of the hold and swarming all round the dirty deck with a central throng surrounding vaughan and addressing him in every dialect and patois of a dialect from the zulu cliff up to the parisian of beled el jarid as we came on deck vaughan looked down from a hogshead on which he had mounted in desperation and said for god's sake is there anybody who can make these wretches understand something the men gave them rum and that did not quiet them i knocked that big fellow down twice and that did not soothe them and then i talked choctaw to all of them and i'll be hanged if they understood that as well as they understood the english nolan said he could speak portuguese and one or two fine-looking crewmen 
were dragged out, who, as it had been found already, had worked for the Portuguese on the coast at Fernando Po. Tell them they are free, said Vaughan, and tell them that these rascals are to be hanged as soon as we can get rope enough. Nolan put that into Spanish, that is, he explained it in such Portuguese as the crewmen could understand, and they in turn to such of the negroes as could understand them. Then there was such a yell of delight, clinching of fists, leaping and dancing, kissing of Nolan's feet, and a general rush made to the hogshead by way of spontaneous worship of Vaughan, as the deus ex machina of the occasion. Tell them, said Vaughan, well pleased, that I will take them all to Cape Palmas. This did not answer so well. Cape Palmas was practically as far from the homes of most of them as New Orleans or Rio Janeiro was that is they would be eternally separated from home there and their interpreters as we could understand instantly said ah no palmas and began to propose infinite other expedients in most voluble language vaughan was rather disappointed at this result of his liberality and asked nolan eagerly what they had said the drops stood on poor nolan's white forehead as he hushed the men down and said he says not palmas he says take us home Take us to our own country, take us to our own house, take us to our own pickaninnies and our own women. He says he has an old father and mother who will die if they do not see him, and this one says he left his people all sick and paddled down to Fernando to beg the white doctor to come and help them, and that these devils caught him in the bay just in sight of home, and that he has never seen anybody from home since then. And this one says, choked out Nolan, that he has not heard a word from his home in six months, while he has been locked up in an infernal barracoon. Vaughan always said he grew grey himself while Nolan struggled through this interpretation. I, who did not understand anything of the passion involved in it, saw that the very elements were melting with fervent heat, and that something was to pay somewhere. Even the negroes themselves stopped howling, as they saw Nolan's agony, and Vaughan's almost equal agony and sympathy. As quick as he could get words, he said, Tell them yes, yes, yes. Tell them they should go to the mountains of the moon if they will. If I sail the schooner through the great white desert, they shall go home. And after some fashion, Nolan said so. And then they all fell to kissing him again and wanting to rub his nose with theirs. But he could not stand it long, and getting Vaughan to say he might go back, he beckoned me down into the boat. As we lay back in the stern sheets and the men gave way, he said to me, Youngster, let that show you what it is to be without a family, without a home, and without a country. And if you are ever tempted to say a word or to do a thing that shall put a bar between you and your family, your home, and your country, pray God in his mercy to take you that instant home to his own sweet heaven. Stick by your family, boy. Forget you have a self while you do everything for them. Think of your home, boy. Write and send and talk about it. Let it be nearer and nearer to your thought, the farther you have to travel from it, and rush back to it when you are free, as that poor black slave is doing now. And for your country, boy, and the words rattled in his throat, and for that flag, he pointed to the ship, never dream a dream but of serving her as she bids you, though the service carry you through a thousand hells. No matter what happens to you, no matter who flatters you or who abuses you, never look at another flag never let a night pass but that you pray god to bless that flag remember boy that behind all these men you have to do with behind officers and government and people even there is the country herself your country and that you belong to her as you belong to your own mother stand by her boy as you would stand by your mother if those devils there had got hold of her today I was frightened to death by his calm, hard passion, but I blundered out that I would, by all that was holy, and that I had never thought of doing anything else. He hardly seemed to hear me, but he did, almost in a whisper, say, Oh, if anybody had said so to me when I was of your age. I think it was this half-confidence of his, which I never abused, for I never told this story till now, which afterwards made us great friends. He was very kind to me, Often he sat up, or even got up, at night to walk the deck with me when it was my watch. He explained to me a great deal of my mathematics, and I owe to him my taste for mathematics. 
He lent me his books and helped me about my reading. He never alluded so directly to his story again, but from one and another officer I have learned in thirty years what I am telling. When we parted from him in St. Thomas Harbour at the end of our cruise, I was more sorry than I can tell. I was very glad to meet him again in 1830, and later in life, when I thought I had some influence in Washington, I moved heaven and earth to have him discharged. But it was like getting a ghost out of prison. They pretended there was no such man, and never was such a man. They will say so at the department now. Perhaps they do not know. It will not be the first thing in the service of which the department appears to know nothing. End of chapter 8, part 2